Welcome back to the second day of the symposium Post-Postmodernism, a map for the present, which accompanies the exhibition Everything at Once, Postmodernity 1967 to 1992 at the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn. We have another packed day of prominent speakers um, that traveled from New York, from Berlin, um, from London. And um, I have advice whenever you plan to curate a show on postmodernism or postmodernity, as we prefer to say, talk to Sylvia Levin, who teaches at, at Princeton University. She's one of the leading thinkers about uh, postmodern architecture, but not only about architecture, but the whole shifts of power that have come in the 70s and 80s after the deregulation of the financial markets and other social transformation. Sylvia Levin coined the term postmodernization and illustrated it brilliantly with the show Architecture Itself and Other Postmodernization Effects at the CCA, the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal, in 2018. I also recommend the accompanying book. We were glad to be able to talk to Sylvia also in preparation for the show, and she had crucial advice. Sylvia is currently working on her book Building Sylvan Media. She has contributed to the catalogue of the exhibition with her essay Helicoptering Over the Present, or who has never been postmodernized, and she will now uh, talk us through how the helicopter has changed the world. Sylvia, thanks so much. The stage is yours. Thank you, um, I can't see. Thank you very much for that gracious introduction and for inviting me here, and congratulations on a fascinating um, exhibition. Die Dolmetscher bedauern es. Sie hat das hier noch nicht für Sie. Okay. Okay. Bedauern es sehr, dass Sie noch nicht für Sie übersetzen können, falls jemand Suspended zuhört. Within the vertiginous chasm of the Museum of Modern Arts, Arts Maram Atrium, keine, there hangs a bell 47D1 helicopter. Vortragsraum. MoMA's description Wir explains, and I quote, that designed in 1945, more than 3,000 Bell 47D1 helicopters were made in the United States and sold in 40 countries between 1946 and 73. While the Bell 47D1 is a straightforward utilitarian craft, its designer, Arthur Young, who was also a poet and a painter, consciously juxtaposed its transparent plastic bubble with the open structure of its tail boom to create an object whose delicate beauty is inseparable from its es gibt efficiency. Noch keinen Ton für die that the plastic die bubble is made in one piece rather than in sections joined by metal können. seams sets the Bell 47D1 apart from other helicopters. The result is a cleaner, more unified appearance. That's the end of their description. But so MoMA, in other words, presents the helicopter as an ideal modernist object, one that exemplifies the institution's understanding of the conditions of its own mid-century modernity. In this account, the bell is an American re-origination of European functionalism, benevolently exported as a commodity, valued less as a machine than for its machine aesthetic. This particular helicopter, however, was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in 1984, the same year Fred Jameson published his seminal essay on postmodernism, in which he uses the helicopter precisely to exemplify a new kind of postmodern machine, which he describes, and I quote, does not, like the older modernist machinery of the locomotive or the airplane, represent motion, but which can be only represented in motion, end quote. Thus, this Bell 47D1 is simultaneously a straightforward addition to MoMA's collection of modernist machines, but it is also a retrospective, Aber es ist auch retrospectively ein fabricated postmodernist object, post an object that has been subjected to MoMA's Objekt, becoming postmodern. The object description is a text wurde. of the 1980s, full of slippery anachronisms that turn the object into a pastiche, decontextualized but also recontextualized by its 
kontextualisiert, aber auch rekontextualisiert durch seine Präsentation in einem simulierten Flug, hängt der Hubschrauber im unanschaulichen Raum des Hyperrealen. Und nicht nur seine Funktion, sondern seine eigentliche Objekthaftigkeit wird zu einem schwerelosen Schein subjekt. Schließlich war die Bell 47 im Jahr 1984 nicht nur ein Hubschrauber, sondern im Grunde genommen eine Medienikone. Ich könnte jetzt da im Grunde genommen eine halbe Stunde mit verbringen, Ihnen die Filme, die Serien zu zeigen, in denen dieser Hubschrauber gezeigt wurde. Um die Darstellung des Hubschraubers als Bild, als Zeichen zu verstärken, schließt die Objektbeschreibung des MoMA mit einer bemerkenswerten Reihe von sprachlichen Implosionen und Verschiebungen, die eine semantische Wolke erzeugen, die im Grunde genommen verdeckt, was 1984 bereits über die Umweltauswirkungen dieser sogenannten Libelle, der Dragonfly, bekannt war. Alle wussten im Grunde genommen, dass Kriegführung etwas Umwelttechnisches wurde, dank dieses Hubschraubers und dass ähm, DDT genutzt wurde, um Menschen zu ermorden. Trotz all dem schreibt das MoMA, dass die Blase dem Fluggerät eine Art Insekten-ähnliches Aussehen verleiht. Daher auch der Spitzname The Bug Eyed Helicopter. In der Stille der reinen Optizität schwebt veranschaulicht die Anschaffung der De die Definition von Jamesons im Jahr 1984 der Postmoderne als Verschleierung der ökonomischen und materiellen Bedingungen durch Spektakel und schwebende Signifikanten. Obgleich die Fähigkeit des Hubschraubers sowohl als modernes Ideal als auch postmoderne Ikone zu fungieren, äh, Fragen äh, in, Beziehung auf, äh, in Beziehung mit der Periodisierung der Begriffsdefinition aufzeigt, weist es gleichzeitig auch darauf hin, dass es sinnvoll ist, den Hubschrauber nicht nur als ein Mittel zu betrachten, um die in den 1980er Jahren produzierten Theorien der Postmoderne neu zu schreiben, sondern auch als Mittel zur Auseinandersetzung mit anderen theoretischen Rahmenwerken, die die eher elementar als semiotisch, eher prozessual als projektiv sind und Wege aufzeigen, wie wir den Hubschrauber als eine grundlegende Kulturtechnik im Rahmen dessen betrachten können, was ich hier Postmodernisierung genannt habe. Der Hubschrauber ist sowohl Subjekt als auch Objekt eines Prozesses der Verflechtung und Rückkopplung Rückkopplung zwischen einer wachsenden Zahl von Komplexen, von denen der bekannteste, der von Dwight D. Eisenhower 1961 so benannt militärisch-industrielle Komplex war. Zudem aber Mitte der 1980er auch der militärische Unterhaltungskomplex, der industriell-akademische Komplex, der Kunstarchitekturkomplex und so weiter gehörten. Dieser Komplex von Komplexen setzt die linearen Systeme der Modernisierung, lineare Städte, industrielle Produktionslinien und lineale Perspektiven in ein dynamisches und globales Netzwerk von Operationen um, das durch die Konvergenz seiner verschiedenen Teile erzeugt wurde. Die Möglichkeiten des Hubschraubers, der sich von einer schönen Maschine in ein Spektrum spektakuläres Bild verwandelte, zeigen, dass er ein Medium war, durch das kulturelle Infrastrukturen in, der instabilen, in den instabilen Luftraum zwischen einem Gebäude und einem anderen, zwischen Land und Immobilien, zwischen Individuen und Politik verlagert wurde. Dieser Luftraum im materiellen und ökologischen Sinne ist es, der Hubschrauber von anderen Flugzeugen unterscheidet. Hubschrauber bewegen sich nicht nur durch die Luft oder nutzen den Luftdruck, um aufzusteigen. Hubschrauber halten sich in der Luft auf eine Art und Weise, auf auf sich, äh, die sich mit der Art und Weise deckt, wie Menschen in der Erdatmosphäre leben. Und das ist einer der Gründe dafür, warum die so hilfreich waren im Krieg. Bei einer durchschnittlichen Flughöhe von etwa 10.000 Fuß wird die Obergrenze des Hubschrauberflugs durch die Fähigkeit des Piloten und des Motors bestimmt, die dünnere Luft quasi zu atmen. Oberhalb von 10.000 Fuß benötigen sowohl Menschen als auch Hubschrauber zusätzlichen Sauerstoff und eine Möglichkeit der Abschirmung, die sie von dem trennt, was wir als normal Luft bezeichnen könnten. Hubschrauber sind sehr wendig und können nicht nur vorwärts und rückwärts auf- und absteigen, sondern auch schnell zwischen diesen Richtungen wechseln, also eine Art der Beweglichkeit, die man normalerweise eher mit biologischem Leben als mit mechanischer Bewegung in Verbindung bringt. Diese feinmotorische Anpassungsfähigkeit führt sozusagen zu einer territorialen Anpassungsfähigkeit. Hubschrauber kommen sowohl im städtischen Gebiet als auch in ländlichen Gebieten gut zurecht 
und zwar auf eine Art und Weise, die ihre menschlichen Untertanen sozusagen darauf trainiert, selbst umweltstrategisch zu werden. Obwohl sie mit einer ganzen Reihe von archäologischen Instrumenten verwandt sind, Ballon bis hin zum Telegrafen, ist es wichtig, dass der Hubschrauber die Menschen an die Informationsumgebung in der Formation gewöhnt. Die Fähigkeit des Hubschraubers, diese mediale Atmosphäre sowohl zu besetzen als auch zu erzeugen, wurde bereits 1960 sichtbar. In der ersten Sequenz, der ersten Szene von Fellinis La Dolce Vita, fliegen nicht nur ein, sondern zwei Hubschrauber, eine Christusfigur über den Stadtrand von Rom durch einen Luftraum, in dem die Betonstaub gefüllte Atmosphäre der im Bau befindlichen Stadt unten und der himmlische Himmel oben aufeinandertreffen und eins werden. Ich muss das jetzt nicht unbedingt zeigen, aber ich finde gerade die Maus nicht. Das ist einfach eine tolle Szene, aber ich möchte nicht das Ganze vorspielen, sondern ich spule mal eben nach vorne und zeige Ihnen damit, dass am Ende der Luftraum, in dem die Menschen und der Helikopter sich befinden und wo die Frauen ja gerade ein Sonnenbad nehmen, dass das im Grunde genommen ein einzelner, ein gemeinsamer Raum wird. Der Hubschrauber bewegt sich also durch den Raum und beinhaltet Raum. Raum, in dem ein äh, Journalist, ein Fotograf sind, die das Ganze mit den Systemen der Massenkommunikation filmen. Diese Luft, die, ähm, aus der Fellinis Neuformulierung des Lebens gespeist wird, hat auch das goldene Zeitalter des Hubschraubers in den USA eingeläutet. Anfang der 1960er Jahre waren Hubschrauber für den Vietnamkrieg und verzichtbar geworden. Ich möchte das nur noch mal äh, betonen. Man sieht hier ein mobiles Krankenhaus. In dem Bild sieht man nicht unbedingt die Hubschrauber, aber das ist ein Phänomen, dass Teile dieser äh, Gebäude von Helikoptern, von Hubschraubern geliefert wurden. Die Luft, die benutzt wird, die wird von allen Seiten genutzt und das Ganze wird ähm, mit Benzin quasi gesteuert und wird auch das wird auch gleichzeitig von den Hubschraubern geliefert und ähm, steuert im Grunde genommen auch. Die US-Regierung subventionierte auch aktiv die Nutzung von Hubschraubern für den zivilen Transport. Die meisten wurden von Vietnam-Veteranen geflogen, insbesondere in Städten, in denen die Bundesinvestitionen in Autobahnen, sowohl die Öl- und Automobilindustrie, die Verfügbarkeit traditioneller Formen des Massentransports eingeschränkt hatten und die Umweltverschmutzung und den Verkehr erhöht, erhöhte. Es war damals günstig mit einem Hubschrauber zu fliegen, als mit einem Taxi zu nehmen. Dadurch wurde die Nutzung von Hubschraubern normaler geworden und das Ganze hatte auch eine Art Unterhaltungswert. Diese Entwicklung hat dann auch Auswirkungen auf die zivile Nutzung gehabt. Das Ganze sieht man hier auch in der Visualisierung und das hing auch zusammen mit der Art, wie das Ganze festgehalten werden konnte. Diese Beweglichkeit ermöglichte es, dem Hubschrauber nah an die Erdoberfläche zu kommen, um dann dort Fotos zu machen und Bilder aufzunehmen, die natürlich zu einer Verbreiterung der Möglichkeiten führte. Ähm, Situationen festzuhalten. In der Folge wurden Live-Fernsehübertragungen von Staudammbrüchen bis hin zu Rassenunruhen möglich und die Überwachung der Stadtbevölkerung aus der Luft wurde Standardpolitik. Mitte der 1960er Jahre wurden Hubschrauber durch ihren vertikalen Auftrieb, ihre urbane Manövrierfähigkeit und auch ihre Sichtbarkeit zwischen nah und fern allgegenwärtig und zu polymorphen Instrumenten der informatischen Verknüpfung, die die Postmoderne vorantrieben. Wenn Künstler und Architekten sich mit Hubschraubern beschäftigen, was sie immer häufiger taten, wurden sie unweigerlich in diesen informatisch integrativen Luftraum hineingezogen. Und ich kann da jetzt viele Bilder zeigen. Das ist beispielsweise ein Projekt von dem Menschen, der ein paar Jahre später Super Studio gegründet hat. Menschen auf der einen Seite, Hubschrauber auf der anderen Seite mit einem hydroelektrischen Staudamm, in dem alle im Grunde genommen die gleiche Mittelmeerluft atmen. Bilder, in denen Architekten Hubschrauber nutzen, nicht nur um Komponenten in die Struktur einzufügen, sondern auch um die Architektur als eine Art äh, Entertainment-Komplex zu nutzen. Und das wurde im Grunde genommen ein neuer Standard. Künstler fliegen beispielsweise rum und sehen Dinge, die man nur sehen kann, wenn man im Hubschrauber fliegt, nutzen das Equipment des Hubschraubers, um dann letzten Endes die Arbeiten zu erzeugen, die nur auf diese Möglichkeit machbar sind. Das ist ein 
Projekt beispielsweise. Das sollte eigentlich ein Hubschrauber sein, eine Art Blase, in der man sich bewegt. Smith, äh, Smithson ist hier wahrscheinlich der berühmteste Vertreter in diesem Kontext. 1972 gab es einen Text von Spiral Jetty und da schrieb Smithson, und ich zitiere, für meinen Film, ein Film ist eine Spirale aus Einzelbildern, ließ ich mich von einem Hubschrauber aus Filmen, vom griechischen Helix, Helikos bedeutet Spirale, war ich nur ein Schatten in einer Plastikblase, der an einem Ort außerhalb von Geist und Körper schwebte. Smithsons Interesse am Geräusch des Hubschraubermotors, wie es zu einem urtümlichen Stöhnen wurde, das in schwachen Luftbildern widerhalte, wurde ihm erstmals in Kalifornien bewusst wo die Formulierung des Hubschraubers als Kulturtechnik in den Operationen der Postmoderne besonders deutlich wurde. Hubschrauber waren Schnittpunkte, die die Luftfahrtindustrie, Verkehrsnetze, Disneyland, Immobilienspekulation, den Telejournalismus, die Filmindustrie und die akademischen Disziplinen der Stadtplanung, Architektur und Soziologie miteinander verbanden. Ed Soger ist ein Beispiel, jemand, der sich wirklich Gedanken darüber gemacht hat, über die Rolle, die Hubschrauber gespielt haben, wenn es darum geht, beispielsweise die ähm, Aufstände in Los Angeles 1965, aber auch in 1992 durch eine Hyperrealität ersetzt hatten. Das war eins der Thema. Er hatte auch verstanden, dass die Demonstranten auf den Straßen Hubschrauber nutzten, um zu verstehen, wo die Polizei aktiv war. Also die Kritik am Helikopter fand im Grunde genommen auch erst durch den Hubschrauber statt. Charles Jenks hatte selbst in dieser Zeit auch in Kalifornien gearbeitet und er ähm, argumentierte, dass diese architektonischen Ikonen nicht für Menschen oder Kameras, sondern für Hubschrauber entworfen wurden. Ibn Bang hatte ja diese Idee auch selbst schon formuliert, gerade in Bezug darauf, wie man heute auch Architektur sich auf Instagram ansieht. Bevor Jenks oder Sawyer in Los Angeles ankamen oder auch anfingen an der UCLA zu unterrichten, gab es Denise Scott Brown, die das Jahr 1965, 66 als Dozentin für Stadtplanung an der neu gegründeten Hochschule für Architektur und Stadtplanung verbrachte. Sie hat viel Zeit da mit verbracht, eben im Grunde genommen die Stadt zu ver verstehen. Man sieht das auch daran, wie häufig sie sich in ihren Arbeiten um dieses Thema kümmert. Das Ganze hat sie im Grunde genommen für Transport genutzt, also die Hubschrauber, aber auch für Forschung, Pädagogik, für Vernetzung, für die Unterhaltung. Selbst in der beruflichen, in der professionellen Entwicklung war es einfach so, dass der Hubschrauber immer in einem sich überlappenden, schlecht definierten Sinn agiert hat. Trotz der Tatsache, dass sie immer eine Kamera hatte und trotz der Dramatik, der Tatsache, dass es einfach nur sehr wenige Fotos gibt, die allerdings viel verbreitet wurden, war es so, dass die meisten Bilder im Grunde genommen so aussahen, also substanziell gemacht auf, aus Epi Ep epistemologisch schlecht fotografierten Bildern und darauf sieht man weder die wirklich totalisierende Sicht der typischen Bilder aus der Luft. Auf den Bildern sieht man mitteldistanzierte Bilder, die im Grunde genommen re relativ verschwommen sind, häufig grenzenlos, die belohnen nicht unbedingt die ästhetische Kontemplation, sondern versuchen eher Muster der Kultivierung der städtischen Felder zu finden. Die Welt sieht dort oft ähm, gekippt aus im Grunde genommen, weder taktil noch nah noch optisch noch fern sondern mit dem, was Riegel eventuell als normales Sehen bezeichnet hat, haben hätte können. Und sie zeigen eine fast umständliche Verhandlung zwischen Subjekt und Objekt, fern und nah, zwei- und dreidimensional. Ein Prozess des Vertrautwerdens mit einer neuen Art von hybrider Umwelt. Ich habe eine Art von Obsession mit dieser Dreiviertelsicht, die man häufig sieht, wenn man aus Hubschraubern sieht. Und das wäre ein Beispiel. Ich interessiere mich wirklich für die Beziehung zwischen der Dominanz, dieser axiotaktischen Sicht, die man da auch so immer wieder sieht. Cedric Price ist hier ein guter Ansatzpunkt für diese Art zu denken. Er hat beispielsweise auch Spiegel genutzt, um dann auch 
auch diese Dreiviertel-Sicht zu reproduzieren. Und ja, das ist eine Frage, die auch noch mal sehr spannend ist. Abru Shea, diejenigen, die sich die Ausstellung angesehen haben, die haben ja wahrscheinlich schon ein paar Werke dort gesehen. Also da ging es um einen Hubschrauber im Jahr 1965. Ruchet ähm, war im Grunde genommen auch Scott Browns Modell. Er war der Urheber und auch eine Nutzerin des Hubschraubers als Forschungsinstrument. Aber die Allgegenwart des Hubschraubers stellt nicht nur die übliche maskulinistische Genealogie der Originale in Frage, sondern auch die Art und Weise, wie die Modelle der Autorschaft, von denen sie sich ableitet, die zunehmende Unvermeidbarkeit der Umwelt von Komplexen, denen der Hubschrauber sowohl unterworfen als auch zum Objekt wurde, nicht erkennen. Das war natürlich für Rochet besonders spannend. Die Auswirkung des Helikopters, des Hubschraubers auf Rochet ist natürlich besonders spannend. Spannender noch als nur die Nutzung des Hubschraubers, beispielsweise durch die Gegend zu fliegen. Also das hat Rochet gemacht und wurde so im Grunde genommen zu seinem Gegenteil ein Dr. Jekyll und Mr. Hyde Moment. Man ist plötzlich in der Luft und sieht diese Muster des Landes in der Wüste und dann kauft er ein Grundstück. Er kauft dieses Grundstück, entwickelt dann dort, baut dort ein Haus. Die Presse berichtet, Modemagazine berichten darüber beispielsweise hier und das Ganze wird dann zusammengefasst äh, bzw. geht weiter damit, dass ein gewisser Frank Gehry als Architekt angestellt wird. Diese Luftperspektive war natürlich neu, nicht neu im Bereich der Immobilienspekulation, aber die Revolution, die wurde im Grunde genommen noch durch die Medien verstärkt. Es gibt wahrscheinlich kein besseres Beispiel dafür, als wenn man sich die Küstenlinie Nordkaliforniens hier ansieht. Das Ganze auch basierend auf diesen spekulativen Flügen. Das ist immer noch ein Monument der Postmoderne zur Nichtentwicklung. Und das ist ein sehr bekanntes Beispiel aus den westlichen USA. Die Regulierungen damals waren extrem restriktiv. Und das hatte dann wieder mögliche Auswirkungen auf die Zugänge zum Meer. Also es wurde beispielsweise rumgeflogen, irgendjemand hat gesagt, hey, da sind doch zehn Meilen wunderbares Land. Der Impuls wäre natürlich, das zu kaufen, das dann zu verändern und das mit Architektur zu füllen. Die Architektur, die ja voll damit ist, dass darüber gesprochen wird, das Land zu schützen, schützen. Also die Ambivalenz wurde im Grunde genommen normalisiert. Werbemöglichkeiten wurden plötzlich genutzt. Ähm, eine architektonische Kultur, die, darum, die dazu führte, dass man die Kontradiktion, die Widersprüche zwischen der Nutzung ähm, des Landes und gleichzeitig den Schutz des Landes im Blick behält. Dies, wir sehen hier beispielsweise Werbebilder. Häufig war es so, dass die Architekten im Grunde genommen diese, diese Art Sprache selbst übernommen haben. Also das Land wird im Grunde genommen als Werbefläche verstanden. Ähm, es gibt hier unterschiedliche Werkzeuge, die benutzt werden können. Züge und Schreibmaschinen gehören zu einer gut untersuchten Reihe von Geräten, die durch die Modernisierungsprozesse grundlegenden Werte, Geschwindigkeit, Leistung und Abstraktion kohärent gemacht wurden. Hubschrauber und eine noch nicht vollständig erforschte Reihe an anderer medialer Apparate von Versorgungsketten über Designvereinbarungen bis hin zu Zippe Tone, von denen keiner besonders schnell originell oder heroisch ist, die meisten ihren Ursprung im Militär haben, aber auch tief, wenn auch unsichtbar, in die kulturelle Produktion und Kritik eingebettet sind, untermauern die Prozesse der Postmoderne aufgrund ihrer Unzulänglichkeiten, die Interdependenz erzeugen. Der Mangel an autonomer Handlungsfähigkeit machte sie anfällig für die Produktion unerwarteter Konstellationen von Komplexen, die sich sonst vielleicht nicht gebildet hätten. Ein epistemologisches Analogon zu den medialen Effekten des Hubschraubers, zum Beispiel die Art und Weise, wie seine langsame Allgegenwart Verbindungen zwischen dem Boden, einem Krieg und einem Kunstwerk hergestellt hat, kann auch in den Unterrichtsmaterialien gesehen werden, die Scott Brown während ihrer Jahre in Los Angeles zusammengestellt hatten. Man sah hier beispielsweise auch den Lehrplan, die Lehrpläne, die waren vergleichsweise lang und textlastig und das Ganze wurde dann im Grunde genommen den Studenten zur Verfügung gestellt, zusammen mit diesen ganzen Anmerkungen. 25 Leute mussten es teilweise noch mal lesen. 
Ähm, und teilweise äh, war das direkt brutal, wenn es darum geht, die dem ganzen zugrunde liegenden politischen Systeme in der Verstädterung zu verstehen. Für mich ist im Grunde genommen das Außergewöhnlichste daran, dass das Ganze ja im Grunde genommen den Studierenden übergeben wurde, diese Toleranz, was die Ambivalenz angeht, die dann ja später auch verschwunden ist. Die Hubschrauberbilder, die operierten, die waren ja innerhalb einer Infrastruktur, die unterschiedliche Dinge verbunden in einem dynamischen System, in einer Infrastruktur der Systeme, die ja letzten Endes davon abhängen, von den Zusammenhängen zwischen Luft und Boden, Maschinen und Menschen. Die eigentümliche und verwickelte Medienökologie des Hubschrauberluftraums führten auch nach 1965 zu unerwarteten Verbindungen. 1977 stürzte ein US-Lufthubschrauber vom Dach des Pan Am-Gebäudes, wobei fünf Menschen ums Leben kamen und auf den Straßen darunter ein Kriegsgebiet entstand, wie die New York Post schrieb. Richard Donner, der 1978 den ersten Superman-Film drehte, sah in der Katastrophe eine Gelegenheit, Katastrophe, die eine Gelegenheit, die Geschichte umzuschreiben und und dem postmodernen Historismus seinen ersten erlösenden Helden zu geben. Auch Richard Serra sah diese fünf verstorbenen Menschen als Möglichkeit, den Tod in ein Potenzial umzuwandeln. Er heuerte den Hubschrauber und die Bergungsmannschaft an, um seine Stahlplatten in die Spezifik des Ortes zu manövrieren. 1984 jedoch, das Jahr, in dem der Macintosh von Apple die, die normale Nutzung von Computern auslöste und damit die Verbreitung von Computern, ähm, das war im Grunde genommen das größte Jahr des Hubschraubers, ein Wendepunkt, nachdem andere Apparate zu wichtigeren Akteuren in den Prozessen der Postmoderne wurden. Jameson behauptete, dass im Hubschrauber, Zitat, etwas von dem neuen Mysterium des Lebens steckt. Was ich versuche zu sagen, ist, dass für den Hubschrauber der Raum nicht unbedingt mysteriös ist, keine Abstraktion. Der Raum ist die Luft, die er atmet, die Luft, die sich zwischen der Erdoberfläche und 10.000 Fuß über der Erde befindet. Luft, die auch von allen irdischen Organismen geatmet wird. Luft, die nicht nur durch Veränderungen der Biomasse, des Kohlenstoffs und anderer toxischer Emissionen, sondern auch durch die Wellen, Impulse, Temperaturen und Materialien materiellen Beugungen der Informationsinfrastrukturen, die ebenfalls von und in der Luft leben, bedingt und umgestaltet wird. Oder anders gesagt, so zukunftsträchtig Jamesons Theorie für die Betrachtung der Geschichte der Gegenwart auch bleibt, der Effekt des Hubschraubereinsatzes war nicht die Produktion eines konzentrierten und daher eindämmbaren Raums. Man könnte tatsächlich sagen, dass die obsessiven Sprachspiele, die einige Kritiker zu der Zeit betrieben, um im Grunde genommen Versuche waren, das Unkontrollierbare zu kontrollieren, indem sprachliche Strukturen auf das auferlegt werden sollten, auf elementare Bedingungen im Grunde genommen. 1984 schwebten während der Olympischen Spiele über L.A. über 100 Hubschrauber und schufen damit sowohl das größte Sicherheitssystem, das jemals in Friedenszeiten eingesetzt wurde. Äh, S-Band, K-Band, UHF, VHF, jedes davon erforderte mehr und mehr Elemente, Energien, die sich alle durch diesen Luftraum bewegten, besetzt durch den Hubschrauber. Schwebend, wohnend, atmend, die Informationsumgebung annehmend. Leo Steinberg hat ja 1968 die Effekte der Informationen auf den Naturalismus des Malens beschrieben und er sagte, dass die Subjekte dieser Effekt von nun an wirklich etwas verändern würden, und zwar im Innenraum, um dann die Temperatur außerhalb zu verstehen. Die Effekte dieser Informationsentwicklung waren noch elementarer. Sie haben im letzten Endes die Unterscheidung zwischen drinnen und draußen erodiert, denn Netzwerke, aber auch Knotenpunkte waren plötzlich ein materielles Netzwerk, das eine Temperatur veränderte und die atmungsaktive Atmosphäre der Erde durchdringte. Um jetzt 
zum Abschluss des großen Momentes der Helikopter zu kommen. 1984 war es ja so, dass über Los Angeles über 100 Hubschrauber flogen während der Olympischen Spiele. Die schufen damit sowohl das größte Sicherheitssystem, das jemals in Friedenszeiten eingesetzt wurde, als auch das größte Medienereignis, das jemals live im Fernsehen übertragen wurde. Während der Abschlusszeremonie flog ein großer Militärhubschrauber über das Kolosseum. Er war für das Publikum unsichtbar. Da es schwarz gestrichen war, die Lichter waren ausgeschaltet. Selbst das Geräusch der Rotoren wurde durch zwei zivile Hubschrauber, die ihn auf beiden Seiten begleiteten, getarnt oder überlagert. Es handelte sich um einen Hubschrauber-zu-Hubschrauber-Komplex, der nicht Christus, sondern ein Raumschiff trug und in der Luft über dem Kolosseum schwebte, wo er Licht- und Tonsignale an das Publikum sandte, das mit Taschenlampen ausgestattet war, um darauf zu reagieren und so ein artübergreifendes Kommunikationsspektakel veranstalte. Die Hauptrolle des Hubschraubers als schwebender äh, Signifikant war die abschließende Aufführung dessen, was als temporäres städtisches Internet begonnen hatte. Ein Komplex aus elektronischen Sicherheitsausweisen, computerverknüpften Verkehrs- und Kommunikationssystemen und einer aus Einzelteilen bestehenden Gesamtdesignstrategie, die Kostüme, Pavillons, Straßenschilder, Drucksachen und Logos umfasst die sich schließlich über die gesamte Stadt ausbreiteten und deren Elemente schließlich zu dauerhaften Bestandteilen der städtischen Infrastruktur wurden. Einige Knotenpunkte in diesem dynamischen Netzwerk waren sichtbar, andere unsichtbar. Aber die Luft dieses Raums zu atmen, war keine Wahl. 1984 lebten etwa 8 Millionen Menschen in Los Angeles und 2,5 Milliarden Menschen verfolgten das Ergeb er Ereignis live. Circa 94,2 Prozent der Menschen, die 1984 geboren wurden, leben heute noch, sind immer noch am Leben. Wer von uns wurde noch nicht postmerdenisiert? Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank für die Darstellung der Postmoderne, ausgehend von den Geräten und technologischen Änderungen. Und wir können keinen besseren Folgeredner haben als Ronald Martin der ein führender Denker der Macht ist und die Verschiebung der Macht und der Medientechnologie. Ronald Martin ist auch ein Gründer des Journals Graveman. Er ist ein Professor an der Architekturausbildungsstätte der Columbia University und er hat einige Veröffentlichungen herausgebracht und die Parker ist ein sehr großer Fan und deshalb wird er später Needberg geben, Knowledge World Media, Materiality and the Making of the Modern University und auch Utopias Ghost, Architektur und die Postmoderne. Und das war wirklich sehr einflussreich auch für uns, für die Gestaltung unserer Ausstellung. Und er vergleicht hier zum Beispiel den Hauptsitz in Karbein mit der Bhopal-Katastrophe in Indien 1984 und die Individualisierung hier einerseits und dann auch noch die Gefährdung des Lebens andererseits. Und das ist auch eines der, ein Teil der Ausstellung hier. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank, dass Sie die enge Beziehung zwischen der Postmodernen und der Konservativmus beschreiben, dass wir jetzt auch wieder beobachten, jetzt auch in der Postmodernen, aber wir können auch verschiedene historische Phasen erkennen. Vielen Dank, Reinhold. Nun denn. Ja, gut. Vielen Dank erstmal, vielen Dank, Kolja. Und erst einmal herzlichen Glückwunsch für diese tolle Ausstellung. Und das ist wirklich sehr beeindruckend. Und ja, ich kann kaum abwarten, wieder zurückzugehen in die Ausstellung. Ja, also erstmal einen herzlichen Dank an Kolja und Eva und natürlich auch an Silvia für. Ja, diesen Vortrag, diesen hellenden Vortrag. Und ich werde mein Best, auch einen Beitrag zu leisten und zu sehen. Und es wird interessant sein, zu sehen, was wir gemeinsam haben. Und dann auch im Hinblick auf eine andere Unterhaltung. 
Also möchte ich meinen Vortrag einem gemeinsamen Freund widmen, Tony Whitler und Ellen Whitler, dem Architekturhistoriker, der vor kurzem verstorben ist. Und ich spreche jetzt darüber, was jetzt noch übrig bleibt hier von einer nicht abgeschlossenen Unterhaltung mit Tony, die ich halt eben mit ihm begonnen hatte vor einiger Zeit. So, dann los geht's. Und ich hoffe, ich darf mit einem etwas längeren Zitat beginnen. Ich entschuldige mich jetzt schon dafür. Und das wird auch wirklich das letzte Zitat sein. Das heißt, die Studenten an den europäischen Architekturschulen werden nicht mehr in der Grammatik der klassischen Ordnung unterrichtet. Sie lernen nicht mehr Gesimse zu verstehen, bestehende Denkmäler, städtische Straßen, die menschliche Figur oder so wichtige ästhetische Phänomene wie den Lichteinfall auf ein korinthisches Kapitell oder den Schatten eines Campanile auf einem schrägen Dach. Sie lernen nicht mehr über Fassaden, Gesimse, Türöffnungen oder irgendwas anderes, das man aus dem Studium der großen klassischen Abhandlungen von Serlio und Palladio lernen könnte. Der neue Lehrplan soll ideologisch geprägte Ingenieure hervorbringen, deren Darstellungsfähigkeiten nicht über Grundrisse und isometrische Zeichnungen hinausgehen und in der Lage sind, die gigantischen Projekte des sozialistischen Staates durchzuführen. Menschen in in Wohnsiedlungen einzuschaufen, Industrie- und Gewerbegebiete anzulegen, Autobahnen durch alte Stadt zu bauen und die Mittelschichten ganz allgemein daran zu erinnern, dass Big Brother sie sieht und dass sie nicht mehr das Sagen haben. Jetzt aber wird sich all das ändern. Wie man hier sieht, das sind die Worte des britischen ästhetischen und politischen Philosophen Roger Scruton. Das wurde 2016 veröffentlicht und das ändert sich jetzt also. Und in einem Essay, in dem, der, dem der das Werk des luxemburgischen Architekten Leon Krier würdigte, und wir wissen ja, dass sich wirklich etwas änderte 2016, und zwar auf beiden Seiten des Atlantik. Scruton hätte die kitschigen Resorts Golfclubs und spekulativen Bürogebäude, die in den vorangegangenen Jahrzehnten von dem Immobilienentwickler äh, errichtet wurden, der in jenem Jahr zum US-Präsidenten gewählt wurde, sich allerdings mit dem Vandalismus, wie er es nannte, verglichen, der von modernistischen Architekten und Planern verübt wurde. Dennoch weiß derselbe amerikanische Präsident, der vier Jahre später, nachdem er bereits abgewählt worden war, das war Ende 2022, die Verfügung 13.967 unterzeichnete, das heißt die Förderung einer schönen föderalen Stadtarchitektur. Und der ursprüngliche Titel hat das besser ausgedrückt, nämlich Make Federal Buildings Beautiful Again. Und diese Verfügung, also das stimmt so, die vorschreibt, dass alle neuen Bundesgebäude, einschließlich derer, vor allem derer in Washington D.C., im klassischen Stil gestaltet werden müssen, wurde von der National Civic Art Society ausgearbeitet, einer privaten Gruppe unter der Leitung von Justin Schubau, den der Herrscher von Ma'alago 2018 in die US-Kunstkommission berufen hatte und der jetzt im Beirat der Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation sitzt. Und ja, das ist also jetzt eine Verbindung zwischen diesen Vorträgen. Scruton, an dessen Beerdigung im Jahr 2020 sein langjähriger Freund Viktor Orban teilgenommen hatte, zusammen mit anderen weniger bekannten Persönlichkeiten der nationalistischen Internationalen, gehörte zu den führenden konterrevolutionären Intellektuellen des späten 20. und frühen 21. Den Jahrhunderts. Auch seine 1979 erschienene Abhandlung, die Ästhetik der Architektur, gehört zu den verschwindend wenigen philosophischen Werken jener Zeit, die sich ernsthaft und systematisch mit der Architektur befassen. Und das ist wirklich hier ein Werk über die Architektur. Es gibt wirklich nur ganz wenige, was ich sehr bedauere. 
Und diese beiden Tatsachen stehen miteinander in Verbindung. Die Gegenwart von Orban und anderen nationalistischen Führern am, beim, äh, bei der Beerdigung. Und für Scrooge und Architektur eine öffentliche Kunst, die die Erbauung des kollektiven Geschmacks durch eine Form einer aristokratisch-populistischer Bildung gewidmet war, was sich auch zeigt in der Begeisterung für Krias Urbanismus wie auch seine Gebäude. Die Straße als eine geordnete Anordnung von Fassaden, äh, vorzugsweise im klassischen Stil, war die Arena, in der die ästhetische Richtigkeit ausgestellt und erlebt werden sollte. Und als unverbesserlicher Kulturkämpfer sah Scruton in den ungegenständlichen Künsten der Architektur und Musik ein Mittel, um die Auswüchse linker Politik, sozialistischer Planung und kritischer Theorie durch intellektuell vermittelte ästhetische Schulung zu korrigieren. Auf Letztere ging ein, er in einem anderen Buch ein, aus derselben Zeit, nehm das und all diese sind lesenswert. Das war Thinkers of the New Left, 1985 erschienen, das eine Sammlung seiner kritischen Essays ist aus der Salisbury Review. Und das wurde dann noch einmal aktualisiert und neu aufgelegt, und zwar 2015 unter dem wunderbaren Titel Fools, Rods and Firebrands, also Narrenbetrüger und Hitzköpfe. Scruton selbst stammte aus der englischen Arbeiterklasse und er datiert sein eigenes politisches Erwachen auf den Mai 68 in Paris, die er als die schönste Stadt der Welt bezeichnete, als er festhielt, wie diese elenden, verwöhnten Gören versuchten, alles niederzureißen. Sein systematisches Werk der politischen Philosophie, The Meaning of Conservative, Conservatism stammt aus dem Jahr 1980 und das wurde verfasst ein Jahr nach seiner Abhandlung über Architektur. Philosophisch gesehen ist sein politischer Klassizismus, denn das ist es, ist in seiner Betonung der Stadt oder der Polis tatsächlich straußig. Straußisch. Und es handelt sich, anders gesagt, nicht um den postmodernen Neokonservatismus mit seinem Verzicht auf große Narrativen, die Jürgen Habermas in der gleichen Zeit so beunruhigten. Es ist auch nicht das Ende des Triumphes des Neoliberalismus, wie man das auch hier sieht, über das Ende der Geschichte, den Francis Fukuyama ein Jahr später feiern sollte. Das ist das Tatsächliche, eine seriöse politische Philosophie der Rechten, vielleicht sogar der Rechtsextremen, durchzogen von einer unverblümten Islamophobie, die Scruton gegen Ende seines Lebens dazu brachte, sich in infamer Weise über die, ich zitiere, plötzliche Invasion riesiger muslimischer Stämme in Ungarn zu beschweren, einem Land, das seiner Ansicht nach vom Soros Imperium, wie er es nannte, antinationaler kosmopolitischer Juden regiert wurde. Das sind Bemerkungen, wegen derer er des Antisemitismus beschuldigt wurde und er wurde von seinem Posten als Wohnungsbauberater in Theresa Mays Kommission Building Better, Building Beautiful enthoben wurde. Das war im April 2019. Und ich sollte auch sagen, dass Gruton sich sehr energisch gegen diese Anschuldigungen verteidigte und ich will mich auch hier nicht auf eine solche Schlammschlacht einlassen die ihm so viel Spaß machte, wie in seiner Kritik, in seinem Kampf gegen die Critical Theory, also wenn es um Philosophie, also Philosophen der Linken ging. Vielmehr möchte ich erklären, wie es gut uns denken, es uns ermöglicht, in der Architektur ein, Counter, ein kontrarevolutionäres Programm zu erkennen, das sich vor langer Zeit mit einem politischen Projekt verbündet hat, das uns wirklich sehr am Herzen liegen sollte. Und Krier seinerseits ähm, war und ist auch immer noch ein architektonischer Purist, der vor politischen Äußerungen nicht zurückschreckt, trotz des unaufrichtigen Bekenntnisses zur künstlerischen Autonomie, das ihn dazu brachte, eine berüchtigte Monographie zu veröffentlichen, nämlich Arbeits Bär Architektur, das war 1985, und diese wurde 2013 wieder herausgebracht mit einem verteidigenden Vorwort von Robert A. M. Stern. Die Historikerin der NS-Architektur Barbara Miller Lane beschrieb das Buch in einer postmodernistischen Sprache als Pastiche. 
Also so beschrieb sie das Buch, und zwar aus ver bereits veröffentlichten Materialien, das mit Fragmenten von Kriers eigenem Diskurs vermischt wurde. Krier selbst wies jede allzu einfache Gleichsetzung zwischen Speers monumentaler neoklassizistischer Architektur und der politischen Elegie der sie diente zurück. Dennoch in einem Essay mit dem Titel »Eine Architektur der Begierde«, den er an das Biermaterial anheckte, konnte den feministischen Antifaschismus von Klaus Teweleit, den er zitiert, auf den Kopf zu stellen. Und er zitiert Klaus Teweleit im Essay, indem er die von Teweleit invertorisierten, mechanisierten Männerfantasien als Ausdruck legitimen kollektiven Begehrens umdeutet wie er das nannte, das durch die Industrie vereitelt oder wie er sagte, gedemütigt und frustriert wurde und wie Krier es ausdrückt, als Ausdruck ein des legitimen kollektiven Begehrens. Und das ist ein Absatz in einem Abschnitt, der im Essay nicht mehr vorhanden ist, das heißt in eben der Neuauflage und es gibt sehr viele Veröffentlichungen und Neuveröffentlichungen und das ist eine andere Form des Pastels. Und eine Passage, da Spears wollte das abheben, also auch die Rolle von Speer. Also ihm war, für ihn war es in Ordnung, dass wir hier eine Vermischung mit der Politik hatten, aber ihm behagte die Industrialisierung weniger. Das Herzstück des Buches ist ein Portfolio von Speers Arbeit, angeführt von einer aufwendigen Präsentation von Speers grandiosen Plan für Groß-Berlin. Und erst hier wird Kriers Pastiche von Speer schlüssig. 1983, zwei Jahre vor der ursprünglichen Veröffentlichung des Speer-Buches, hat der Architekturkurator des Museums of Modern Art, Arthur Drexler, hier beauftragt, einen hypothetischen Masterplan für die Fertigstellung von Washington DC zu erstellen. Und wir haben hier eine ganze Reihe von Masterplänen. Und das ist eine Vorwegnahme der 200-Jahr-Feier der Stadt Stimmgründung. Und dieser Plan wiederum geht auf einen anderen Gegenplan zurück, der etwa ein Jahrzehnt zuvor für die Stadt Luxemburg aufgelegt wurde. Und damals konkurrierte Luxemburg mit Brüssel, denn es sollte verschiedene Institutionen der Europäischen Union übernehmen. In dieser Abfolge erscheint Kriers Aneignung von Speers Plan für Berlin als das, was ein anderer seiner Gesprächspartner, Rem Kohlhaas, als rückwirkendes Manifest bezeichnet. Und in dem Fall nicht für den Finanzkapitalismus, sondern für den Heimatschutz oder halt eben den Schutz des Vaterlandes. Hier beschreibt Kreer seinen Gegenplan für Washington D.C., das ist der Plan, unser Land und unsere Werte gegen seine Feinde zu verteidigen und große Häuser, Paläste und Städte zu bauen, sind allesamt gleichermaßen edle patriotische Taten und Pflichten. Eine Heimat besteht nicht nur aus Menschen und ihrer Geschichte, sondern aus all den Dingen, die unsere Augen sehen können, die unsere Sinne erfassen können. Wenn wir sie nicht lieben können, wenn sie unsere Herzen nicht entflammen, werden sie uns dazu bringen, uns und unsere Mitbürger zu hassen. Und das Zitat geht noch weiter. Die oberste Aufgabe des Architektes besteht darin, das Vaterland zu bauen und zu erhalten. Nun, das hier wäre das Vaterland. Und wie in Speers Architektur der Sehnsucht des Begehrens geht es also bei der Wiedergewinnung des klassischen Ideals vor allem darum, Liebe zu wecken. Liebe zu vermitteln. Sowohl in Krias als auch in Spiers Entwürfen für Hauptstädte mit Anklängen an das kaiserliche Rom. Hier, das wäre das von Krier. Also kristallisiert sich dies zu einem abschränkenden, gefühlsbetonten Nationalismus, der das Heimatland, die Heimat aufbaut, nicht nur in den Straßen, sondern auch in den entflammten Herzen der Bürger, wie er es nannte. Was wie ein weiteres postmodernes Spiel mit der klassischen Sprache aussehen mag, ist aber todernst. Weit davon entfernt, sich auf einen leeren Austausch von oberflächlichen Effekten einzulassen, stößt Krier mit Hilfe von Speer eine geschärfte korinthische Säule in die Tiefen der Seele. Das hier ist ein Vergleich oder eine vergleichende Darstellung von Säulen im Buch über Speer und das ist ein, ein weiteres Beispiel hier in Berlin. 
Also hier wird eine geschärfte, angespitzte Säule in die Tiefe der Seele gesteckt. Und Klassizismus hier also mehr als nur Stil wie Kria sonst wo erläutert, werden in dem Bemühen um die Wiedergewinnung von Bedeutung der, zur Verteidigung der Heimat alle Formen traditioneller Architektur und des Städtebaus als klassisch angesehen, einschließlich so unterschiedlicher Werke wie der elitäre Populismus von Hassan Fatih oder die Sparsamkeit von Henry Bacons Lincoln Denkmal. Und es besteht also dann kein Widerspruch hier in dem Plan auch für Luxemburg. Hier wird ein Gegenentwurf zum, das sieht man oben, das von Kria. Also ein Gegenentwurf wird geschaffen zum modernistischen Masterplan, den Josef Wago für Luxemburg im Wettbewerb der europäischen Hauptstädte um den EU-Sitz vorgeschlagen hatte. Kria legt die visuelle und verbale Betonung auf die Materialien. Das soll eine Stadt aus Stein sein, wie er sie nannte, die liebevoll als paneuropäische Heimat gestaltet wird, im krassen Gegensatz zu einer entfremden Stadt aus Stahl und Glas, die, wie wir annehmen müssen, von kosmolitischen Bürokraten bevölkert wird, die damit beschäftigt sind, Europas Grenzen für eine postkoloniale Arbeiterschaft zu öffnen, die das Ende der Geschichte in Form der postindustriellen Utopie, die Krieger so sehr verachtete, aufbauen und aufrechterhalten soll. Wie so eine Rückgewinnung des Speerschen Reichskapitals, das aber nur weniger wünschenswert ist, ist Krias früher Gegenentwurf für eine neueuropäische Heimat, ein Europa für alle Europäer. Wie die Zeichnungen deutlich machen, ohne dies direkt auszudrücken, das ist wichtig, soll diese Heimat von Roskindschen Steinmetzen aufgebaut werden, die ihr Handwerk durch sichere Blutlinien weitergeben und in den einzelnen Vierteln des Plans leben. Also das hier sind die verschiedenen Viertel, die Kriers als Städte in Städten bezeichnet. Und sie sollten nicht von ungelernten Wanderarbeitern aus ehemaligen Kolonien aufgebaut werden, die sich auf den Straßen mit anonymen europäischen Massen vermischen und in modernistischen Sozialwohnungen am Stadtrand leben. Wenn also diese Interpretation vielleicht etwas zu tendenziös erscheint für Europäer, also also wenn dies zu tendenziös erscheint, dann möchte ich noch ein weiteres Bei Detail anfügen, bevor ich weitermache mit einem letzten Beispiel aus DC. Unabhängig von der Faszination für Speers Idiom schrieb Krier 2009 über klassische und volkstümliche Architektur, ist wieder ein Zitat, typologische Experimente, genetische Idiosynkrasien und Kreuzungen können sich nicht fortpflanzen. Das Lebensprinzip bedeutet Wachstum bis zur Reife, Fortpflanzung nach dem Typus und der Stabilität der Art. Der Klassizismus geht davon aus, dass dies auch für das künstlerische Schaffen gilt. Für den Fall also, dass diese Rassifizierung Botschaft über unfruchtbare Kreuzzeuge nicht ankommt, erklärt ein mindestens zweimal veröffentlichtes Diagramm von Kria hoffentlich die, seine Logik folgender Art. Pluralismus ist kein Problem an sich, solange jeder in der Stadt, in der Stadt bleibt, wo sie hingehören. Probleme entstehen nur bei Rassenmischung, wenn diese die Blutlinie zerstört und die Reproduktion von Typen architektonischen und anderen verhindert wird. Um ja, nun. Dies sei dahingestellt. Und ich komme jetzt wieder zurück auf Scrooge. Es ist wichtig, dass dies alles nicht explizit ist. Oder nun, eigentlich ist das ja wirklich deutlich genug. Als ungegenständliche Kunst. Und das ist ein wesentlicher Teil seiner Theorie. Und er sagt, dass die Bedeutung der Architektur vermittelt wird durch das Zusammenspiel von Intellekt und Erfahrung und nicht durch ein Zeichensystem. Das ist also nicht semiotisch. Das Verständnis von Architektur ist also keine Frage der semantischen Dekodierung, sondern eine Frage der kultivierten, geschmackvollen Würdigung. Es spielt keine Rolle, ob Krieger irgendetwas davon versteht. Seine sorgfältig kuratierte Persönlichkeit ist die eines Architekturwunderkindes, eines männlichen Kindes, das viel zeichnet und das seine Bücher Charles III. widmet, Montprince, wie er ihn liebevoll nennt, dem königlichen Mäzen von Poundbury außerhalb von Dorset, einem weiteren Gegenprojekt von Kria, das in dem Fall auch tatsächlich verwirklicht wurde. 
Und oh, sei es in Berlin, Luxemburg, Washington oder Poundbury, was zählt, ist nicht die Botschaft, sondern die unartikulierten Abstammungslinien. In all diesen Gegenprojekten ist die Fußgängerzone eher ein baulicher Ort als ein entfremdender Ort, an dem die Bürger zusammenkommen, um sich auszutauschen über Erfahrung und Geschmack, die durch die schönen und populären Künste kultiviert werden. Das ist die Straßenpolitik der nationalistischen Internationalen, die sich auch auf Budapest und Prag erstreckt, wo Scruton mit Dissidenten hinter dem eisernen Vorhang zusammenarbeitete und von dort wiederum auf Washington D.C., das als architektonische Version von Ronald Dragons strahlender Stadt auf dem Hügel im späten Kalten Krieg wiedergeboren wurde. Es ist eine Politik, die weitaus militanter ist. Also wie gesagt, das ist ja wirklich sehr militant. Also militanter als der ambivalente Relativismus der Strada Novissima, dem Herzstück der Biennale von Venedig 1980, zu der Krier eine Fassade beisteuerte. Denn wie ich schon argumentiert habe, war die philosophische Angst, die diese deformierte, verformte benjaminische Arkade bei Leuten wie Habermas hervorrief und Habermas besuchte ja diese Ausstellung. Also, also nur insofern gerechtfertigt, als der neoliberale Antihistorismus das einzige Gespenst war, das Europa und damit das postmoderne Weltsystem heimsuchte. Aber das war es nicht. Es gab noch andere Gespenster. Auf diesen Straßen ging es auch um das Vaterland, dessen Liebe töten kann. Wie wir auch wissen, kann diese entflammte Liebe ihren Hass auf das Objekt ihrer Begierde richten, und zwar in einem Ikonoklasmus, der die Denkmäler resakralisiert, wieder heilig macht, indem er sie einer rituellen Zerstörung unterwirft, auf die auf unzeitige Weise eine vitalistische Wiedergeburt folgt. Nicht lang nach der Uraufführung der Bühnenarchitektur der Strada Novissima wurde eine weitere Bühne für echtes politisches Theater geschaffen, und zwar in Fogger Bottom, einem Bürogebäude aus dem Mitte des letzten Jahrhunderts in Washington D.C., wo sich das Außenministerium der Vereinigten Staaten befindet. Dort entwarf der in Südafrika geborene amerikanische Architekt Alan Grimbeck 1983 eine Reihe von Empfangsräumen, das ist mein letztes Beispiel, und Büros für den Außenminister und seinen Stellvertreter. Und die das sind die sogenannten Treaty Ceremony Suite oder Treaty Rooms. Und es gibt auch einen, einen großen Konferenzraum, das Büro, das Arbeitszimmer des Außenministers und eine Galerie. Für diesen Auftrag wird Greenberg, das in Architektur strenger neoklassizistisch ist als die von Krier, eine Variation der korinthischen und ionischen Ordnung, die an die Aufgabe angepasst ist, an die staatliche Diplomatie zu umrahmen. Und Greenbergs Beitrag zum klassischen Kanon nennt sich Great und überlagert das Adler- und Flaggenmotiv des großen Siegels der Vereinigten Staaten mit den traditionellen Akanthusblättern oder Schriftrollen in den Kapitellen der Säulen und Pilaster, die die Räume säumen, korinthisch für den Vertragsraum, den Sekretär, ionisch für den Stellvertreter, wie hier zu sehen ist. Grünbergs Schirmherr bei diesem Projekt war der zweite Außenminister von Präsident Ronald Dragon, nämlich George P. Schulz, der, wie Grünberg berichtet, wünschte, dass sein eigenes Büro den Charakter von Räumen haben sollte, in denen sich Thomas Jefferson, der erste Außenminister, wirklich wohl und zu Hause führen würde, weil er spürte, dass auch etwas Neues geschehen war. Und im Gegenzug war Schulz in seinem Vorwort zu, Vorwort zu Greenbergs historischem Überblick über über den amerikanischen Neoklassizismus mit dem Titel The Architecture of Democracy, das war 2006, voll des Lobes über Greenwells Beitrag zur Reagan-Regierung. Wieder ein Zitat, also das war der ehemalige Außenminister. Das Ergebnis ist ein erhebender Raum, der an die schönsten Momente der amerikanischen Geschichte erinnert und sowohl die Bewohner als auch die Besucher dazu anregt, ihren Blick zu erheben und sich der Umgebung würdig zu erweisen. Obwohl unklar bleibt, was es für einen besuchenden Diplomaten bedeutet, sich dieses Rahmens würdig zu fühlen, ist der Sinn klar genug. Politischer Kitsch mit Adlern geschmückte korinthische Säulen. Ich bitte Sie, verstärkt durch das Klischee eines herzerfrischenden Raums, der postmoderne Bürokraten so ein Ziel inspirieren soll, ist nationalistisches Theater. Weniger offensichtlich ist, wie sich dies über Skuten mit einem Angriff auf den sozialdemokratischen Staat und seine rassifizierten 
beiden Nutznießer verbindet, die in Dragons früherer Präsidentschaftskampagne als Welfare Queens, als Wohlfahrtsköniginnen bezeichnet wurden. Green Bird, Great Seal oder bezieht sich direkt auf Benjamin Latropes Ersetzung des korinthischen Akanthus durch Maisschalen und Tabak, Tabak, Tabakblättern in den Säulenkapitellen des wieder aufgebauten Kapital, Kapitols. Das war ein dramatisches Beispiel. Doch im Fall der Räume des US-Außenministers, wie auch im Fall des sogenannten neuen Klassizismus allgemein, weitet sich der scheinbare Dialog der Architektur mit sich selbst zu einer Konfrontation mit dem modernistischen Gebäude aus, in dem sie untergebracht war. Und das ist das Gebäude, in dem diese Räume errichtet wurden. Und das wurde von Graham Anderson, Probst und White gebaut, 61. Und diese stilisierte, niedrige, düster wirkende Gebäude mit seiner glatten Steinfassung Fassadeten sich wiederholen, quadratischen Fenstern, den reduzierten Details und das diente als Kulisse für die Arbeit von Greenberg. Die sich daraus ergebende Montage klassischer Ausstattungen erinnert an die historischen Räume, die zu dieser Zeit zu allgegenwärtigen Behältern für das selbstgestaltete Erbe des Landes wurde. Wie in einer Max-Ernst-Collage wurden diese neuen Innenräume zu einem Lehrbuchbeispiel für das, was Henry Russell Hitchcock zuvor als Architektur Bürokratie bezeichnet hatte, und zwar in einem ungewollten Tourismus Realismus, der die rhetorischen Triumphe des Reaganismus nachahmte. Die Pseudokondeur der Rückkehr zur Ordnung nach 68 wurde in Reagans Hollywoodartiger Mischung aus Populismus und falsch klassischer Redekunst eingefangen, in den Neorealist Schopprunk gegen die Webersche Bürokratie als neue Sprache des Staates antrat. In dem reziproken Surrealismus der Vertragsräume der Tütjungs mit ihrer großen Siegelordnung stand eine monströs verschönerte Parodie der klassischen Harmonie, die als das verpackt wurde wurde als Reagan ähm, in einem Fernsehspot 1984 als Morgen in Amerika bezeichnete. Um besser zu verstehen, wie dieser neue Klassizismus einer Architekturdemokratie entgegenwirkte, müssen wir Chris Amann akzeptieren, der Klassizismus kein Stil ist und seine Wiedergeburt als ideologisches Programm erkennen, das sich der Herstellung von Bedeutung widmet. In seiner Abhandlung über Architektur aus 1979 vergleicht gut und zwei Gabeln, das ist der philosophische Text. Eine, auch links, ist ein schwedisches, modernistisches Beispiel. Das andere ist neoklassisch. Und er behauptet, dass die klassische Säule proportioniert ist. Und sie ist sowohl ästhetischer als auch funktionaler, denn sie entspricht eher einem natürlich müßigen Lebensstil. Daraus ergibt sich, dass kandidatische Gabeln und modernistische Planungen zusammengehören. Indem er sich über den ästhetisierten Utilitarismus der schwedischen Gabe lustig macht, gelingt es Gruten durch einen syllogistischen Kunstgriff, den gesamten europäischen Wohlfahrtsstaat und seine sozialistische Extrapolationen nicht aus politischen oder wirtschaftlichen, sondern aus ästhetischen Gründen zu verwerfen. Diese Strategie der Gegensätze wurde von A. W. N. Pugin als zuverlässige Technik zur Gleichsetzung von Kunst und Moral entlehnt. Ende 2020 wurde sie auch sehr wirksam von der National Civic Art Society benutzt, den skrutanischen Verfassern der, der Verordnung 1379 über die Förderung von schöner Bundesarchitektur und die und das war in der gleichen Zeit, als die Regierung gestürzt werden sollte. Weil es als schamloser Opportunismus erscheinen mag, eine letzte Anstrengung im Namen der bürgerlichen Künste steht dem Einklang mit der wilden Politik Amerika wieder groß zu machen. Make America Great Again, wenn wir ein nüchterneres Dokument mit dem Titel Americans Preferred Architecture for Federal Buildings, die bevorzugte Architektur der Amerikaner für Bundesgebäude betrachten. Ein Bericht, der vom MCAS ähm, herausgegeben wurde und diese diese Organisation war auch in der Ausarbeitung der Verfügung beteiligt. Der Reich bebildet Broschüre fast die Ergebnisse einer Online-Umfrage zusammen und diese gaben dort ihre Präferenzen an für jedes der sieben Paare. Das hier ist die Gegenüberstellung von Regierungsgebäuden. Eines ist traditionell, traditionell in der Regel neoklassizistisch, das andere modern. Und die Ergebnisse nun überparteiliche Unterstützung für traditionelle Architektur in allen Bereichen. Doch so wie es Grutons schwedische Gabel 
ohne Worte von der Sozialdemokratie und seine neoklassische Gabel von aristokratischem Populismus sprach, verbargen die NCAS-Autoren in ihren kontrastierenden Bildern eine unausgesprochene Frage. Welches von beiden ähnelt mehr der Architektur, der unanständigen Wohlfahrt und der des tiefen Staates, wie sie es nannten? Also ich zitiere nur und wir kennen die Formulierung sehr wohl wieder. Und welches entspricht eher dem frommen Reichtum und der Macht? Wie Roger Scruton überzeugend dargelegt hat, ist die Architektur eine nicht repräsentative Kunst. Sie ist ein schlechtes Medium für ausgesprochene Botschaften und zeichnet sich dadurch aus, dass sie Bedeutung ohne Worte vermittelt. Scruton nannte diese nonverbale Bedeutung Richtigkeit, die für das geschulte Auge erkennbar ist. Diese stillschweigende Verständlichkeit hat sich als besonders nützlich für diejenigen erwiesen, die, erwiesen, die wie Leon Krier und die Ideologen des INCAS die dunkelsten und abscheulichsten Loyalitäten ihrer Kunst in Vergangenheit und Gegenwart plausibel leugnen wollten. Denn dies sind die Straßenkämpfe der Kulturkriege, die bald das ästhetische Schlachtzelt kontrollieren könnten, wenn wir uns zu lange von den Spielchen der Postmoderne ablenken lassen. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much, Vielen Dank, Reinhold. Und damit möchte ich jetzt gerne Sie sofort auf die, auf die Bühne nochmal einladen, zusammen mit Silvia und Noah Barker, der ein subtiler und sehr genauer Schriftsteller ist. Manchmal auch ähm, schreibt er über Künstler beispielsweise zusammen. Also in seiner Arbeit Toy Machine macht er das. Da beschäftigt er sich ja mit dem Farbkodex des Centre Pompidou. Ähm, er vergleicht das mit, dem, mit, dem, äh, mit der Infrastruktur der Ausstellungsgebäude. Aber vor allem ist Noah ein exzessiver Leser. Wir haben also großes Vertrauen in ihn und darin, dass er vielleicht die beiden gehörten Vorlesungen noch mal ein wenig hinterfragt aus der Perspektive einer Person, die nach 1989 erst geboren wurde. Damit übergebe ich an Sie, Noah. Du solltest eigentlich in der Mitte sitzen, richtig? Okay. 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 Vielen Dank zuallererst für diese Präsentation, Reinhold, Silvia und danke natürlich auch für die Veranstalter dieser Veranstaltung. Es ist tatsächlich jetzt erstmal schwierig, diese beiden Ideen des Postmoder der Postmoderne zusammenzubringen, aber wenn wir mit Jamesons Ansatz anfängt. Er unterschreibt ja zwei unterschiedliche Formen der Postmoderne. Einmal eingebettet in das poststrukturelle Projekt, der Tod des Autors und so weiter, sehr reaktionär. Einerseits sehe ich natürlich den Hubschrauber, der ja verkörpert ist im Geiste dieser Rede, der interdisziplinäre Überfliegen des Territoriums des 20. Jahrhunderts, diese Verbindung von unterschiedlichen Systemen, ähm, Un Inkonsistenzen beispielsweise am Beispiel der Fotos, die wir auch gesehen haben von Brown. Und auf der anderen Seite sehe ich natürlich das Reaktionäre, das Hyper-Postmoderne oder vielleicht auch die, die späte Postmoderne. Und wenn wir uns die, die späte Moderne ansehen, eine kulturelle Praxis, die stattfand, die da war in den 60ern, 70ern, als Jameson ja seinen Text formulierte, der dann in den 80ern als Buch veröffentlicht wurde. Aber die frühere Herausforder äh, Herausgabe war ja eher ein Essay, eine Reaktion auf Ernest Mendel, den marxistischen Ökonomen, eine Analyse des späten Kapitalismus, ein, ein Verständnis für wirklich den Kollaps, das Zusammenbrechen des Nachkriegsabkommens, in dem ja die USA Deutschland unterstützten, aber auch der Wiederaufbau als Hubs des Wieder, als Wiederaufbaus, das war ja etwas, was als amerikanische Vorherrschaft dann wieder hinterfragt wurde in den neuen Ökonomien. Und innerhalb dieses Bereichs 
gibt es natürlich noch das Aufkommen des Computers, der Bombe, aber daneben auch die Techniken, die Technologien des Kriegs, die natürlich integriert werden müssen in das Alltägliche. Und das ist eigentlich die Angst, die damit ausgedruckt wurde, mit der Präsenz des Hubschraubers. Also von JFK nach Manhattan zu fliegen beispielsweise, das kann man vergleichen mit ähm, dem Flug von Saigon oder mit der Reise aus Saigon in die Wälder dort. Na gut, wenn man das jetzt ein bisschen weiter denkt, würde ich sagen, dass dieses wirtschaftliche Modell, das ja beansprucht wurde, da habe ich mich gefragt und damit würde ich gerne eigentlich Reinhold eine Frage stellen. Gibt es Elemente dieses, wie man sagen könnte, Zombie-neoliberalen Projektes, das ja zumindest seit circa 2008 aufkommt als neue Krise, die Trump, der ja mehrfach genannt wurde in der Rede, der hatte vielleicht seinen anhaltendsten Auswirkungen, nicht nur kulturell, also ich würde widersprechen, wenn es darum geht, in welchem Ausmaß die Demonstranten damals vor dem Kapitol der Ausdruck eines neuen, einer neuen, gefährlicheren Rechte waren. Ich glaube, es war mehr eine Art unterdrücktes Brodeln dieses populistischen Momentes. Ähm, er, er greift ja vor allem auch China an und es gibt diese Implikationen, die immer wieder aufkommt, also was die wirtschaftliche Reaktion angeht. Sehen Sie da eine, eine, ein, eine Art Feiern von Amerikaner, also wirtschaftlich, also Protektionismus, meinen Sie, also diese Art? Genau, die Bürokraten, die verkörpern ja eigentlich ein bisschen den Spirit etwas auszuführen. Also präsidentielle Büchereien beispielsweise. Häufig wird ja da auch etwas nachgestellt, beispielsweise das Oval Office oder der Präsidentensessel. Und da kann man dann persönlich nachvollziehen, wie es sich anfühlt, Verantwortung zu haben. Und die Bürokraten, die... Nun, ich versuche jetzt auch ein paar Gedanken zusammenzubringen, im Versuch, das zu beantworten, und dann würde ich auch an Silvia übergeben. Aber mir scheint, als ob, okay, man kann natürlich mit Jameson, mit dem Essay von Jameson angaben. Es gibt eine, der bezieht sich auch auf China, nennt China. Also es gibt einen Dichter, ich habe den Namen vergessen, einen, einen Kalifornier, der hat ein Gedicht über Chinatown in San Francisco geschrieben. Und eine wichtige Dimension der Perspektive, und das ist etwas, was äh, mir immer wieder begegnet, wenn ich über dieses Material Vorlesungen halte, also Jamesons, ist ja, da ist im Hintergrund eine Art Weltsystem, die Idee eines Weltsystems, eines globalen Systems. Und wie auch immer wir es nennen, Kapitalismus, Neoliberalismus etc., das ist ja im Grunde genommen nur ein Aspekt, eine Seite eines größeren Systems und China, zumindest damals während der Industrialisierung, ja, war ein, ein Teil davon im, im, Sinn, im Zuge des wirtschaftlichen Aufschwungs. Das wäre ein weiterer Aspekt, ein weiterer Ausdruck. Ich glaube, diese Dinge gab es immer von Anfang an. Und ein anderes Thema, Giovanni Arimi, auch ein Wirtschaftsökonom, ein, ein politischer Ökonom, spricht da auch drüber. Er hat dann über Adam Smith in Beijing geschrieben, nämlich quasi aus der Perspektive der anderen Seite, also wie das Weltsystem in den frühen 2000ern aussah. Wie auch immer, zu den Hubschraubern. Also da haben wir natürlich einmal diesen Aspekt von Apocalypse Now, Weltuntergang. Das, das ist da auch noch im Hintergrund, und, und Vietnam und so. Denn Jameson, er bezieht sich ja auf Michael Hurst's Buch, äh Buch, Dispatches. Da geht es ja um Kriegsjournalismus, auch um Hubschrauber. Mit den Truppen ist er da unterwegs. Und 
mir scheint es, als ob es da einen Ort gibt, also in, zumindest in den USA gibt es eine Schwierigkeit, wenn es darum geht, den Vietnamkrieg und die Konsequenzen auch im eigenen Land zu akzeptieren, aber auch die Konsequenzen in Vietnam selbst. Und den Hubschrauber, der ist für mich eine Art Allegorie in beide Richtungen. Ist das so richtig? Vietnam im Grunde genommen. Ja, also ganz buchstäblich. Das ist eigentlich keine Allegorie, aber ich denke, es ist auch, wenn es jetzt um China, Vietnam geht, da gibt es ja viel Auslagerung im Grunde genommen auch. Ich denke, allegorisch könnte man sagen, dass die Beunruhigung, was beispielsweise Umweltthemen angeht, das wurde auch ausgelagert. Da hat man gesagt, hey, das passiert da drüben und nicht bei uns, nicht irgendwo anders. Das scheint mir eindeutig Teil des Ganzen. Darf ich selbst eine Frage stellen? Natürlich. Ist das in Ordnung? Nee, bitte. Gerne. Stellen Sie gerne Ihre Fragen. Mich interessiert wirklich äh, also Ihre Gedanken zu Architektur und Liebe, denn das ist ja auch etwas, worüber Sie in Ihrem tollen Buch schreiben, über Uni Campus leben. Heute haben Sie im Grunde genommen gesagt, dass die Mo äh, Kommunikationsmodi, Architekturmodi, ob die gut sind im impliziten, äh, im Verfassen impliziter Botschaften, mehr noch als in expliziten Botschaften. Macht es das nützlich als Liebesobjekt? Oder? Nun, ich weiß es nicht. Das ist ein interessantes Gespräch. Ich muss jetzt im Grunde genommen laut nachdenken über diesen Ansatz. In dem Fall habe ich wirklich versucht, Skultons Philosophie treu zu bleiben. Er, er spricht da nicht drüber, aber Krier spricht da drüber. Also das ist ne, Washington DC als Liebesobjekt, als Objekt der Begierde. Aber ich denke, da ist was dran das im Grunde genommen gegen die vorherrschende postmoderne Betonung auf Bedeutung angeht, mit der Architektur beispielsweise, aber auch andere Kulturformen, nämlich dass damit eine Bedeutung durch die Botschaften erst äh, übermittelt wird. Also und da würde ich mal sagen, zum, zum, zuallererst mal würde ich Sie beim Wort nehmen. Ja, Scruton hat ein Buch auch über Musik geschrieben, also Musik und Architektur. Das sind die nicht gegenständlichen Künste, die gut mit Liebe, ja, ich glaube, da könnte, das könnte sich in zwei unterschiedliche Richtungen aufteilen, aber zum einen wäre es natürlich sehr effektiv, sehr emotional. Also ein, was das klassische Verständnis von nationalsozialistischer Kunst angeht beispielsweise, die Kritik der Ästhetisierung der Politik. Benjamin bezieht sich da auf Menschen wie Speer. Und das hat ja teilweise auch mit diesen äh, emotionalen Aspekten zu tun. Aber es gibt noch ein nüchterneres Element, ein kantisches ähm, Element. Und ich glaube, es gibt hier bald eine Ausstellung zum, zu Kant in den nächsten Monaten. Und da möchte ich unbedingt, das möchte ich mir sehr gerne ansehen, aber kantisch im Sinne von äh, durch Intellekt gesteuert, also mehr in Verbindung mit den Kategorien, die wir nutzen, um äh, Erfahrungen zu verstehen. Aber diese nicht verbale Verständnis, was das Zeichen und die Bedeutung angeht, ja, da glaube ich, dass es eine Tradition gibt in der Ästhetik, die noch nicht so weit entwickelt ist innerhalb der Kultur, in der wir uns ja bewegen, in der wir hier sprechen. Es ist sehr anglophon, sehr, sehr analytisch. Also die, die Ansätze, die man in Cambridge beispielsweise verfolgt, wenn wir uns jetzt Scruton ansehen so wie das entwickelt wird. Ich glaube, wir haben damit eine Art Hebel. Es ermöglicht uns zu verstehen, in diesem Fall, wie man es sagen kann, ohne es zu sagen. Aha. Das erinnert mich daran, Sie haben ja auch über den Deep State, also den tiefen Staat gesprochen, über das, das größte Nachrichtendienstgebäude der Welt gibt es ja in Deutschland, der Umzug vom BND nach, nach Berlin. Und 
In der Beschreibung des Buches wird das auch beschrieben, nämlich wie wichtig es ist oder wie sie versucht haben, die Front, die Fassade im Grunde genommen ein bisschen zu verstecken. Aber das passt gut zu diesem internationalistischen Ansatz mit der Fassade, die im Grunde genommen ein bisschen überblendet ist. Aber ich habe noch mal über die Luft, die Straßen nachgedacht und dann diese epistemologische ähm, Referenz im Grunde darum, was, äh, wo es darum geht, was der Hubschrauber bedeutet. Und ja, Sie wollten es gerade nicht eine Allegorie nennen, aber wenn man sich beispielsweise nochmal den Unterschied zwischen dem Zug und der Möglichkeit, die sich damit ergibt, die neue Welt wirtschaftlich zu verändern, als dieses große Finanzprojekt und im Gegensatz dazu den Hubschrauber als äh, dezentralisierte äh, Bezeichnendes, was man dann in der postmodernen Welt nutzen kann. Nun, ich werde versuchen, das zu beantworten, aber ich möchte tatsächlich noch etwas zum Thema Liebe sagen. Ich interessiere mich ja für Liebe und Misogonie, das Problem der Reproduktion. Das, das ist ein Thema, das mich interessiert. Sie haben das jetzt gerade beschrieben. Aber die Liebesregeln zu vergleichen, wie man sagen könnte, die ja implizit sind in der Architektur, die Sie zeichnen, im Gegensatz zu dem, was wir jetzt vielleicht die Liebesregeln, die man in Galerien sieht, die sind ja ganz anders. Ich weiß nicht, ob die Eliminierung die, der Dinge, die man vielleicht jetzt erstmal klassisch Begehren nennen würde, ob es darum geht oder ob es einfach um die Normativität geht in Bezug darauf, was erlaubt ist gemäß eine, einer, einer gewissen Regelstruktur. Also einfach relativ anders als die orgiastische Liebe, die sonst so gezeigt wird. Nun, der Hubschrauber zum Hubschrauber. Viele Menschen, und da bin ich, also denke, da bin ich nicht alleine, ich überdenke wirklich, wie wir über historische Themen in Umweltbegrifflichkeiten sprechen. Luft, äh, Himmel, das sind Themen, die sehr viel metaphorisiert wurden in der Geschichte. Und viele Wissenschaftler denken darüber nach als einen Ort, in dem chemische und physische Entwicklungen stattfinden. All das Ganze hat physische Eigenschaften und das Ganze manifestiert sich dann materialistisch. Und was ich immer faszinierend finde in Bezug darauf, wie die Postmoderne eingeklammert wird oder ausgeklammert wird, ist, dass es eigentlich wenig Verständnis dafür gibt, wie die ökologischen das ökologische Wissen, das man ja seit den 1940ern in den USA hat, wo das verloren gegangen ist. Ein aktives kulturelles Problem, das man eigentlich in den 50ern hatte, bis in die 60er und dann richtete sich die Aufmerksamkeit auf Vietnam. Das Ganze haben wir irgendwie verloren und dann wurde nicht mehr weiter darüber nachgedacht, bis vor kurzem. Ich glaube, dass der Hubschrauber eine Möglichkeit ist, über also anders als der Zug, anders als mit Zügen, geht es eben nicht nur darum, die industrielle Warnfertigung zu verbessern, zu verschnellern, sondern es ist ein informatisches Gerät, das uns äh, ermöglicht, Verbindungen herzustellen. Aber es hat natürlich genauso materielle Eigenschaften. Und darüber nachzudenken, welche Eigenschaften das sind, welche Auswirkungen die haben, wo die Auswirkungen ausgelagert wurden beispielsweise, das ist Teil dessen, worüber, von dem ich denke, dass Postmoderne uns ermöglicht, darüber nachzudenken. Das war jetzt eine lange Antwort. Und vielleicht einmal die Einladung, wenn jemand Fragen hat aus dem Publikum oder Anmerkungen, die er oder sie teilen möchte, dann ist das natürlich ebenfalls möglich. Ja, das wäre spannend. Wenn nicht, würde ich in der Zwischenzeit sagen, können Sie vielleicht noch ein bisschen mehr darüber sprechen, was Sie meinen in diese ähm, Veränderung, in diese Auslagerung hin zu Vietnam und das Ökologische als Teil der Entwicklung in den 60ern und 70ern. Ich bin mir nicht sicher, ob ich Sie da verstanden habe. Also ich glaube, diese Vorstellungen, die Bilder, 
Die Nutzung von chemischen Giftstoffen, das wurde ja, das war ja weit verbreitet, auch in den Massenmedien wurde das kommuniziert. Aber insbesondere im Kontext Vietnam wurde darüber gesprochen, nicht unbedingt, wenn es um die globale Landwirtschaft ging. Da war das nicht unbedingt ein Thema. Und ich glaube, das hat eine Art Unterdrückung der Entwicklung, was ökologisches Bewusstsein anging, an. Ging. Das, da gab es, das fuhr im Grunde, das, das führte dazu, dass die, dass die ökologische Erkenntnis an Bedeutung verlor. Zum Thema Hubschrauber. Mesh. Und das war das, worüber ich mich gerade als, als allegorisch geäußert hatte. Mesh. Also im Koreanischen Krieg, da wurde das genannt. Aber es geht ja mehr um den Vietnamkrieg und diejenigen von uns, die, die damit groß geworden sind. Also es ist etwas Intergenerationelles. Aber man konnte das eigentlich nicht, nicht mitbekommen, wenn man ferngesehen hat. Denn das war damals so, also MASH, auch als das zum ersten Mal gezeigt wurde, da war das wirklich schwierig, in ähm, der Öffentlichkeit, im Fernsehen, das zu kritisieren, nämlich die Außenpolitik der USA zu kritisieren, direkt zu kritisieren. Deswegen wurde das indirekt kritisiert. Und, und ich kann das jetzt nicht genau nacherzählen, aber Apocalypse Now ist ja ebenfalls eine Möglichkeit, eine Art, die sich dieses Themas gewidmet hat. Die Gewalt, die dort stattfand, die dort ausgeübt wurde von den Systemen, über die Sie gerade gesprochen haben, das kam plötzlich nach Hause zu uns. Und das wurde dort auch wirklich erkannt, anerkannt. Also plötzlich kamen Leute aus Vietnam zurück nach Pennsylvania. Aber zum ökologischen Thema. Okay, Kolja hat ja über etwas gesprochen, was ich selbst als, als Aufmerksamkeit bezeichnet habe in dem Buch Postmoderne. Also das wurde dort auch genannt. Also in den frühen 1980ers, 80ern war es so, dass Union Carbike, also einer der äh, Hauptakteure im ökologischen Bereich, die haben beispielsweise Düngungsmittel produziert und die haben, nun, Kevin Roast hat ein, äh, ein, ein Hauptgebäude designt für dieses Unternehmen, das kann man auch in der Ausstellung sehen, für Union Carbide. In Connecticut war das. Und die Luft, die Möbel, das ganze Umfeld dort wurde sehr äh, individualisiert gestaltet. Jeder hatte in seinem oder ihrem Büro eine ganz spezifische Ausstattung beispielsweise, also auch sehr individualisiert. Ich würde also sagen, Prozesse der Normalisierung auf unterschiedliche Arten und Weisen, beispielsweise im städtischen Businessleben und im Kontext. Also das ist im Grunde genommen eine Maschine für diese Art Denken, dieses Gebäude. Aber gleichzeitig, Unicarbide, äh, hat ja auch an Pestiziden gearbeitet, auch in Bhopal in Indien. Und da gab es ja einen Austritt von tödlichen Gasen. Das führte dazu, dass wirklich zahllose Menschen gestorben sind. Also zahllos, die wurden nicht gezählt, buchstäblich. Tausende Menschen, die in der Nähe dieser Fabrik gelebt haben, gearbeitet haben, starben. Menschen, die dort in den Slums lebten. Diese Luft, es gibt unterschiedliche Arten Luft. Es gibt die Luft in Connecticut, die gut kontrolliert ist, die unter Kontrolle ist. Und dann gibt es diese giftige Luft in Bhopal. Das Ganze wird aber produziert und gehört der gleichen Entität. Und das ist das, worauf ich mich jetzt gerade beziehen wollte, indem ich darüber nachdenken wollte, dass das Ganze zu einem globalen System gehört. Und globale Systeme, nun, da sprechen wir über Zentrum, Peripherie, aber ob man jetzt diese Sprache nutzen möchte oder nicht, nun, die Idee, dass Dinge hier passieren und Dinge woanders passieren, aber das Ganze ist natürlich miteinander verbunden. Strukturell sollen die jedoch getrennt werden oder als getrennt verstehen worden. Und deswegen hat es so lange gebraucht, bis die Opfer tatsächlich ähm, etwas zurückbekommen haben, beziehungsweise entschädigt wurden. Die meisten wurden gar nicht entschädigt, denn es gibt einfach diese ganzen unterschiedlichen Ebenen, ähm, wo im Grunde genommen getrennt wurde, was in Connecticut stattfand und was woanders stattfand. Kolja has a question. Kolja möchte eine Frage stellen. Uh, 
Ich habe eine Frage an dich, Reinhold. Und das betrifft Roger Scruton. Die Kritik der Postmodernen zum Beispiel, wie zum Beispiel die Postmoderne ist verantwortlich für Donald Trump, denn es geht darüber, dass es keine Regeln, keine Kriterien mehr gibt. Jeder kann machen, was er will. Und das ist offensichtlich ein Missverständnis der Postmoderne. Aber wäre es vereinfacht, wenn man noch weiter geht, wenn man sagt, dass diese Bestätigung der Macht durch Verweise darauf, was immer schon stattgefunden hat, auch in der Antike, in der Antike oder im Büro von Thomas Jefferson, dass also, also das ist diese, Post, diese konservative Kritik der Postmodernen, sind freiwillige Gesten der reinen Macht ohne jeglichen Kriterien. Ja, wir sprachen ja schon davon, aber in Amerika, vielleicht auch sonst wo, also zumindest in jüngerer Zeit, war das Ziel ja die kritische Rassentheorie und das ist eine Art von legaler, rechtlicher Theorie und das wurde eigentlich gar nicht so genau erläutert und es wurde nie klargestellt, worum es geht, aber es ist eine Art von Rechtstheorie, abgeleitet vom Poststrukturalismus und der Kritik von Annahmen der jeweiligen Strukturen, die Herrschaftsstrukturen und so weiter, die auch in der Terminologie enthalten sind und in der Formulierung von Gesetzes Vorschriften, also in Hinblick auf die Rasse. Und Sie machen die Critical Race Theory für alles verantwortlich. Und ich versuche zu erklären, dass es ein Projekt gibt oder ein philosophisches und politisches Vorhaben, das nicht nur diese Strohfiguren errichtet, damit man halt eben hier äh, die einfachen Ziele bekämpft, Pluralismus und Relativismus und so weiter, sondern es gibt ein wirklich tödliches Vorhaben, dass sich in, noch in der Schaffung befindet. Das heißt, das, was hier geschieht und dort geschieht, das sind die gleichen Leute. Also die Leute wie Scruton ähm, schreiben ja Lehrbücher um oder bestimmte Bücher werden verboten, die Race Theory wird verboten oder dann halt eben diese geforderten neuen öffentlichen Gebäude. Also die beiden Dinge gehören zusammen. Ich glaube, dass die Einfachheit, die Leichtigkeit, mit der all dies dann umgesetzt wird zu einem Diskurs über die Postmoderne. Also es wird dort schwierig, etwas zu erden. Und das ist wirklich eine ständige Debatte ab die, von Anfang an auch in der marxistischen Theorie wie in der Architektur. Letztendlich geht es darum, wo man steht. Es ist ziemlich eindeutig, wo die Leute stehen. Aber das sind manchmal auch die Postmodernen. Teile der amerikanischen Politik. Das heißt, wir haben jetzt sehr viel Gewalt an verschiedenen Orten und man kann es ignorieren. Und manchmal ignorieren die Leute, die man für die Guten hält, machen das auch. Und jetzt, wenn man sie ignoriert, sieht man, wo sie stehen und wer an der Macht ist. Und dann sind sie vielleicht noch etwas schlimmer als die, über die sie reden. Und dann dann ähm, ist man eigentlich ein Verbrechen gegen das eigene Gewissen. Also es, es ist nicht unbedingt ein Generationending oder so. Also dass man sich nicht mehr erpressen lässt und so weiter und wie vulgär die andere Seite auch sein kann. Ja, genau. Ich verstehe genau, was du meinst. Ja. Nun, wir warten noch auf Fragen. Ähm, sind wir noch in der Zeit? Die letzte Frage? Gut, vielen Dank. Die Frage richtet sich an Silvia Laren. Vielen Dank für Ihre Feststellungen. Moment, ich muss mal etwas aus dem Licht gehen, denn das blendet mich so. Meine Frage betrifft auch die Frage der Perspektive, 
die Sie ja ansprachen in Ihrem Vortrag. Denn man kann ja nicht wegschauen von der Politik und der Wirtschaft. Und es geht um die Distanzierung und die Allegorien, die Vergleiche, die Sie auch herangezogen haben in diesem Bereich dessen, wie man die Postmoderne jetzt versteht oder verstehen soll. Also das betrifft auch die Giftigkeit und die Künstlichkeit des Käfers und das ermöglicht auch ein Verständnis der Beziehung zwischen Mensch und Natur. Und ich frage mich, was Ihre Sichtweise ist oder welche Schlussfolgerungen Sie gezogen haben. Hier zum Beispiel, wenn Sie sich Dennis und Brown anschauen oder die Architektur von oben sehen oder wie das Militär für Menschen aussieht, die ja dann ja aussehen würden wie Insekten auf diese Entfernung sozusagen. Und wie dies auch in Beziehung steht zu, zu dem gesellschaftlichen und politischen Verständnis dieser technologischen Entwicklung und der Auswirkung auf künftige Machtstrukturen, die Gesellschaftsordnung oder Gesellschaftsunordnung oder wie die Architektur und auch diese Ent, dieser, äh, dieser entmenschlichen Aspekte dieser Perspektive durch die Nutzung von Hubschrauber als allegorischen Gerätes für verschiedene Interessen, wie dies äh, sich auch in Cartoons katapultiert. Und es gibt ja auch noch so viel anderes, wie zum Beispiel hier die Idee, die, die, die man in Marvel findet, Insekten, die können giftig sein oder entfeiert oder halt eben auch die Dämonisierung der Natur. Ja, Sie haben das angesprochen und ich möchte mehr hören darüber. Danke. Vielen Dank für diese eindeutig gestellte Frage und ich versuche das zu beantworten auf eine Art, die auch der Diskussion hier entspricht. Also, Reinhold, du hast ja das Problem mit Union Carbide beschrieben und das ist, könnte man als strukturierte Ignoranz bezeichnen. Also die Art, wie dieses globale Unternehmenssystem aufgestellt ist, so dass es halt eben vorgibt, dass es etwas nicht weiß. Das ist eine Möglichkeit des Verständnisses der Struktur des Problems und eine andere Möglichkeit des Verständnisses. Und ja, all das könnte natürlich auch gleichzeitig geschehen. Und ja, das könnte man dann auch vom Hubschrauber aus beobachten. Also hier die Fähigkeit, es hinzunehmen und es zu wissen, nicht, nicht, nicht wissen, sondern wenn man all das weiß und dann hinzunehmen, was geschieht. Ich glaube, das wollte ich auch ausdrücken mit dem Hubschrauber. Denn man kann, denn in den 60ern konnte man zumindest in Amerika nicht in einen Hubschrauber steigen, ohne zu verstehen, ohne dass einem klar war, dass man sich in einem Militärgerät befand. Die Piloten waren alle vom Militär. Und jeder wusste das und es gab keine Strukturierung hier, die dann sagte, dass sehr viele Menschen starben, ohne dass man es wusste. Man wusste darüber. Und ich interessiere mich für die Verfügbarkeit solcher Informationen und was die Leute damit angestellt haben. Und, und ich kenne die Antwort darauf auch nicht, aber hier haben wir die Glattheit zum Beispiel von Obama. Hier ein, ein ganz ein schlüpfriger, glattiger Typ, was er wusste, was er nicht wusste, was er better, hätte besser wissen sollen. Ich steige da nicht durch. Und wenn man dann zu den Greenbooks und Creas und zu Trump kommt und Leute der Art, dann haben wir kein Problem damit zu verstehen, was ihre Politik ist. Aber je glatter ein Typ ist, dann weiß man nicht, ähm, verschleiern Sie etwas bewusst, ist Obama vielleicht der postmodernste Politiker? 
Trump ist also hier nach unserem Wortgebrauch, den wir nutzen sollen. Trump ist post postmodern. Es ist ganz eindeutig, was er vorhat. Da ist nichts unverständlich, keine Manipulation der Medien. Er sagt es einfach deutlich. Obama aber wäre... Hey, ja, wir müssen die Uhr im Blick behalten. Und was meinst du dann zu Biden? Biden ist eine Zeitmaschine. Ja, genau. Er ist ein alter Modernist. Er ist. Er, hat, er könnte einen Hubschrauber geflogen haben. Ja gut, er könnte ein Pilot gewesen sein. Ja, er hat ja auch die Brille, die Pilotenbrille. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank, Kolja, vielen Dank an alle. Und damit kommen wir zum Ende. Gut, vielen Dank.
erzählst du? And now we're gonna have a legend and pioneer of postmodernist architecture speaking live from his studio in New York. James Wines is very prominently presented in the exhibition because he developed core virtues of postmodernism to the extreme. Context sensitivity, um, breaking up rules, making things fluid, taking the abstract and ideological concepts out of architecture, making society, societal anxieties, feelings, but also fun, humor, and irony, architecture itself. His supermarkets for the best chain are legend. Walls tilt, they seem to roll off. Corners uh, are bitten off the building, drive out in the morning to close the, uh, open a supermarket, drive in to close it again um, at night. James Wines also uh, participated in the competition for the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt, and the drawings and the model are also in our show. James Wines will speak on the economy of means, which is his um, perceived legacy, what postmodernist architecture leaves for builders, designers, artists today. And after James' presentation, Simon Denny will join stage, who in his way radicalized the context sensitivity of uh, visual art by um, making technological infrastructure, power concentrations in uh, tech corporations, installations. And I'm very excited for these meet this meeting of generations and for Simon Denny meeting one of his heroes. James, thank you so much for being part of this conference. Okay. Am I free to share? Yes. We see you. Is my screen shared? Yes, we see you. No, your screen is not okay. shared. No, do you see the share? Okay, I'm going to turn it on. We only see your face right now. Okay. Now, do you see that? No. Do you see take, something? Take your time. Okay. It's, the screen doesn't seem to be shared. Screen share. Okay. Host disabled participant screen. You, you've disabled my screen sharing from your end. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, studio, studio, do you hear me? It is necessary to allow the screen sharing. Frank, um, bitte. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I tried to screen share, but it's not sharing. Host disabled. You, you have disabled me at your end. That's what it says on my screen. Host has disabled participant screen sharing. You have disabled me somehow. Can you, can you enable me again? Otherwise it's impossible. James, I'm going to go down to the studio and check what's going wrong. Well, the, yeah, they, they've disabled me. Okay.
On or not? Am I on? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you very much for this invitation. It's an honor to be in this exhibition and to be able to talk <laughs> via technology. Technology doesn't quite always work. Uh, what I'll do is, since I, I've, I've cut into my time a lot, uh, I will try to be as as brief as possible. And and um, and. Okay. It seems, I wish I could get rid of this stuff at the bottom. I don't know what to do. Um, anyway, um, I, I can't seem to get rid of the area. Okay. Uh, what I would like to do is, is uh, maybe briefly go through the slides that I have prepared because they're very relevant to this whole condition of postmodern. This is an exceptional exhibition, which has been very inclusive, especially postmodernism began very much with two books, really, in fact, by the, uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. Um, uh -oh. Uh -oh, the, um, okay. Um, and it, it, it was kind of became permissible to use signage or to, to celebrate signage because so much of modern architecture and modernism and construction didn't use these images to great effect. And they applauded places like Las Vegas, which in fact hyperbolized public communication. So what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today was economy of means, not spending a fortune doing this kind of work and, and, and communicating, but also uh, looking at the future of architecture, which has to be more restrained in its ways. Uh, there was, of course, the first two books, one of which I contributed to with the postmodernism uh, at the v &A, and then there's Charles Jenks. And what happened, what it became identified with, unfortunately, was, was a kind of historical referencing and decor. And so, in effect, uh, it, it became hyperbolized in the media just because of certain visual effects and certain uh, ways of working. And of course, it, translated into pop culture, and there you know, was a permission to actually, for artists to not paint paintings by hand anymore, but they could access technology and the computer and reproduction as part of the concept. So you got into this the situation where an idea was the big point. And uh, the, the one thing that the exhibition in Bonn has 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 done, which no other, you know, coverage of postmodernism has achieved, it's celebrated the other aspects like performance art, with like people like Kusama and and uh, Joseph Boyce, uh, Nam June Pike, conceptual art, which is personified here by Joseph Kasuth, environmental art, Robert Smithson, and installation art, uh, like Damien Hirst, and what I call art chart, which I will discuss today, uh, using Rachel White read as example, and then of course this is filtered in to people and uh, digital art as well. Well, the big issue has been, and the big change was also inherent in postmodernism as a big factor was you know sitting at a computer all day, the, the programmer controlling the personalization of ideas. That was the, the very big issue. And then, of course, came CAD, and every architect in the world realized you could make any kind of shape you wanted. Uh, sadly, a lot of the references to shape making in so much of architecture, which is so expensive, is uh, borrowing or cribbing a lot from 1950s sculpture, like Henry Moore and Jean Arp and early Brancusi and so forth. But anyway, what we have <coughs> in architecture is a product of the computer is pretty much every city in the world is beginning to look exactly alike. And that's that's a big problem. And uh, part of this, of course, is, you know, is the issue, it's a kind of a macho issue that I guess uh, a lot of developers have, feel, like Mr. Trump, feel under endowed in some way. And so there's this obsession to build bigger 
and larger and taller towers. And at the other end of the, the new revolution, of course, is a selfie, which is, is, which is not unlike Donald Trump. It's, a, it's sort of an ego trip, but you, there's a departure from reality. It's, you're living totally within the context of technology. And it brings up the whole theory of simulacra from Jean Baudrillard, who expressed uh, it very well by saying that what's simulated is far more intense uh, than, than what's real. So the simulated is more real and it's substituted, it's the place of the reality. And then, of course, there's a kind of unreality of computer expression, the, the, the liberation of every designer to do any shape he wants. Not all of them are obviously art, but it, it has given this kind of obsession with digital technology. So what I'm going to talk about today is almost a polar opposite, what I call arch art. And it was a movement I was a participant in, of course, and it started in the late 60s, early 70s. And it was the capacity of artists to use architecture as a subject matter for art. And uh, I, made, I told you I wrote an essay for the original Victoria and Albert Museum catalog. And, and also I have an interview in the current one. And I'm going to applaud the current uh, exhibition in Bonn for including people like Michel Foucault, Jean Baudrillard, Jacques Derrida, Robert Smithson, Joseph Boyce, Gordon Malachar, Vito Acconci, Alice Aycock, David Lynch, uh, Richard Foreman, and Laurie Anderson. And I said, unfortunately, in the building art, the pomal imagery of choice seemed to quickly congeal into a litany of predictable stylistic devices and, in some cases, a cloyingly decorous form of mannerism. And that's essentially why the art chart movement has been the opposite. It's been much more frugal in its use of materials and, 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 and situations, really. And as I say, this is kind of a panoramic overview. And so a lot of it was inspired, of course, as I think all of the environmental artists and conceptual artists were, by Marcel Duchamp. Who, basically said, I'm interested in ideas, not mere visual products. So shape making and form making, yeah, obviously you could see it. But basically Duchamp dealt with space in a wholly different way. As you know, in the uh, first Surrealist exhibition, you know, you're kind of making by keeping away. So you, you couldn't enter the gallery because of his contribution to the exhibition. So. I like this idea of economy means. Pablo Picasso said, it, forcing yourself to use restricted means is a sort of restraint that liberates invention and obliges you to make the kind of progress you can't even imagine in advance. So I'm just going to show you that some of the art art that took place. Gordon Madikar, this uh, actually splitting a house in New Jersey, so that the actual incision in the house became this kind of preservation of the house. So it was sort of preservation by demolition because it became a work of art. Uh, he did the same thing kind of as a comment on the, uh, you know, neo-modernism, neo-constructivism of the Pompidou Center, and he chopped a hole that could call conical insect into the house building so it's being torn down. Then you have Johnny Pettina in Italy, uh, who was teaching in the United States, and transformed house, a, a, a neighborhood house by covering completely in earth. So it's kind of a, an ecological statement as well. And his ice house in Minneapolis during the winter, he and the students you know, poured water over an abandoned stool building and we cleared the ice house. And then of course, Vito Acconci in Austria, you know, tilting an entire room. He, 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 you know, just changing in his exhibition for the Bach Vienna, changing the entire context. <clears throat> the final Rachel White Reed is an amazing artist. She really casts <clears throat> reproductions of the interior of space as the exterior. And of course, did a very poignant Holocaust memorial by casting the interior of a gas chamber and making it the memorial to the exhibition. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about site, what our work is involved. We, you know, 
culture. I mentioned that we've got a series of buildings for Best Pollux building, basically using the prototype. There was the big box store was ubiquitous on all highways in America. And so rather than just conventional signage, which they always use, we transformed it socially, psychologically. And in a sense, architecture became a critique of itself. Uh, you know, people often say, oh, well, it's all about demolition and ruin. That's not really true. It's about process, coming or going. And I've always felt it was more interesting to see a building either be built or taken away. And that was, of course, architecture as a subject matter for art. And uh, so we went on to do a whole series of these buildings. I'll show you buildings that moved, for example. You push a button, and instead of the pedestrian moving, the building moves to let you in. So you have a public space, you have an individual piece of sculpture when it's open, and you have a entrance for the building. Uh, these are just other buildings, taking buildings apart in space so that you're really seeing all dimensions, I and mean, you can address the building at any scale you feel comfortable with. This is another building inside, outside. We're asked to celebrate what they do. You know, the owners, Sydney and Francis Lewis, always say, well, you never celebrate what we do. So we did. We made a thermal barrier. So inside, everything is real, and everything outside is cast. So we took the entire inside-outside relationship, totally unconventional way of display, appeal to children because they see a bicycle half inside and half outside. So inside, outside, unlike the Papua New Center, which claims to be an inside, outside building, it was not a formal statement, but a, an incision statement in the building itself. And we went on to the, uh, things like the tilt building, which is really, I feel, sort of uh, the real, a real deep constructivist endeavor it was minimal, which I always have believed in, and it, you know, changed the whole meaning of the building. And I, you know, have great admiration for two of my colleagues, Fuchsas and Frank Gehry, of course. And, but their tilting of buildings was far more complex. And in my kind of a minimal sensibility, a little bit of an overkill. So you're really uh, spending a lot of extra money Whereas, the thing about minimalism, it makes the viewer think about something. It's what it makes you think about. Then I did some core things in green architecture, which was the last of the best buildings. We incorporated the landscape. We just left the landscape as it is and built the landscape around the existing trade. The total opposite of conventional landscape architecture, which is you're always plunking down lollipop trees and sculpture and benches. And uh, so we, again, use nature, the invasion of nature to transform space inside, outside. And it even, since it was on the hillside, we even showed the underground. So all aspects of living nature in its natural state were preserved and celebrated. Uh, we did another one like that in Florida, which was a rainforest building. So water, recycled water, went down, up and down the building, and we had a garden inside, of course. And we did a lot of public spaces um, using really what I call um, triggery elements, you know, things that you would do that aren't just conventional seating or conventional uh, lollipop trees and so forth, but, but it would in some way change people's minds about something, make rethink public space. One of the... Uh, earlier pieces that we did was the ghost parking lot, which was uh, since automobiles consume petroleum, in this case, the petroleum consumes the cars. And instead of being like the examples at the top, which are, you know, public art, but they're not contextual. In the case of the ghost parking lot, you could not possibly remove this put and put it in a museum without a total loss of meaning. So it's an intrinsic including its building process, asphalting over the cars was, in fact, intrinsic to the context itself. So the context and the public art became one and the same. Uh, I, I went on to do a number of works of, you know, what I call economy of means, a entranceway to the uh, Mach Vienna bookstore. Uh, they told us we couldn't 
operate on the building. We couldn't destroy it in any way. So what I said, okay, what if I take a piece of the building, a historic piece, and call it public art? It is public art, but it includes everything of the building. So it's a preservation of the existing building as a work of public art. Um, we went on to do some large public spaces. Uh, the virtues I'm, I, I like to talk about is almost all of these things are recycling. They, they are collages of existing materials that are usually junk, part of junk culture, and we recycle them. In this case, we told the story of 20th century transportation. Uh, we monochromed everything. With that. But these are all real objects. And uh, it gave a kind of a ghostly, critical view of transportation. You know, cars shooting into space, uh, the airplane and the police car going underwater at high tide. So it, and also it involved people. Uh, one of the, to me, the greatest advantages of any public space is the engagement of people. And we had about 200,000 people a day engaged on this project. And it also made people look good to each other. By being monochromed and being kind of sardonic about transportation technology, it also hyperbolized the colors, activities, and the nuances of personality of the visitors themselves. Uh, this is a project actually on the other side of the railway station. This is like in Yokohama, Japan. <clears throat> and what we did, they asked us to do a children's plaza for children, sponsored by Isuzu Car Company. And uh, the <clears throat> director of the Isuzu, Solodo, he liked it. He wanted something like the Japanese garden, something like astronauts in space, <coughs> and naturally to celebrate uh, the Isuzu car. So what we did, we totally inverted the whole plaza. We cast citizens of Yokohama, the people living in the community, whole families, in fact. Uh, here's the process of doing it. And we made an invisible plane. So everything was reversed. And uh, we celebrated the car, we celebrated the roots of the trees, we celebrated everything was in reverse with an invisible floor plane. And as you can see, children loved it because again, it engaged people in the public domain because you, a young boy could jump on his father's feet, for example. And of course, we celebrated the Isuzu car. They were very proud of their transmission. <clears throat> and that was evident throughout the whole project. Uh, this is another economy of means project. Uh, Willie Smith, who was the first really great black American fashion designer, did street, street fashion, as he called it. And as he said, I, I don't do clothes for the queen. I make clothes for the people who watch the queen go by. And uh, he, he, when he, we were talking about doing his <coughs> showrooms and his stories, he said, I want to do the exact opposite of a Ralph Lauren. I'm the, I'm the polar opposite in my ideas and fashion design. So we made it all from junk culture. This is totally recycled materials from the street. Uh, it animated the space. You could hang <coughs> clothes anywhere in the space. And it, it gave a lot of it. We even talk about economy of means. We even um, gave up the dressing rooms because of the models in the fashion shows would just dress and undress in front of the audience. So it added a certain animation and again, the economy of means to the fashion show experience. And we also uh, did Willie Smith's whole office from just the refuge from a construction site right across the street on 6th Avenue. Uh, and to sort of end this thing, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about in the environment and incorporating the environment. We did a sculpture park in Italy, uh, in Briosco, and we did the pavilion for visitors and like has a restaurant and a cafe. And what we did <coughs> is we realized that the entire area was defied by that uh, monastery in the background and all the wall system. So what we did is we took the actual wall system and incorporated the building. 
And so the building is the wall and the wall is the building. So we just extended what was already there. So you can see it's this thing flowing in. And then we kept the landscape and just moved it upward in space. So in a sense, the building became the landscape. There was a total integration from, from uh, the existence of the structure and its surroundings. Uh, we also developed a, a cast stone module, a T-shaped column, which was used for sculpture bases and, and support and the whole construction of the building. And it was on a beautiful farming area. And on a clear day, you could see the Swiss Alps from the site. And uh, so we use this device to define inside and outside. We had all glass so you could see the, the Alps <laughs> during the day, as well as the sculpture garden. And again, so the whole property was defined by the wall. So by extending the wall, the wall already existed in part. We just extended it to be the vocabulary and the iconography and the identity of this particular place. This was opening day. You can see how it would engage people. Uh, this was a children's toy exhibition on that day. And here is the relationship to the uh, monastery in the background. You can see the monastery. You can see the behind, through the building, you can see the wall coming down. And then you can see how the wall has extended into the building itself. Um, well, <clears throat> in conclusion, I just want to say that there are other ways to think about the built environment, both architecture and public space. Certainly recycling an economy of means are one of them. Every city in the world looks like Toronto now, as you know, it's, it's, it's kind of overkill. Uh, I wanted to conclude with just one project that we pursued for years, which is really uh, what Duchamp called tan chances, where you would build a me medium high rise building, but the identity of the people, unlike modern architecture, even in Le Corbusier and uh, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, where people have no identity, uh, people could have their own identity in a public building. And it was very much based on the early 1920s Sears Robot catalog of houses. You could order up your own house. You could have the component parts. So we're going to prepare a component part. You order them up, and you can build on a completely different identity. And it's, again, it's just sort of the total opposite, contrary to Mr. Trump and his development policies. But anyway, your, uh, identity and density, as we called it, uh, was part of the point of the whole project. And it did have a big influence. Unfortunately, it was. In our case, where the individual residents were supposed to be able to select their identity, and these, they, they call them houses in the sky. They're very influenced by our project, but they're all designed by architects. These houses in the sky idea, which is proliferated all over the world now, it's had a big influence, even though it was an unbuilt project, are, are really you know more about what the artists or architects impose. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that we are asking us, ourselves this question. I'm sure a lot of architects and young architects today are asking the same question. What, if anything, did we do right? And um, the one thing is the integration of architecture and the environment, the uses of collage and found objects, recycling uh, materials, uh, adaptive reuse. These are all very important. So this is a little sketch of myself I did during the Trump era. Uh, and it's sort of the way I feel of kind of rethinking it all. So we're really in a rethinking era, which I think is very important. And some of my forthcoming lectures are, are really about how to rethink uh, dangerous ideas, using architecture as a, as a kind of public commentary. Uh, I'm doing AI lectures. Uh, you know, again, you know, what? is the human brain capacity, and what is the capacity of AI? And uh, the secret to it all is really uh, in, uh, uh, an actual fact that I found that the human brain is 250 million billion more times complex in its connection 
than AI. So we don't want to always think in a linear way either. We want to use the brains. So basically, I'm saying that there is another way. There are other ways to think about the environment. And that's the end. And they are economy of means, rethinking it all, and looking at nature's revenge, which, of course, is a big factor, and then trying to say more with less. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, James, for leading us right into the nature of your work and uh, for this incredible presentation. And on behalf of the technical team, I would like to uh, apologize for the technical uh, difficulties in the beginning. Um, now we're in it. Simon Denny is entering the stage, and uh, I'm excited for the conversation of the two of you. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> <sighs> OK. Um, OK. This is so uh, trippy uh, and postmodern uh, in a kind of cartoonic way. Um, but I don't know how many people can see things uh, out in the audience. Um, James, can you hear me, first of all? James, can yeah. you hear me? I can see, I can see, yeah. Oh, I, fabulous. I, I just yeah, want to describe to you what's happening here on the stage. You're, you're on a monitor, and I'm talking to the monitor next to you uh, sitting on a couch, which is very... Uh, uh, okay. Very uh, uh, textbook postmodern in a way. I feel like uh, yeah, yeah, I, I feel know, like I'm well, talking to. Um, but, uh, this postmodern seemed to work better than technology. From my <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for an incredible um, insight into into the work that you've been doing that has inspired me for so long, but also countless others. As you've ended on, uh, your high rise of individual homes has uh, inspired many people to do many things that resonate with those ideas. Um, I prepared a little slide deck uh, here that starts with some things of James's that have spoke to me uh, very uh, directly. Um, and then a few projects that I think uh, were somehow influenced by your approach um, uh, in my own work, and then maybe I'll kind of go through those, and then maybe we can uh, speak to each other um, about kind of some of the themes that I think uh, are resonant between the two practices. Um, okay. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, I started this in a kind of a cheeky uh, fashion. Um, this is a this is a recent site work, um, uh, a Denny's. Um, uh, fast food chain, um, which I was very happy to see. Actually, I didn't know this before I was preparing this talk that you actually did this. So, uh, I mean, um, one of the things that I want to return to in the conversation is to ask you a little bit about this building. But maybe we just do that right away. Uh, James, do you want to do you want to talk about this this commission? Well, no, this is this is for Denny's, and uh, you know they pride themselves on communication and and. and um, so it was the idea of networking. They, they, they always talk about networking. So in a way, the whole building is a, a fragile network. It's, a, it's it is, interesting enough, the building within a building. Mm. And so it does, it, it's really about, you know, the skill of the Zayner company in doing it, uh, which was not easy because to, to, to make a thin network like that really work in space. But that was a basic point. It was, in a sense, giving their entire history of the restaurants, which are considered assets to networking, a mm. visual manifestation. So beautiful. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, you talked a great deal about this iconic work you did for Best. Uh, this was one of the first projects I think probably many people encounter of your practice. Um, certainly, it was the first um, body of work that I encountered. These are maquettes uh, that I pulled from um, photographing uh, somebody else's presentation um, about uh, the MoMA show that happened at the same time, I think, uh, with the best um, uh, proposals, because it was another situation where many architects were asked to do a proposal, right, and yours were chosen uh, from that. Is that correct? Well, um, it began basically as a, as a um, art collector. It's a, Sidney and Francis Lewis, who were the owners of the best company. Of, right, these guys, uh, yeah. Kind of a big box merchandiser, uh, were big collectors of art. They were avid collectors, and mainly pop art. So they had a orientation toward art having content. In other words, art was not just formalist expression of some kind. It could, in fact, say things. And so, we started working with them, and we started making all kinds of proposals. 
that they wanted a piece of public art in front of their building. And I said, well, why don't we make the whole building into the, into the art piece? And that resonated with them. And uh, then the variations uh, were not done in competition with anybody. They were just in competition with ourselves in a way. So we just kept <laughs> thinking of ways and goes. And we, probably a hundred different ways of thinking about it. And we tried to figure out the one that would work best in the location and would work in somehow uh, transforming either by reflection or by, in the case, peeling or lifting or, or making the entire building into a, its own definition. All of these things were inherently part of this architectural yeah. intention. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned the commissioning process and the commissioners. I uh, pulled out a book uh, that I love, uh, that I return to very often, um, of uh, Andy Warhol's 1978 or 79 Whitney um, show, um, Art of the uh, Portraits of the 70s, which was, yeah. um, uh, and here are two, two works, um, uh, actually four works, I guess, two series of pairs of portraits of the Lewises um, from, uh, from the Warhol Commission series. Um, so uh, this is my favorite period of Warhol. Um, uh, and this is the installation um, that was uh, in the Whitney, this kind of checkerboard. Uh, he put this really interesting, um, uh, you, you maybe know this, I don't know if you went to see this show, James, but um, uh, what I no, heard I was, did, the, yeah. say that again. Yes, I did, yeah. Oh, amazing, because I heard that, you know, uh, Warhol's business of, uh, of doing port, uh, Commission portraits, um, the criteria for getting into the Whitney show was that you had commissioned at least two. Uh, so there were people that had commissioned only one and they were not eligible for entry into the, into the show. And, and if, you, if you commissioned at least two, then, then you could be in the, in the Whitney show, which I thought was a really interesting uh, self-reflexive gesture um, in, in the face of uh, what I think is a, a kind of pioneering example, and I'm not the only person to assert this idea, but it resonates me of the, a pioneering example of network art in a way. So, so network-enabled art practice. Like your Denny's restaurant is, uh, to me, this showing the people that are paying for the art, the people that are making uh, the value in a certain sense um, is, yeah. is part of his work. And it's so interesting no, to me. We, we, uh, we both agree. I mean, uh, the one thing is that I had, you know, when we talked before, I said that this was not my favorite period, but you, you sort of changed my mind because I began <laughs> to think of it in a sociological sense and, you know, yes, painting a soup can or Marilyn Monroe or Elvis or something, uh, you're transforming iconic images. But in this case, it, it extends it to the whole human system. It does exactly. the whole, as you say, the networking system. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a, a transformation, again, not hand-painted, which is, you know, of course, the brilliance of Orhel anyway. I mean, the fact that he, it, it was the idea of it and not the necessarily the execution being looked at. Exactly. And I just think that's an amazing, uh, maybe not a coincidence, but an amazing um, resonance that the people commissioning your uh, most known um, buildings were also the people uh, involved in this network. Um, and I mean, another, another uh, thing that you didn't talk about um, in your presentation, but I'd love to invite you to hear a bit more about is another fast food chain um, in intervention that you did um, as part of site. Um, uh, the, the McDonald's building, which was partially raised in a certain section. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of making this? Oh, McDonald's? yeah. Well, this is a very interesting thing. Um, the uh, owner of the property was a, a collector of sites work hmm. and had built, well, he was the builder of the ghost parking lot. So he, uh, McDonald's wanted this piece of prime property because it was very near where Ray Kroc, the founder, was born. So uh, we had a meeting with the president of, of McDonald's and uh, he, his first remark was great. He said, Mr. Wines, I understand that you're known for being very creative. Well, <laughs> you can be as creative as you want, but you can't change anything. And that was the way we started the commission. And so, okay, I said, I won't change anything. So we didn't change anything. We just took their mansard roof style and popped it and so it all came apart and it you know was quite successful because it, it had a kind of a clear story and you could recognize your friends by their feet under the <laughs> building and it uh it was yeah it became very quite popular 
I bet. And I think somebody <laughs> filled it in. Believe it or not, somebody went later on and filled the thing in. But because the building but still exists, time, it was, right? It was, it was one of the ones that was most published in Time and Newsweek and, yeah. and many, many international publications just because, again, it was using the existing icon and transforming its meaning, just yeah. converting the meaning. Yeah, best McDonald's ever for sure. But it, the building still exists, right? Unlike the site building, this in some form is, as I understand it, still standing. Is that correct? Well, it's still standing, but I think they they, they filled it in. Know, they ruined they, it. They filled it in. In other words, they made it not iconic. It was built on iconography. It was a, an inversion or critique or yeah. a setup, shall we say, of, of their iconography, and they changed the whole thing. Believe yeah. it or not. Amazing. Yeah. This is another piece which I only ever saw in somebody else's slide deck, um, actually. Uh, now, I know that site was, was more than just you for a period, so I don't know if you yeah. recognize this building. This is apparently by another uh, member of the site group, um, Dana Draper, yeah. um, uh, in yeah. 1970, so prior to some of site's work. But I wondered if yeah. you rem remembered anything about the story. So as far as I understand it, this is a proposition for General Motors to have um, yeah, a yeah. Well, giant... This was a, this was a competition for General Motors, and Dana... Well, and we were all working together, and, and uh, Dana came up with this idea. He said, well, why don't we just put a, <laughs> a big red stripe up the building? Right, it's a giant up-only economic sign yeah, yeah. that stands outside so of the building. It was, it was a kind of commentary. It was a more formal one that we usually or, or became known for, but, but it, was, you know, it was an early project. There were, there were a number of, you know, what happened is that the whole site group grew out of a uh, class on environmental art that I was teaching in NYU in New York. Mm. And, um, you know, it, these students were very far of them who started, said, okay, let's just continue. And uh, it organically sort of came together, uh, and he was definitely one of them. Amazing. Uh, with a lot of talent. He passed away uh, several years ago. Yeah. But, um, it was that, in a way, it was the sort of core period of, of site development. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's a proposition which I wish had been made real. I'd love to see this uh, this sculpture made. So I want to also integrate some of my work into the conversation, and I think the kind of local context and pastiche is quite an interesting conversation here. This is um, this is a building that I was lucky enough to make an installation in um, in 2016, and it's a, a very well-known building in Germany. Uh, it's the former communist Staatsratsgebäude, like a sort of headquarters of the of the Communist Party uh, in Berlin um, during the GDR. And um, it's interesting in and itself because it's a modernist building with a classical facade, a 19th century uh, facade, uh, I think, uh, from, from, a, from an earlier period, uh, worked into the modernism. Um, and uh, and when, I, when I first came across this building, it was being used um, not anymore, of course, as a communist headquarters, not even a political building explicitly, but rather a, um, a, a business school now. So the business school had taken over the former communist building, and, but they were only using half the space. So we approached them, me and uh, Dis, uh, the, the curators of the 2016 Berlin Biennale, approached the, the, the people at the, at the ESMT um, and asked them if we could use the other half of the building for um, an exhibition that I was making um, as a part of the Biennale. And I made a kind of a trade fair um, inside, uh, inside this building. So um, again, in this kind of former communist building with also this very beautiful um, uh, communist relief um, of a, a kind of technology producing peace imagery, that's my interpretation of it, I made a, a kind of a fake trade fair uh, for three companies that were dealing with the emerging narrative of blockchain um, at the time. So, uh, so blockchain companies had started, people had started moving um, ahead, and, um, and I made a sort of a fake um, trade fair for three kind of strains of companies that I saw coming out of it, one from a bank, one from somebody who was very big on Bitcoin and political, and another from Ethereum, which was like an open source system using blockchain um, that scaled. And, and just, uh, just to, to, to add a nod to some of your um, work, uh, 
to do the kind of fake trade fair booth for the Ethereum um, section, I ripped up the carpet that was uh, existing in the space and spray painted on the underneath of the carpet, so economy of means of certain kind, um, and uh, and put the uh, yeah put the put the branding of this um, emergent um, open source uh, blockchain. Uh, on, on, the, on the base of this uh, communist building. So it was really interesting at the time because um, a bunch of people would come to the business school and they would accidentally end up in my uh, trade fair and be very confused by, um, by what was going on. Um, yes, I also made a series of stamps. Um, so each booth was kind of promoting a postage stamp, um, uh, which I had printed at the, at the German Bundesdruckerei. Uh, it was a collaboration between me and an illustrator artist called uh, Linda Kentchev, uh, who grew up in the GDR, and we used some of the GDR imagery and technology uh, and techniques uh, to, to make speculative stamps as if these blockchain things were, were emergent states. Um, uh, another piece I did uh, in, in, in Sweden um, in the Moderna Museet was also very informed uh, by the work you talked about um, uh, with the Willie Smith uh, uh, material. So this was a, um, we were invited to do a, a pavilion, me and another architect, Alexandra Bava. Um, we were um, asked to do a, a kind of a, a stage uh, for showing some of the collection. Um, and I wanted to show a collection that was working with the language of design, but also politics explicitly, and I wanted to use a trade fair idiom again. Um, so what we did was we used a, a kind of fake outside. So um, on, on this building, um, you can see these kind of graffiti uh, moments. Those are all lifted graffiti from um, the, uh, uh, the, the um, video game uh, Grand Theft Auto. So it's kind of fake computer game um, graffiti. Uh, transposed onto a printed brick facade. Um, and I integrated those um, with other things from the collection uh, that resonated with the history of uh, design and politics. Um, so here um, we have some constructivist uh, uh, pieces um, alongside uh, a Max Headroom mask, uh, which, I, which I founded, ironically very similar to what's happening here. Um, and uh, we also integrated um, uh, slogans um, from uh, uh, from uh, GTA, uh, from Grand Theft Auto, alongside slogans from um, situationist uh, work uh, from, the, uh, from the 1960s. Um, and put kind of like former constructivist architecture in dialogue with, um, with companies and what was being made uh, in companies. So um, yeah, many layers there. This is in the background, you can see a reproduction of one of the first murals commissioned in the Facebook headquarters um, that we also put in there. Um, more recently, I also did some curating around, uh, uh, around blockchains um, and uh, art and cryptocurrency at the, um, at the uh, Schinkel Pavilion. This is a, a group show that I organized, um, trying again to, uh, I guess, use some of the principles that I found in blockchains. So blockchains always claim to be distributing power. They claim to be um, working with uh, transparency. Um, uh, so the blockchain ledger always sort of claims that it's uh, doing these things. And so I tried to translate that into a curatorial methodology. This is a diagram that we produced um, which shows uh, all of the people and how they were invited. So I invited a few people to the show who were working with art and blockchains at the time, and then they invited other people as well, and the power decision making was kind of um, made transparent for the show. Um, the, the central piece was sort of an architecture piece. Um, this is a, a cryptocurrency miner. Um, it was, uh, uh, produces a lot of uh, exhaust, and the exhaust of the cryptocurrency miner was then blowing up this giant bubble, which was a room inside uh, the, the room uh, in, the, in the show. So, um, so uh, this was a piece by um, a, an architectural collective that went on to um, make a kind of blockchain for public architecture, which is still being built. Um, inside it was a machine uh, by another um, artist collective um, called Distributed Gallery, where you could put euros in and, and burn, burn your euros. So this is, um, and it would issue you a token. So it was literally flaming up the money uh, at the same time issuing you um, cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah, and this is what the, what the after that, that looked like. Um, uh, this was also uh, a, a, a play with nature. There were some really interesting um, projects. This is a project called Terra Zero, um, which is a, a collective based in Berlin. Um, they, they put a tree on the blockchain so that the tree could own itself. And you donated cryptocurrency during the, um, 
during the uh, uh, presentation, during the, the exhibition, to the tree. The tree would hold it in its wallet and then pay the people at the organization to water it, to feed it, to do all the things that kept the tree alive. So the idea was that the networked architecture of, um, of blockchain was enabling trees to own itself. Um, a more recent project that I did, uh, which I think resonates with some of these themes as well, of the given, of the found, and also of like, um, uh, of kind of uh, urban planning and, and blockchains and, and, and metaverses, um, uh, are a bunch of paintings that depict metaverse properties and track their ownership um, using the kind of modernism uh, kind of inherent in their own maps, um, is how I've said about them. So uh, there are many metaverses, many, many metaverses being built, going up and down. Decentraland is, is one of them. Uh, it's one of the most um, used metaverses. Uh, you can buy a Decentraland token. This is what Decentraland looks like, right? When you're in there, it looks like a very familiar first-person shooter type um, interface. Um, and when you go in there, uh, it's, it, it's, there's a map, there's a city. Uh, that has been built. So this is a gridded city. This is a map of the overall city that's in Decentraland. And one buys a piece of that um, and then builds on it, right? So first there's a kind of speculative gridded market and then there's a kind of a building of virtual architecture. And these are what the tokens look like if you buy a section of that property, right? The, this, is one, this is one token um, that you buy. It says, I own this um, property. This kind of uh, red dot in the middle of it says, that's the property I own. This is some context around that property. Um, but I, I guess the, the ghosts of modernist planning, uh, to me, were, were very evident in these objects. Um, so to me, these already looked like kind of somehow perverted mid-century abstract paintings, right, as, as little squares. Uh, this, this, this came up during the, the frenzy of, um, of the speculative bubble around NFTs. People were buying and selling NFTs that looked a lot like this, um, and then there were these kind of property tokens as well. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to conflate these histories that I, I feel are kind of ghosts um, in there? So this is uh, uh, one of the tokens from Decentraland next to Broadway Boogie Woogie, uh, one of the most iconic pieces um, of the steel, um, and also of kind of abstracted urban planning um, side by side. You can see the, the, the bleed. Um, and it also brought up histories uh, that didn't only morphologically look like that to me. Um, so this is a very famous um, lithograph from New Zealand um, where I grew up, uh, which is a colonial landscape painting. And as uh, as been historicized by many um, art historians now, um, uh, often landscape painting is seen both as a topological thing, as something that describes a space, but also as an early advertisement for making properties uh, in areas of the world where private property uh, were different um, before colonialism uh, took over. Um, so I decided that making paintings of these was both resonant and I saw myself as a kind of a neo-colonial landscape painter um, in the metaverse. Um, so these are some of the results. Uh, I used kind of layers of digital and, and analog. Uh, I kind of blurred and distorted um, uh, and, and made this kind of uh, ghostly modernist grid um, come alive. Um, and, uh, and here, um, I also linked a couple of tokens uh, to it, so you could, on the side there is a QR code, another gridded form, um, where you could kind of see the original property uh, if you scan the side, and also see a new token that tracked the owner um, of that property uh, as, as you bought the work. So, um, so you could kind of uh, forever see who owned the property that your painting was of. Um, Yes. So just to show you quickly, there's other versions of this. This is Sandbox, uh, another one. I made, um, I made other paintings of other metaverse landscapes, um, again, using the same technique. Um, in this case, when you buy a piece um, of property in Sandbox, you can change the image that represents your space on the map. So it's less controlled, um, and people buy, companies often buy spaces there and change it to their logo. So there's this interesting urban map that comes with logos. Um, and again, this makes it quite, quite different looking type of painting, which is more resonant of pop, um, for example. Um, yes. Uh, and one last thing, and then I want to return to our connections, uh, James, and ask you more about uh, your work. This is a, a commission, uh, this is a, a really crazy building, um, a really amazing museum that is in um, Tasmania. Uh, uh, it's owned by um, one patron, so it's a private museum. He also lives there. Um, his, he made his money in gambling. 
Um, so he's a mathematician who made um, uh, algorithmic systems that consistently beat um, international gambling systems and uh, creams quite a lot off the top of um, the gambling system. And, uh, and part of that he puts into building this private museum. On top of it, there's a James Terrell piece, uh, for example. So very spectacular work is often shown there. Um, this is what it looks like inside, uh, and, and to me, the, the architecture is somewhat resonant of your, of your practices as well. Uh, the cliff face is cut into. Most of the uh, galleries are subterranean, and this is the existing cliff face um, uh, built into that museum. Um, to me, it was uh, kind of like a, it suggested a sort of a mine, a mining space. Uh, it was like you were going into a museum in a mine. And when I was asked to make an exhibition there, um, I wanted to reflect all of the things uh, that were involved in that context. I was reading Kate Crawford's uh, and Vlad and Yola's Anatomy of an AI System, which um, looked about uh, making AI and the connections between human labor and, um, and, the, and the kind of minerals in the earth that make AI systems, making them all visible at once. And I was thinking about that um, as I made this show. This is an exhibition, uh, the, part of the exhibition um, was the first room, was quite an empty room. Um, and in it was a blown up drawing, uh, which is a drawing that is uh, from an Amazon.com patent um, of, a, of, a, uh, of a design that they never made um, to house a user on top of a robot that's in this uh, organizing systems um, so that a user could enter their um, algorithmic systems um, and, uh, and, and be a kind of a part of what was otherwise a, a human um, exclusion zone uh, in their sorting um, warehouses. I made that into a sculpture. Um, I copied the drawing and kind of made it 3D um, as if it was going to be built, um, but kept some of the some of the parts of the, um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the kind of conventions of drawing on the object, right? So you still have these kind of weird remnants of the kind of um, numbers that point to uh, the parts of that system that are always used in patents. Um, and I also built an augmented reality layer on top of it, um, which uh, when, you, when you scan the thing uh, with a phone, uh, meant that a bird was living inside uh, the Amazon worker cage. And um, so you have this uh, really magical moment when you look through your phone, when you can see this bird. And this is not just any bird. Uh, it, was, uh, it was compiled from um, the most endangered bird in Australia um, at the time. So we had uh, a group of researchers go out and record their sound, and, and then we animated that. Um, so that you can see people looking through their devices into this cage, which I found a really amazing thing to see from the outside as well as just in the, in the AI system. And then uh, we based um, the show also on the most popular mid-century Australian game, uh, which is a sheep farming economic simulation called Squatter. Um, so uh, this was the game also that the founder of the museum played every day uh, when he was growing up um, with his, uh, with his uh, family. Um, and I made them produce a, a new version of this called Extractor, um, uh, based not on sheep farming, but on kind of data extraction uh, mechanisms. And, um, and yeah, uh, I, I made display sculptures um, based on kind of cardboard cutout in-store displays. Um, this one for a Monopoly uh, was one of my models, um, and this one for a kind of chocolate was also another one of my models for the sculptures. And, and here the sculptures were based on extraction um, uh, hardware uh, that, that is involved in mining in Australia, so actual kind of physical mining. Um, and that was the kind of point of display sales point for um, the, the, the game that we produced that was part of the show. And it was on a giant squatter board. Um, so users went in there and kind of um, looked at these cardboard displays of mining equipment um, and then also um, scanned, uh, again, triggers on an augmented reality thing that showed you advertisements um, for these machines. Um, so, uh, and they, you could also scan yourself um, and, and see how you are feeling. Um, so here's uh, the interface where a user scans. Scans themselves and sees one of the minerals come out of their faces that is most mined in Australia. Um, so this one I think is, yeah, nickel, there you go. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so here's a few of those. Uh, when I, I, I showed this also in Dusseldorf recently, and I added a kind of extra mine element to it where I made a, an exhibition in Minecraft, um, modeling up a very famous former uh, mine that's now a museum um, here in Germany. Um, so this is, uh, this is the uh, yeah, very famous uh, mine that was used uh, during the 19th and, and 20th century that is now abandoned. Um, this is a Minecraft simulation of it that then in the basement of it um, 
contained my, my exhibition, uh, recreated in Minecraft. And at the opening, we had a bunch of people come and uh, do kind of Minecraft um, interventions. This is a, a self-destructing sculpture that one of the uh, people who used the space uh, made it. So that brings me kind of to the end of, uh, end of my little presentation um, there, uh, James. Um, and maybe we can go back to some of your work. I'm just going to quickly flick oh, back through these oh, slides. Oh, thank you. I mean, this is, this is oh, terrific because it uh, points out you know, that we really have a lot of the same interests, but you, you've at least chosen to put it in a context where you have poetry and literature and and technology at your disposal in a, where there's contemplation. And I remember when we started the environmental art kind of movement, uh, it was on Green Street in Manhattan, and you know, all of the artists involved, I mean, nobody, I, you know, I guess it was, you know, Alice Acock and Mary Miss and uh, Dennis Oppenheim and Gordon Mattelstock, we all, we all talk about, you know, how we were gonna communicate in the public domain, and it all, had to be sort of instantaneous. I, I wrote an article, Notes from the Passing Car, where you had to, you didn't have any time. You were driving by, and if you, the message didn't get through somehow, there was something, you know, instantly recognizable or iconic or in verse or whatever. And uh, it's interesting because you intend turn the gallery inside out. <laughs> By returning to it, or or the or controlled visual situation, and giving people a lot to think about, and, and you are able to deal, in a sense, more with poetry, with literature, with technology, with um, intimate visuals and everything. So, but it's it's what interesting though is that we seem to have the same motivation. <laughs> you you want to say something, and. Um, and it's basically to get somebody to think about something. It, uh, as Duchamp says, it isn't so much what it is, but what it makes you think about. Yes, exactly. And uh, I think that was his, in his day, for example, he had to do something incredibly radical in the art exhibition context in order to make you aware that of its just kind of displacement, that he was displacing that context, making you think about the validity of it. Mm. And so it had to be, you know, something drastically recognizable in a way, and then somehow upset the apple cart. Yeah. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons we both probably ended up thinking a lot about AI these days, because sure. uh, there are implications in AI of the loss of the human brain. That's, that's what I'm, my worry about, is that like everything human beings have done with uh, invention, with technology. I mean, I, I'm doing a part of my lecture right now, which is, you know, like sitting in automobiles has made people unbelievably obese. Mm. Uh, clearing the land for, you know, industrial farming has given us McDonald's and fast food and unhealthy diets. Uh, and these all th things, if you get too laid back, which societies do and think about it you know, passively, oh, well, I just accept it. And that's what I'm a little afraid about, AI. Oh, well, that's a new text. I think we'll just accept it and anything it purports to deliver. And that's not really true. Yeah, that's so interesting uh, you it, say it that. Needs, it I, needs a real critical thought. It needs some critical dialogue. It really does. Well, that's so interesting because, yeah, Kate Crawford, who I mentioned earlier, is one of the, one of the preeminent uh, critical thinkers that I look to for, for, for AI. And one of the things that she and her, her peers have pointed out about AI as it emerged is that it is somehow reliving and re-performing the past. Um, and yes. maybe in a similar way uh, that postmodernism sort of claims to as a, as a part of this. Um, exactly. This is exactly. that it's, it's trained on training sets uh, uh, that, that, uh, that are kind of then uh, training machines to draw on the past to kind of pu push into the future. And, uh, and that means, uh, I think that what they highlight is that means that uh, one of the dangers of uh, the proliferation of automated systems trained on the past, but making things for the present and the future, is that they re recapitulate the past again, uh, right? And all of the yeah. kind of value systems and biases of the past get kind of like um, pulled into the contemporary and to the future. Do you have thoughts along, along those lines? Yeah, yeah, well, you, you, were, you were doing 
I think we have exactly the same point of view here. I mean, I really reinforce the fact. But the fact that is that what you're doing is finding the, you know, like the means itself as a comment on itself. I think that's the, the thing we both have in common. We take the terms of the media or the art form or the whatever it is, whether it's public space or an interior gallery or a museum or whatever, and you take it and you use what they've already given, the, the given quantities, and turn them inside out. Yeah. And that is a problem with AI. It is what it is, it depends on information, digital information that's already been processed. Hmm. So it doesn't think really. Hmm. What it does is delivers, delivers, there's a deliverable, in other words. Hmm. And that deliverable is not intuition. I mean, you know, I'm, the point I make is, that, you know, the human brain requires vision and, and sound and, and um, body temperature. I mean, there's so many other factors that make the human brain creative. So I just am making a case that we, you, I think we both agree that it's got to somehow remain creative. In other words, it's, it's not what AI is, it's what it is that can be rethought. Hmm. And my whole life, I, we, every meeting we have, I, I'm calling this lecture, what else does it mean or hmm. what it makes you think about. Hmm. One and of the things that I, I want to every, every meeting I ever sat down to, we always started in architecture with the function and the form and the situation and whatever. And then I would always at some point and say, well, I, I, I we know all that stuff. What else does it mean? What else could it mean? And this I think is, we both asked that question. Yeah, this is another. This brings me to another point that I really want to ask you. Also, while I have you, this is uh, because you, one of the things you brought up in your presentation was the uh, the importance of foregrounding other people's interests. Right? You are kind of as as an architect, as an architect's practice, part of uh, making the context and the found uh, the, the most important part of the architecture is like backgrounding the architecture a little bit and foregrounding the people. So you mentioned that with public sculptures, you mentioned that with this great high rise of individual choice, right? That other people's decisions, the, the people who would use the space's decisions, um, their content, so to speak, becomes part of the form. And it struck me that that has a real resonance with the era that we're um, sort of still in, but that started about 15 years ago, of so-called user-generated content in the context of uh, social media, right? So the idea, you know, that the business model for things like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and things that we still use um, is that, like, uh, the company is the platform and the users provide the content. And yeah. I wondered th about, I mean, th th this is kind of an inversion in some ways of what you tried to do, but it has a resonance as well, right? Where, where the kind of people's um, expressions become uh, the, the front page of what's happening on the platform. Um, have you thought about social networking and, and, and kind of uh, social media as a platform in relation <coughs> to that uh, gesture well, in your work? Yeah, the, the point I was making, I think, is that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm very concerned with performance, and I've, we've done performance pieces and everything over the years. And about the fact that that's the problem of talking about site, we've done work in so many different media, including, you know, videos and so forth, that it's hard to, you know, sum it up. But, you know, that, that one issue is the content and, and finding a way to say it, whether it's by using familiarity and inversion of familiarity, or taking familiarity itself and extending it. But I think the, the big challenge we both face is familiarity is, is the reason that things take place anyway. They're, they, they're a part of performance. We perform in everything, our mental performance, our physical performance, are part of routines. Hmm. And to somehow invert them or change their meaning is a really big challenge. But it's also the, kind of the only way. It's the only way to get people to think. If they read, a, if they're used to a slogan, and suddenly the slogan, instead of meaning one thing, it means five different things. They they, they really have to think about it. They have to sort of step back and say, "Well, I never thought about it that way." In fact, I, I I've always said the highest compliment I've ever received is when somebody comes up and says, "Well, you know, they look at our, one of our buildings or something and say, I never thought about a building before.'" 
<laughs> and that is precisely the core yeah. point. Really. Amazing. And that's another yeah. thing I wanted to ask you about, actually. I mean, we talked, we started this conversation a little bit with foregrounding the commissioner. And, uh, you know, you worked with people like the Isuzu project, um, which was great to hear a little bit more about, you know, um, and McDonald's, obviously. You've worked with a lot of corporations um, that you're seemingly also... Uh, in some ways against the principles of, right? You were just mentioning McDonaldization has made people, uh, you know, t too big and, and that's part of a problem. Um, can you talk about the ambivalence of, uh, of kind of working with iconography that is also something that you're in the process of critiquing? Well, the problem with the commercial world is that it uh, deserves a lot of critique. <laughs> and it's very difficult to think about critical context. In other words, most of our projects are but I would call self-effacing in a way, for, mm. for an industry to use one of them as, as part of their production or patronage or whatever is a certain amount of courage. People always ask us, well, how did you get Sidney and Francis Lewis to do it in the first place? Mm. This is obviously a critique of their whole industry. Mm. And I said, well, because there's something very powerful about self-effacing work mm. or self-effacing ideas. Mm. They're very people like them. They relax with them, mm. <clears throat> and I and I use always use the uh, example as like Liberace or Elvis Presley, mm -hmm. and their greatest performances. They knew they were great musicians. They didn't have to keep pounding away and telling you about. It. So what they were doing, they'd be laid back, and they would do in a sense self criticism mm. or self mockery or kidding themselves or you know hyperbolizing some flaw or false or something, mm. and that would relax the audience. Mm. It invited the audience into it. Mm. And uh, I remember a whole concert with Elvis Presley, you know, doing that, and the audience were just laughing it up. And then he <laughs> ends the whole uh, concert, he was in by singing Amazing Grace. Well, you can imagine it brought down the house. <laughs> I can't imagine. The, the audience loved his self-effacing qualities. Right. And at the end of singing Amazing Grace, did it. That just capped it off. Which is part of what you know great performers or great artists do. They they sort of do understand the audience. They have to kind of entertain and they have to uh, extend and they have to use thought and physicality. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and the performance as a as a performance of itself. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that we're maybe hitting time. Is that uh, is that right, uh, or do we have more time? Well, we both did our things in about 20 minutes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we're very efficient, but um... yeah, we're very efficient. Okay, great, James. I mean, I've got so many more questions for you, but um, but I also want to give you a chance to uh, I don't know uh, put 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 some of the agenda on the table, so to speak. Um, is there something you'd like to talk about in our last 10 minutes, uh, or I can just keep going through my points? <clears throat> well. Um... No, what I've been sort of applauding so far is the, the similarities we have in the objectives. And um, as I say, during the late 60s and 70s, the whole thing was, you know, getting out of the art gallery. And I, I, Alice Aycock, who uh, lived near me for many years, she used to say, well, James, we, we got into the streets and into the landscape, but I'm not sure that was a good move because... <laughs> Yeah. The Gagosians and the Zwerners of the world still control everything. Right. And it's really true. So the art gallery <clears throat> and all of its contextual meanings and prejudices is still a powerful situation. Yeah. It's still, when people go in, they have certain expectations. Mm. And if you violate those expectations or extend them or change them, which is what exactly what you're doing, mm. you're, you're, they, they go in expecting... I don't know, whatever, <laughs> hand paintings or sculptures on pedestals, and they find what your work, they have to think about it, they have to read it, they have to follow the, the, the pathways. Hmm. Uh, it's architectonic, it's, uh, it's so many other things. That they're, it, it sort of forces the audience to stop and think. That's so and interesting. Because one of the things I also thought in, in, in relation to this postmodernism theme, uh, one of the moments that I was always taught in canonical postmodern art 
was the return to the gallery, right? The, the re-entry yeah. into the gallery. So uh, often it's uh, one of the narratives that I came across a lot in my art history classes was, you know, um, after performance was radicalizing in the 70s uh, and things were happening outside the space, uh, as you said, uh, the, the, the neo, uh, the neo uh, what is it, the neo-painters, uh, the neo-expressionists came in and reoccupied the gallery and then kind yeah. of later conceptual art um, also did that as well in the later part yeah. of the 80s. Uh, how do, how do you feel about that reoccupation, um, this well, rather historical I, reoccupation? I, you know, my college education was by proponents of abstract expressionism. I never quite got it. It seems, always seemed to me like a big version of the same old, you know, painterly attacking the canvas sort of thing. I never got interested in it. I remember the big change in my life early on was Man Ray. Mm. came to speak at our college and you know he started talking about data surrealism and it changed my life i said oh my god mm. there are all these other dimensions to art that i don't even have been taught they're not part of my curriculum mm. so it was the beginning of, of a sort of this rethinking process it really was mm. another thing i wanted to bring up in relationship to that is uh you know, we've talked about the critical side of the practice and how, how often your work has challenged um, the things that it's played with, like commercialism and, and these types of things. But I also saw your work for me, and I think for my peers as well, uh, people that I've talked to about your work, they've been inspired by the fact that it also uses some of those same mechanisms as well. So it's a kind of double embrace, you know? Um, there's oh, a yeah. critical element, but there's also a kind of a, an amazing element. And, and I think I'd like you to speak about that notion in general, if you, if you would, but also, uh, you were mentioning the coming AI material, right? So, so newer, uh, newer materials. And I think some of the practices that I'm so um, uh, uh, excited by at, the t at, at right now is people that both use AI but use it critically. So I'm thinking of, for example, a yeah. project called Spawning, exactly. which, is, uh, which is a really amazing project that um, um, Matt uh, Dryhurst and Holly Herndon are doing. Um, that is also uh, Grimes has been involved in a little bit as well, similar gesture, where uh, uh, making kind of training sets profitable for people that are used in them is enabled by both blockchain and AI at the same time. So I wonder if you could say something about the positive uh, or the kind of reuses of things that can do uh, maybe negative things uh, to, to kind of reassert them in challenging and positive ways. Well, you said it so well. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, I mean, I, you leave me no words. I was beautifully okay. articulate. Um, but I, 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 it goes back to the thing, you're absolutely right. That's just kind of the way I'm editing this AI thing. I just, you know, I, I'll embrace, I mean, always embrace every kind of new, because I always like it. But I say, don't assume mm. that it's going to think for you or create for you, because a creative mind is, you know, very, I mean, AI does not, like indeterminacy or chance mm. or um, subliminal, all those words are not really fit in. And another thing about AI and, and all technology is that it, it not only is based on a given or information that's fed in and processed, mm. the whole context of that processing is mm. questionable. Mm. And I think the, that double whammy is the salvation of, I hope, people like us who just like to create, who just you say, this, what else could it mean? Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest question of all. What else could it mean? Why, why does it always have to be thought of or in a sort of non-confrontational or non-critical context? Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing that can happen. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the challenges that I also find. Uh, you know, I want to know builders. I want to be around people that are making these devices so I understand how they work, so that I understand yeah. the mechanisms uh, that are being built. And so I also want to befriend these people, get to know them, understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, but I, of course, always have questions at the same time. And that's always a tension for me in my work, uh, wanting to know what's happening as it, as it happens so that I can get into it and kind of use it and understand it, um, but also not always uh, having um, a total agreement with everybody who's making the products, you know? Yeah, no, that's really true. I mean, yeah, you know, well, the trouble with architecture, of course, is functional. So, like McDonald's, McDonald's can float, 
But still, the people have to be able to go in and order a hamburger and a milkshake. Exactly, exactly. So that's, in a way, you have to incorporate that limitation. It's a limitation, there's yeah. no question. It's a limitation, like you it's said before. It's a functional yeah. capacity, so it can't violate... I mean, that's, that's a problem, actually, with a lot of uh, computer-generated shape-making, when I thought it comes to the wiggle school, and this is international. <laughs> yeah, there was literally a very uh, big uh, NFT called the Squiggle, which did very well, actually. So it is, it's, it's very accurate, what you're saying. Well, anyway, I mean, the, the problem with it is, a lot of time it's not art and, uh, at all. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just, gee whiz, technology. Mm -hmm. And how, I hope it will get over the gee whiz period and start... <laughs> accommodating it in a natural way. Yeah. And you know, there's a way that um, uh, from the yeah. industry people speak, uh, particularly in the technology, you know, they speak in terms of bull and bear markets when people want to invest in things and when they want to pull back on things when it's down. And right now, AI is going up in a, in a rather a bull market. Everybody wants to fund an AI company, but uh, very few people want to fund um, a blockchain company at the moment. So it's a bit of a bear market yeah. for blockchains. And one of, the, one of the blockchain companies that I'm in touch with a little bit um, produced a t-shirt that said, uh, bear is for builders, right? The bear market is for people that uh, are building yeah. when it's unpopular. Um, and, and, yeah. and that resonated a little bit with what you just said, I think. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think uh, this is, I knew this would be a good conversation. Because, you know, and uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know quite, quite how to wind this up because yeah. it could go on forever in terms of, of examples and so forth. Yeah. But no, it's I time think, to wind uh, it up. So, so the that's interesting good. thing is that um, I, I, I'm not even an architect, I'm an you know, environmental artist. My training was. In, right. In, in, and your early art. sculptures are very beautiful, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, you know, I'm identified with it because we got involved with it. And it's, it's our subject matter. So right. whether it's the subject matter or not, you still have these obligations. Yeah. And you have the same condition with an art gallery. Right. No matter what, the spectator has to go inside a museum or a gallery. And do something. And yeah. you have to give them something to think about. You, yeah. you have to challenge them in some way. Rauschenberg, I, I, we, I talked about that before. I said it very well. You, walk up to a work of art you've never seen before and it doesn't change your mind, there's something wrong with you and something wrong with the work of art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. totally I'm sure true. it's always the supply side, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, one, well, maybe to round this off, I'd like to reiterate one of the things that I, I learned from this talk uh, already and one of the most beautiful sentences that I've heard uh, today, which is, uh, you know, you can make a McDonald's float, but people still have to go in and buy a burger. So thank you very much, James Wines, for that. And uh, it's been such an honor and a pleasure. Thank you to Kolja Reichardt and the Bundeskunsthalle uh, for this beautiful show. Uh, it's just such an honor to be here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone as well. Uh, because and it was remarkably uh, complete, the whole show. I mean, the show was very complete. Thank you very much. Thank bye. you very much. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much, James and Simon. We see each other in 15 minutes for Lea Katrin Saska's talk on MTV and architecture in the 1980s.
bestimmt.
Reinhold Martin shared uh, before images of the Strada Novissima, the big like triumph of postmodernism and the first architecture biennial in Venice. A standard publication um, about this um, kickoff of uh, postmodern architecture as something that is debated about in the global public is published by Lea Katrin Saska called Exhibiting the Postmodern, the 1980 Venice Architecture Biennale. Lea Katrin Saska is senior lecturer in architectural studies at the University of Manchester and member of the Manchester Architecture Research Group. And she is just now about to publish a book that she co-authored with Silvia Mitkeli, Paolo Portoghese, Architecture Between History, Politics and Media. Lea Katrin also um, contributed to the catalog with recent research about the influence of cable TV on architecture and, um, and urban planning. And um, I'm very excited to now hear her expand live on her research. Lea Katrin Saska. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will, uh, I will follow everybody in uh, congratulating Kolya and Eva on the show. I just heard that it's on until uh, January, so I hope people will be able to see it. There's a lot of great uh, materials in there. Um, yeah. So, do I have the slides? I'm just waiting for my slides. Okay, I will start. I wanted to start by showing you a video of the very first two minutes of uh, MTV, uh, but uh, for uh, we said before that for rights um, purposes we cannot uh, show it. But if you, if anybody typed first minute of MTV on YouTube, you will uh, immediately find it. So instead, I have an image that will come. The one before? Okay, I will, I will start. On 1st of August 1981, music television, or MTV's very first transmission, opened with the famous Ladies and Gentlemen Rock and Roll over footage of the 1969 NASA moon landing. That's what you were supposed to see. So combining rock music with holy images of what still seen, what, of what was still seen as both the most famous moment in the history of television and the most technologically advanced moment of mankind, the MTV theme turned into an emblem of an entire generation. It also, arguably, suggested that MTV was on a mission to conquer new and uncharted territories. The new television network, initially focusing primarily on rock music, had been launched by two, two of America's largest conglomerates. In 1979, American Express bought half of Warner Cable Corporations as they envisioned cable TV as a sales tool to deliver goods and services directly into the home. So if the idea of showing music videos around the clock first sounded like a foolish idea to most specialists and businessmen, visionary minds such as MTV co-founder Robert W. Pittman succeeded in creating a need that did not previously exist. Targeting mainly the 12 to 24 years old, the new TV channel claimed that teenagers were the demographic group that least, were the demographic group least interested in TV, because TV wasn't interested in teens. Children had cartoons, adults had evening news and most of the shows that followed it. Teens were an untapped audience and an invisible power, and MTV gave them what they wanted and got them not only interested in, but obsessed by MTV, making it their clubhouse. But less known is the fact that MTV was born from an early experiment in interactive television. A few years before the creation of MTV, Warner Cable 
had come up with Cube, the first two-way interactive cable television system and an early form of narrowcasting, offering a plethora of specialized channel that allowed spectator to, and I quote, answer back to their television. Ushering in a new type of interaction with technology, Cube, a system originally only available in Columbus, Ohio, was branded as the TV of the people, by the people, and for the people. It marked the beginning of an era of participatory as opposed to passive television and held the potential of revolutionizing the entertainment, audiovisual instruction, and educational industry, amongst others. In, uh, in a 1978 special report published, uh, published in the video cassette and CATV newsletter, predicted that Cube could be the first market skirmish in programming, marketing, and technological revolution that could profoundly affect the economy, the gross national product, the entertainment habits, and the lifestyles of America. But in 1984, only seven years after its creation, Cube went defunct as a high cost of generation, generate, of generation unique programming and of maintaining an unusual infrastructure resulted in debts of $875 million. Despite its very short lifespan a multiple and, and multiple shortcomings, Cube occupied an unique place in media history. It greatly expanded the programming choice and allowed the viewers to become an active participant, thus operating a radical shift and advancement over what television or cable television had heretofore offered. It brought the potential of opening the cities of America to cable television service on a profitable basis. But most importantly, its technology, pairing console in each home with a studio-based computer that could record and report the opinion or vote of, cost of customers in the system every six seconds, announced the 21st century by allowing to gather a massive quantity of personal data on each and every user in the system. So here I want to trace the material history of the advent of postmodern television in the in 1980s America and Britain. So MTV, but also uh, other channel in on the other side of the Atlantic. By analyzing the space of television, uh, so I want to do that by analyzing the space of television on three different yet intertwined scales. So first, the territorial scale of the network. Second, the urban scale of the TV studio themselves. And finally, the domestic scale of the house. I look at how the emergence of cable and commercial television radically changed the space of consumption, production, and distribution of television. And ultimately, I want to show how our relationship to communication completely changed in the postmodern era, ushering in Current, in the current ubiquity of the screen in our daily lives. Starting from the second end of the 20th century, with the advent of cable television and privatization, television became the site of destabilization of relations between exposure and protectedness, agency and passivity, sleep and awakening, and publicness and privacy. The medium then shifted from an era of scarcity to an era of availability from a stable system with a small number of channels, often public monopoles, that offered a durable programming format with synchronized viewing to the multiplication of channels often targeted to a specific demographic audience. Cable, also called community antenna television or CATV, was originally conceived as a way to deliver existing television signals to homes that could not get them clearly because of long distance or obstructions such as mountain or tall buildings. In comparison to television broadcasting through an antenna, cable technology brought as much 
um, brought, brought a much wider array of channels directly into the homes of Americans. While in, while in the late 70s, television's viewers in the nation's biggest city received seven channels, for example, a decade later, the number was 38. So the, so the post-war era of television was clearly over when a myriad of new privately owned and often specialized channel, such as 24 news channel, news network CNN and music television, started to search for content to fill view, viewing hours that often expanded into the night. Indeed, according to broadcasting studies specialist Andrew Krizel, what ca we can identify the 19th of January 1972, as the day when all restrictions on broadcasting hours were lifted, as the beginning of, he says, an era of modern television, but I would say an era of postmodern television. These channels inaugurated a new sense of immediacy while offering specialized and targeted content, and thus contributed to shattering the sense of dispersed belonging engendered by the synchronization that used to characterize television. In Britain, following Elizabeth, II, Elizabeth II's coronation that was famously televised, the parliament voted the 1954 Television Act, breaking the monopoly on television held by the BBC and allowing the creation of the first commercial television network in the United Kingdom, ITV. The act also created the Independent Television Authority to regulate the industry and award franchise. And after 1955, independent commercial television with regional specification ushered in the competition between several providers of markedly different character. As British commercial television's, television's rise in popularity was often perceived as a threat to traditional values and the British way of life, it was heavily regulated by the IBA to avoid becoming an overly commercial, over, to avoid becoming overly commercial as its American counterparts. So we go back to MTV now. In the United States, particularly the cable market, was in the 1980s suddenly in search of new and original content to fill the long programming hours huh? because television became 24 7. so with the aim of do of doing for television what fm did for radio the network mtv appeared as an easy and cheap solution Using promotional music video as its main input, MTV was able to produce an entirely new form of cultural production that came to dominate the music industry for most of the 1980s and 1990s. Music was put in image long before MTV. In the early 1970s, Warner Brothers Records started to produce videos for artists with uh, musicians, with musician Van Dyke Parks heading their new audiovisual department. Around the same time, two very popular Australian television shows, Countdown and Sounds, established the importance of film clips as a means of promoting new releases by both established and emergent acts. In 1975, the video of Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody was produced by Bruce Gowers for the BBC music show Top of the Pops, which we heard a lot about yesterday. Yet the advent of MTV contributed to create an industry for, for music video by foreseeing that the target audience for the channel, young people who had money and the inclination to buy things like records, candy bars, video games, beer, and pimple cream, had an increased economic power. In the early 1980s, record companies started to frenetically produce music videos, thus providing MTV with free content. And it was this format, the extremely short, four minute or less texts, that maintain us in an excited state of expectation, which contributed to the hypnotic effect and constant sense of expectation that made the success of MTV. The new TV channel was conditioned by the politics of distribution, Unlike clubs and other inner urban phenomena, MTV reached out to the suburban and rural areas. 
where the cost per mile for digging and install, installing cable was cheaper. Before it reached, so it, it went to the suburba before it reached uh, big cities like New York and Los Angeles. Therefore, parallel to the institutionalization of the new forms of domestic entertainments, MTV also operated a territorial shift. Unlike rave parties and other inner cities phenomena proliferating in the 1980s, MTV directly brought music and club culture into the suburban homes, colonizing domestic spaces such as basement living rooms and teenager bedrooms. With a set mimicking the 15 years old ideal basement hideaway, MTV intended to offer viewers a room of their own that also echoed an alternative world. The music television network did not only contribute to sell records and advertising, it also ushered in a profound, profound and pervasive transformation of the home, now also becoming a stage from which people could perform and talk back to their television. And I found this since we talked about uh, Boy George yesterday. Watching television was no longer merely a passive activity, but one that contributed to colonize the space of the home and family times as American teenager could, could suddenly take part in a whole trench of cultural activity from their family living room or via the second television set from their own bedrooms. This domestication of youth entertainment ushered in a wider cultural shift of focus from public and collective spaces to the, private sp to the private space of the household. MTV did not start as live television, however, but as pre-recorded and later uh, uplinked to satellite from a facility in Long Island. It was not until the second half of the 1990s that MTV production was taken in-house when the channel moved to a 20,000 square foot studio located on the mezzanine level of the Viacom building at 1515 Broadway, that you see here. With full height windows on Times Square, the new studio was meant to get people to feel what it's like to be in New York, to be part of that incredible playground down there. Capturing three views on Times Square, MTV's new space of production offered a new relationship with the city and between the audience and the bands and VJs. These architectural decisions even more, even more aff affirmed the continuous flow of images, communications, space and identities that MTV had set off with, the launch in, with it, its launch in 1981. Now we go back to the UK, and I will talk to you a little bit about TVAM, another TV channel. While MTV was, ma uh, was making its debut in America on the other side of the Atlantic, Britain has, had just entered what became known as the Thatcher era. During this period of deregulation and privatization of most nationalized, ind nationalized industries, and the weakening of trade unions in favor of an enterprise culture, UK's media landscape radically changed with the advent of private television, overruling the monopoly of the British Broadcast Corporation. Theorized by Brian Wienham as the third age of broadcasting, following the age of radio domination and the golden age of Russian television, this era was characterized by the multiplication of channels and, in general, by an increased picture transmission by satellite and by cable. It was in this very particular political and economic landscape that between 1983 and 1992, so a very short period, TVAM, the, the first ever British national operator of commercial breakfast television license went on air with a, format in, with a format including hard news segment and soft news related to lifestyle as well as entertainment stories. If in America today, the first and longest running national breakfast television or morning show as they call it there, was premiered by NBC on the 14th of January 1952 in Britain, it was only 30 years later that screens were included in the morning routine. 
too expensive due to existing agreements with the technical unions, TV technicians had to be paid overtime at high rates for working in the small hours of the morning, breakfast television was also looked down to by cultural snobbery. It was too down market, and most importantly, it constituted a genre with roots in the United States. Thus, by bringing television to the breakfast table, TVAM operated a significant shift in English domestic way of life. On the 28th of December 1980, UK's Independent Broadcasting Authority awarded a national breakfast time franchise to TVAM. The group of TVAM was founded by television man and economist Peter Jay, a former British ambassador in Washington and economist editor of the Times who turned TV entrepreneur, specifically to apply for the breakfast program contract. So Peter Jay was also joined by English politician and business executive Sir Richard Marsh, who had served as uh, in the cabinet of the minister in four major departments of states, and by famous television host, media personality, journalist, comedian, and writer David Frost, who became known in the 1970s for his famous interview with uh, political figures such as uh, President Richard Nixon. In their application for contract, this unusual group promised to produce a new form of current affair television that would renew traditional English journalism. Part of the commercial network ITV, TVAM also had a territor territorial particularity, which meant that it reached mo more British citizens than any other commercial television programs because despite airing exclusively between 6 and 9.25 a.m., it was the only ITV station defined by the hours of the day rather than by geographical region. In other words, during the franchise hour, TVAM had command over the whole of ITV network, which signals passing directly from Breakfast Television Center via British Television to the IBA transmitter network and the home of receivers. Starting on the 1st of February 1983, TVAM went on air from an unconventional television studio located in Camden Town, London, and designed by Sir Terry Farrell, a then trendy English architect that was standing as the Johnson of postmodern Britain. One of the first signs of the regeneration of Camden Town in the early 80s, we also heard a bit about that yesterday, the television studio had been housed in a disused 1930s industrial garage and motor repair center in Howley, Howley Crescent, backing on to Camden Lock. Relying on the performative and exploratory potential of ephemeral architecture, as well as ideas of total environmental, environment design, TVAM used the building's identity to create an image for the new and revolu revolutionary form of television. From the outset, TVAM consciously adopted the aesthetic strategy of, I will go back to that image, the aesthetic strategy of the so-called eternal summer, using cheerful colors across their studio building and visual and identity as a way to, br to brighten up people's early morning hours and by suggesting that a fresh and promising new day was pointing ahead. The studio, including Memphis-inspired furniture, as well as a series of highly performative interiors dominated by bold color shapes and motifs and disposed along a, a central atrium running east to west to follow the sun's path. A hospitality suite styled as a Japanese temple, a brightly yellow central monumental staircase, modeled on the Mesopotamian ziggurat, a bridge mimicking the form of a classical temple, and at the far end of the atrium, and framed by an ionic arch, a Mediterranean garden, followed by the Wild West, a space decorated with sand and cacti. Moreover, in an attempt to thematize the building, Farrell added monumental fiberglass egg cups on each peak of the back facade sawtooth. Offering a mixture of historicism and pop culture, the TVAM egg cups became the symbol for breakfast time television and eventually a brand image for the station. 
Built on an extremely low budget and, a very tight, and with a very tight deadline, TVAM Camden Town Studio was conceived as a media environment rather than as a traditional architecture. The building was treated as a succession of several TV screens, the front facade on the narrow and ugly uh, Holly Crescent back street mixed classical style and industrial aesthetic and was a silver colored industrial metal sheeting in different profile interspersed with, brands, uh, with bands of colors suggesting the sunrise. The metal sheeting sat on a gray and black high masonry plinth and was topped by abstract keystone by an abstract keystone that marked the main entrance. Completely different, the back facade on the canal side was an original garage that had been painted by brash, cheerful blue, black, and white. A temporary decorated shed, TVAM Camden Town Studio building wasn't meant to last beyond the duration of the franchise. Consequently, in 1992, the building was sold to MTV Europe which heavily altered Farrell's original design, modifying the TVAM extruded letters on the side of the main facade and redesigning most of its interiors. Music television had come to London and nothing was better suited to host it than a disused and essentially ephemeral postmodern design. The forms of uninterrupted infrastructure pioneered by MTV and TVAM marked the end of programming and the synchronization of continuous flows of content, paving the way for narrowcasting, in itself a technological form of fragmentation. These new forms of television and their related content were an important component of late 20th century media environment. Through the surface of the screen, they resulted in new type of spatial and temporal construction, from the micro scale of the house to the macro scale of the territory. Changing the way television was consumed, they consequently transformed domestic environment. From a central focal point in the house, television started to colonize all forms of domestic spaces, including bedrooms, basements, and kitchen. They changed the way television was produced, offering a more direct contact between the hitherto closed television studio and the urban space, while using the architecture of the studio as a form of media image for the station. Finally, through politics of distribution, they modified territorial relationships, offering territorial unity in the case of TVAM and flipping the relation between center and periphery in the case of MTV. And understanding these shifts is essential, I think, if we want to understand our contemporary reality. Today, with the rise of social media and the continuous flow of self-produced and self-distributed media content, domestic, public, and urban spaces are undergoing dramatic changes. And at the center of this revolution is the presence of multiplicity, of a multiplicity of screens, which are no longer a window into the world, but which propel our private interiors directly into the public sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Lea Katerin, and please follow up with Peter Pomerantsev after 4.30 here in the forum. Thank you.
I'm very proud now to present a lecture by Peter Pomerantsev, one of the leading uh, academics and journalists on Russia. Peter has worked for nine years uh, in the 2000s in, in Russia for the TV station TNT and um, published widely for uh, The Atlantic, for the London Review of Books um, on Russia, also um, a strategic paper called uh, Winning the Information War. Um, focusing on Russia, on which also uh, our catalogue draws, actually. Peter Pomerantsev drew attention to postmodern philosophy being very popular uh, among Duma members, for example, uh, during the 2000s. And Peter also called uh, Russia a postmodern dictatorship. So I'm very excited to hear Peter, who now is constantly between uh, Kiev, uh, London, Washington, and follows the ongoings uh, in Ukraine, um, expand on this. I thank you very much, and I'm sorry I can't be with you myself today. So, um, as as uh, as as Kody said, I mean, I I um I worked in Russia in TV between 2000 and 2010. Uh, making entertainment shows, reality shows. I was, I was very far away from politics and the news. Um, I'd gone, just gone to film school beforehand and, and um, was releasing my future in, in very far away from politics, making entertainment. And then I sort of, as I lived in Russia, I began to realize I was living in a regime, which I went on to call a postmodern dictatorship, that was really being um, informed to a huge amount by, by the rules of, of reality shows. And that was being done in a very conscious way by um, Putin's main propagandist, um, a guy called Vladislav Surkov, who was one of the heroes of, of my first book, um, which was called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which is a sort of play on something that Hannah Arendt once said about Nazi Germany. And um, I would, uh, you know, Today, I think that the, the topic of my of my talk is what is the essence of this postmodern authoritarian propaganda, um, and I want to tell you about my search for a response. So I'm just finishing a book, uh, which is an attempt to tell the story of a counter propagandist um, who I think might give us really interesting ideas about how to respond to this um, propaganda of, of triumphant sort of cynicism that I saw in Russia and has since then spread across the world. We see elements of it in, in, in Trump, in Orban, also But let's just very, just to make sure that we understand what we're, what we're talking about. Um, I think Collier actually summed it up beautifully in his essay which I all encourage you to read on this topic. Uh, but I'll, I'll sum it up again. So what was the essence of, of Surkov, Surkov's big idea and, and the idea which, which has sort of gone on to develop much more sort of, um, I think, directly fascist forms, but still sits at the bottom of, of Russian propaganda and is so popular. Um, he took the ideas of postmodernism and, and very consciously perverted them for his aims. Um, you could argue that some of them were implicit in those ideas, but, but that's really not my business. I'm, I'm not a serious philosopher, nor do I claim to be. I've, I've become a, a student of, of propaganda um, and, and someone who thinks about what to do about it. But what Surkov did, he basically said, um, he took the sort of the sort of bad relativism, as John Rawls called it, that was implicit in maybe some vulgar versions of postmodernism. The idea that um, you know there is no truth, or truth is only a subset of of power. Um, the idea that everything around us are simulacra, um, and he kind of weaponized it for his own, his own uses. Um, so what do we mean by that? Um, he sort of spread an atmosphere of, of deeply intense cynicism throughout society. Um, his propaganda didn't claim that, you know, 
Russia was the carrier of some great rational historical ideology. Um, he basically said that everybody everywhere lies, that truth is unknowable. He spread the sense of doubt um, to an extent where it tipped into passivity um, and where it tipped into a, a sense that uh, there was nothing you could do or ever change because you could never know the truth. If truth is unknowable, if all ideologies are just word games or language games and forms of manipulation, there really is nothing to fight for, let alone something as democracy or freedom. Um, he sort of was always trying to show that all institutions, both in the West and in Russia, are, um, are, are some lack. So whether it's parliaments or political parties or courts of law or elections, his claim was always that in the West, they're a sham. They're all controlled by a deep state. And they are as well in Russia, but that's just what life is like, you know. Um, elections were openly rigged, but as a way of saying, look, how easy it is to rig elections. They are just a joke. They're just a joke here, and they're just a joke there. Everything that you fought for is worthless. Um, um, he did many other things. He sort of, uh, sort of indulged in this idea that um, look, Russia had uh, many parties. He created the parties himself. He controlled the parties himself. But then he told the whole country how he created and controlled them so that people would have the sense that we have different parties who debate each other in TV shows, in parliament, but everybody knows that they're controlled by the Kremlin. And again, his point was, look, democracy is just a piece of reality show theater. It's fun, but it's ultimately meaningless. And it's the same here and over there in the West as well. The democracy that you fought for at the end of the Soviet Union is just a piece of theater. And he played into the sort of deep, deep cynicism that was already very present in Russian society. He sort of um, had a deeply theatrical nature and, and sort of uh, basically almost promoted uh, an idea that uh, all social roles and political roles are sort of masks that you wear in, in a masquerade. You know, you could be a communist in the morning and a fascist in the evening and a Democrat on Sunday. And this is all a game that, that we play in a world where there are no values anymore and there is nothing to fight for. There's no truth, no ideologies. And really, he wins who is most cynical. Um, now, at the base, you want to understand the purpose of this, this, this ideology or pseudo-ideology, anti-ideology that he spread. The purpose was to make people passive. The purpose was to make people give up. And at the end of the day, as we see now, and was already starting to be apparent when I left Russia in 2010, the ultimate aim was a sort of postmodern fascism, where at the end of the day, you have no agency. You can only take power by being part of the collective. You can only express your agency through a strong leader. And so it was a postmodern return to you know, a, a version of the 1930s, um, all done with an ironic smile and without any grand serious claims of too serious an ideology but essentially conspiratorial thinking replaced ideology. So instead of a serious communist um, ideology based around Marxist-Leninism, um, you basically had a conspiratorial worldview, which was really the end point of not trusting anything. If you don't trust anything, you don't emerge into freedom, you emerge into a world which is controlled by things you just cannot, cannot quite see. Media study after media study has shown that people who don't trust media don't become free. They just become conspiratorial cynics. Um, and he pushed that way. So conspiracy replaced ideology. A conspiratorial worldview replaced ideology. Um, I'll give you the classic example. When there was a protest movement in 2012 in Russia, the Kremlin spread the story that not only were the protesters, not only were the protesters sort of arms of the CIA, that's sort of classic, but actually that the protesters were all arms of the Kremlin. 
and this was a piece of theater designed by the Kremlin to weed out potential enemies and then arrest them. So everything conspiracy, even the person who you think is the opposition to the Kremlin, Navalny, is part of us, part of the conspiracy. There is nothing you should ever do. Be passive and obey the leader. And instead of, okay, here an ideology, there was just raw emotional identity. I mean, the Kremlin youth movement, which they openly modeled on the Hitler Jugend, uh, was called Nashi, us. I mean, it was sort of politics that was basically reduced to its elemental uh, pieces of us versus them. And a kind of, with it, of course, the legitimization of sadism, which he developed very, very strongly on television, putting forward sort of a, a whole band of propagandists who, who spouted maybe nonsense, but who legitimized a, um, a loathing and since then sort of genocidal rhetoric, normalizing it. So, you know, by stripping away the value of truth, by stripping away any hope for a future, by stripping away values through a sort of perversion of postmodernist philosophy that says nothing is true and everything is possible, he made it, in a way, opened up the return to a version of totalitarian propaganda. Um, he's sort of been pushed aside the last few years, but this is the world he helped create. And you know, we see versions of this everywhere in the world. A Donald Trump speech will start with undermining the idea of truth or laughing at the idea of truth or subverting uh, the possibility of truth and ends with, you know, words that are almost sort of a, a comic book version of, of Freud and Le Bon's ideas of identification with the leader. It's like, you know, I am your revenge against the elites. And when they attack me, they attack you. Classic Trump phrases, which we were saying just yesterday. Um, so that's kind of the world that Surkov created. Um, you know, the Russians tend to be ahead of the trend on a lot of propaganda moments. They were in the 1920s, they are again now. We see versions of this mushrooming throughout the world. But I think it's, it's you know, the aim, I think, really apparent now, has been to, well, the end, the effects, has been to return all the things that we thought were taboo through a kind of backdoor of postmodernism. Um, or as my, or as the Yale professor, um, Tim Snyder, once wittily put, post-truth is just pre-fascism. So I've been spending the last, um, really since I wrote the book in 2015-16, I wrote in 13-14, came out in 15-16, so the last sort of eight years thinking about what do we do about this? And after having worked in entertainment, I realized that I actually want to do something more serious, and I now work at universities. I was first at the London School of Economics, now at Johns Hopkins University, where I play with ways through various research projects and collaboration with various media and NGOs, trying to work out what to do about it. And pretty quickly we realized that if you want to reach the audiences who have come under the sway of this sort of propaganda, whether in dictatorship or whether in um, democracies, a lot of things that we thought romantically would work, won't work. So most obviously fact-checking. That was the first big movement. Hold on, let's, if we communicate the truth quickly and effectively to these audiences, then we can, we can, you know, we can return a sense of reality to the discourse and, you know, save, um, you know, the Habermasian public sphere. Um, pretty soon we all realized that this didn't really work. Um, I think now is common knowledge, but in the first years of the struggle against this after 2016, um, there was a lot of hope. All these fact-checking organizations sprouted everywhere. And we found very quickly that people reject the facts when they don't shoot, suit their political identities. That actually, I'd go deeper, people enjoy rejecting the facts. Facts remind people of their limitations. They remind people of their mortality more than anything else. Death is the biggest fact. 
a leader who is promising a revolt against reality is deeply attractive. So the idea that you could just counter this just with facts didn't really work. And once we got, we'd realized that, we, we sort of started on a long journey of really trying to understand the motivation of these audiences. I very much believe that to fight propaganda, you have to understand people and why they're attracted to the propaganda. And we're in a sort of race with the propagandists as to who can reach people better and engage them better. The propagandists offer, you know, the false community of the conspiratorial crowd who are us bunching together against some sort of mysterious them. So it gives a sense of community. They give a sense of superiority. Uh, and Surkovsky, a sense of sort of cynical superiority. You felt cleverer than anybody else. You'd seen through the delusions of democracy and, and truth. They um, legitimize our most uh, um, taboo feelings, um, including feelings of sadism. Um, they generate those feelings very often. They generate humiliation, especially in dictatorships like Russia. And then they become the way through which you can compensate by humiliating others. Now, when we're in a world like that, the idea that you could counter that with a bit of fact checking doesn't seem very valid. So we started to sort of play around with, you know, we would take, we would try to understand why are people into conspiracy theories, for example. And we found people who were um, suggestible to conspiratorial thinking were often suffering from a deep lack of agency. They felt they had no control over their lives. And the conspiratorial propaganda helped explain that and helped almost become a sort of uh, a remedy for that, a pseudo remedy, but a remedy for that. Um, and so the answer really wasn't, you know, debating the conspiracy theories or trying to prove a conspiracy theory was wrong, but actually thinking about how do you create media and other forms of communication? How do you create social media that empower people, that give people a sense of agency? And we've looked at things like engagement journalism, where people get the chance to set the agenda um, and to select which stories are covered by journalists. The journalists are helping them and making them feel more powerful. Now, those are all baby steps. Um, but during my sort of journey through thinking about how you fight conspiratorial propaganda, I came across a person that I wanted to tell you about today. Um, well, this happened kind of during COVID, when I'm sure you remember we couldn't travel very much. Much of my work has got to do with traveling around the world and looking at, you know, the problems with propaganda in the Philippines, and Mexico, and many other places. So I had to turn inwards during COVID, and I started doing more historical reading. And I came across a story of all things, the Second World War, which is not something that I've ever focused on. And I became very intrigued by a British plan, or a British project, to undermine Nazi propaganda in the Second World War. And it's a, it's a story that had been told a little bit in the 1960s when the people who led this project uh, wrote their memoirs. But then it faded from view for many reasons. And what happened in the 1990s and 2000s is that all the classified documents that the British had about this operation became declassified. And there was this wonderful archivist that I've been working with called Lee Richards who had started to gather these very, very disparate documents, all secret British strategy from World War II from their propaganda departments and, and put together a picture of what happened. And he was incredibly, well, I couldn't have never have done this book, which will, the book will be out next year, without this archivist. And, and I love all archivists and all archivists are, are, are the, real, the real fighters against the perversions of postmodernism because they really collect truth and knowledge and, and show that it's, that, it's, um, that it's so powerful. So I'm not, look, I'm not a historian. I'm not a, uh, an expert on World War II, um, but I wrote this book anyway because as I read about this operation, 
And as I read about the man who led it, I felt for the first time, I actually felt there was something we could try against this postmodern fascist propaganda spread by Surkov and which emanates across the world. Now, it's worth telling the story of the man who led this operation. His name was Seth Tendelma, and he had a very interesting biography, which I think um, really, without which you can't understand the rest of his work. So I'm going to start by telling you about him as a person, and then what he did in World War II, and then what we can learn about him. Hopefully, I'll leave some time for questions. So, Seth Tendelman, his childhood is really the most important part of his story. He was born in Germany. His father was an Australian academic teaching at Berlin University. And Seth Tendelma was born in Germany. And he was born in 1904. So at the age of 10, he is a little British boy at a gymnasium in Berlin at the start of the First World War. And almost overnight, the attitudes towards him change. Before that, he'd been kind of celebrated as this fascinating child in Charlottenburg, this sort of interesting family of academics who all spoke perfect German. His father insisted he spoke German at home, not just at school, so that his German would be perfect. Um, this fascinating British family, loved by the neighbors, his father a professor, and you know, you're all aware of the German educational caste system and how important it is to be a professor. Suddenly, he's the enemy. Suddenly, everybody turns on him and says, Du Verreter, you know, who are you, you English boy in our midst? All around them, he can see the propaganda building, people sort of pushing away their humanity and embracing this uh, feverish mass identity and mass hatred. Of course, this is a time when you know, German newspapers and films and other new technologies are uniting uh, Germany into a sort of a, a propaganda community in many ways for the first time. And Delbert describes this very powerfully, but what is so remarkable in his memoirs of his early childhood is how he, a British boy in a German school, who's bullied for being British, finds himself, despite himself, caught up in the German propaganda. And there's these amazing scenes where he describes how he's in school, and there's almost like a second hymn that starts to repeat the German songs, the German war songs. And he's marching along with the other kids and enjoying it. He comes home. And all the city is celebrating victories over the British, victories against his country. And he's about to hang a flag out of his apartment to celebrate as well. And his mother sort of grabs him and pulls him back. And he goes, oh my God, what am I doing? How can I, a little British boy, suddenly be caught up in a propaganda where I am the enemy? And this becomes an almost leitmotif throughout all his work. The honesty to admit how each of us is susceptible to propaganda. That all of us yearn for a remedy from loneliness. How the feelings that propaganda unlocks are so, so powerful that they carry you away. But even in this early childhood in Berlin, he sees that the Germans around him are playing a double game. Yes, they perform, and when they perform it, they, they're genuine in their performance of the propaganda all around them. They repeat 
the slogans. They're genuinely enthusiastic about the war. But then there's another them. They have another personality which they can switch into. And when he talks about the director of a school who every morning is giving these sort of you know, Führer-like speeches about the evil British and how the whole world has forced Germany into this war, in the morning, on stage in school in the aula, in the afternoon, he meets with um, Seth and his mother and apologizes about the war and how embarrassed he is and how hard it must be for a British family trapped in this ridiculous war. So he begins to realize, hold on, people have different selves. They can be both entranced, or maybe they're acting entranced, and they can be completely rational. And this idea that there's multiple selves remains throughout his work. Now, afterwards, he goes back to Britain in 1917, where very, well, uh, where he is, um, after having been a British boy in Berlin, he's accused of being a German boy as soon as he gets back to London. He's bullied for having a German accent because he spoke English with a German accent. He's bullied for speaking Latin in a slightly, in the way it's taught in German schools, not in the way it was taught in English schools, for wearing the wrong socks. He's used to wearing these little short Berlin sailor socks. And in England, people wear socks up to their knees. So, you know, he really starts to understand when he returns to Britain that even his Britishness, which he thought so core to his identity, is also a, a piece of theatre that he will learn to play, but it's not quite him. Now, Seth and Delma went on to finish school in England. He went to Oxford. And then he went back to Germany, interestingly enough. Despite his traumatic childhood, he goes back to Berlin and becomes, and right here I have to do a pause because I can see my, my computer is about to die. And he goes back to Berlin in the 1930s and he becomes probably the most famous British journalist in, uh, in Germany, um, covering Weimar Berlin, covering all the political changes, always coming back to the cabaret nature of social identity. He's very good in his early journalism at describing, of course, the cabaret is booming in Bayer Berlin at the time, and he very much describes the political games in Germany, uh, all the different social roles and artistic roles that are being experimented with as, as a vast sort of cabaret. He speaks fluent German. He probably understands German society much better than any other British journalist. And maybe that is the reason why he spots very early the development and the rise of the Nazis. And already in the 20s, he befriends the Nazi leadership when they're still just a, 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 a you know, fairly medium-sized political party. He befriends the leadership, ingratiates himself with them, and basically very early on says, this is going to be the future of Germany. These guys are going to go right to the top. But it's fascinating seeing how he described the Nazis, given how he would then think about ways to subvert their propaganda. Now, he gets very close to them. He hosts parties for them in the evening where Goebbels and Hans Stengel are, are not Goebbels, Goering and Hamstengel are, are frequent guests. Um, they drink all night at his apartment in Berlin. Um, he's not close to Goebbels or Hitler. He's closer to, to, to other people in the movements, very close to Ernst Röhm. And he gets to know them very, very deeply. And it's fascinating how he describes them. He essentially describes them as a form of cabaret. He basically... And he often compares them to a form of cabaret. He basically describes them as a, a grotesque theater act, which is able to express Germans' deepest, darkest desires to legitimize them, to create the sense of community, at the same time to obliterate any idea that facts even matter. But here's the trick that he thinks the Nazis pull off, or rather fall into themselves. 
They're a cabaret that wants everyone to think that they are not an act, that they are a real new identity. He wants peop they want people to identify themselves with Hitler, with being an SS man, with being an Aaron. This is an act that you're meant to, at the end of the day, fall into and become. And when he talks about Hitler's speeches, he describes it very much in this way, that you know, he, we both we have a leadership and followers who have got caught up inside an act that they've now started to almost fully inhabit. However, throughout the 1930s and the rise of the Nazis, he's always writing how there is still a crack there. At some level, people know that they're acting. At some level, Hitler is always acting. But also at some level, all the people who follow him are also acting. Yeah? They may have genuine, what seems like genuine enthusiasm, but at some level they're aware of what they're doing. There's actually a very famous Theodore Adorno essay which argues something very simple, that below the sort of theatre of hypnotization, there's always a conscious act of playing along. So let's just go back to my original thesis about Seth and Delma and Sukhov. At the moment, they sound very similar, you know? Both of them are sort of saying that all life is a masquerade, that all life is theatre. Both of them have this deeply theatrical view of society. But as we move into, I mean, in that sense, both of them are postmodernists. Yeah. Both of them are deeply aware of, of the performativity of um, social roles. But because they're so close, because they're so similar, is why I think Delmer is actually where we have to go when we think about how we fight this sort of propaganda. It's only somebody from the same, almost from the same space, uh, that can actually work against this, this, this sort of, the postmodern propagandists. Now, Second World War starts. Um, there's a very dramatic story, which I tell in my book, about Delmer's attempts to join the British propaganda establishment. He's actually not trusted for a long time. Because he was so close to the Nazis, there are many people who think that he was actually sympathetic. He wasn't at all. Um, he was actually writing really good reports to the British embassy and to his editors in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s saying, these guys will lead Europe into world war. You do not understand what these guys are. So his closeness to them actually made him understand very early the seriousness of the threat they posed. But he did spend a lot of late nights with them. And to maybe somebody looking at him from the side, he may have well have seen sympathetic. So um, he wasn't trusted by the British establishment. He thought he'd been too close. But also the fact he'd been brought in, born in Berlin, the fact that he was had still spoke English with a slight German accent until, until the mid-1930s, all made him see, feel very, very suspect. But finally, after many checks, after many changes in the structure of British propaganda, he is welcomed into what is known as the political warfare executive. The political warfare executive is the department set up in the war to manage all British propaganda and media. So the political warfare executive controls, or controls, oversees the BBC, oversees leaflets, oversees partisan radios. And Delmer's place in this world would be to take over all covert propaganda aimed at Germany. And I'm gonna talk about three of the projects he created and why I think they're so interesting today. Now, Delma thought that when you were looking at audiences in Germany, who a little bit like audiences in Russia today, or the 40% of Americans who, are con or who say they believe the previous US elections were rigged, the followers of Trump, and so on, that simply preaching at them about the virtues of democracy and the value of truth 
was absolutely pointless. They were in a space where facts didn't matter anymore. They were in a space where they had submitted themselves to a leader and given up their personal agency to a leader. They were in a space where truth and facts were irrelevant. All that mattered, mattered was being part of a community, a political identity, and the emotional satisfaction that you gain from it. So the idea that you could tell them the truth and that would work, the idea that you could read them lectures about the beauty of democracy and freedom was absurd. What he said was we need some way to really tap into what these people care about and to sort of cleave them psychologically away from the political identity and the propaganda that they have put on like a, a piece of clothing that is now stuck on them. The first project that he created it is the most famous one, probably actually the least important one, but it's still very, very iconic. And I was going to play you some extracts because Delma basically, by the end of the war, ran between 12 and 20 covert radio stations. And very, very little audio remains. Um, what we do have is the transcripts of the radio shows that I've been going through over the last two, three, four years. But there are some audio clips, but we weren't sure about who owns the rights to the audio clips, so we weren't sure whether we should play them. I need to sort out whether I am allowed to play them in public because they belong to uh, various archives. I'm, al I'm allowed to use them in my book. We're not sure whether I can use them in, in, in public events. So the first show, though, that he made was, um, was a show that, if you're a German listening into it, in the 1930s and 1940s, 1941 he started, was meant to sound like soldiers talking to one another. Yeah? It wasn't someone lecturing you like the German BBC was, with lectures by Thomas Mann telling Germans how bad they were. This sounded like intercepts, like what we today would think of hacks or leaks. And it was soldiers talking to one another led by a very angry, very foul-mouthed, high-ranking Prussian officer, who was to be known as Desha. And you as the listener, and this was on shortwave, were meant to, were meant to experience a sensation where you were like eavesdropping into these conversations. And the things that were said on this radio station were deeply pornographic, full of a lot of swear words, and essentially expressed a, a point of view that there was a whole cadre of German soldiers who were deeply patriotic, who were in many ways, deeply racist and unpleasant, but who hated not all the Nazis, but Himmler, Goebbels, and the kind of Nazi middle cadres. And the shows were full of these incredible details of Nazi corruption, incredible detail of sex parties, that the Nazis had, and incredible detail about the sufferings of normal soldiers. All based on remarkable research that Delmer's team was collecting. The people he worked with were former uh, social democrat politicians from Germany who had access to various continuing forms of research about what was happening in Germany. They were um, lots of German journalists who had fled to Britain who were using their various contacts to gather details about what was going on in the country. And um, a lot of people from the Berlin cabaret scene 
who were the ones performing these roles. A lot of them were Jewish. So you had kind of Jews playing Nazis on radios in order to subvert the Nazis. Now, on the one hand, the radio was doing something very new, but it was also seemed to be doing something very simple. Yeah. It was taking the anger and the emotions and the desire for sadism that the Nazis capitalized on, and it was redirecting it against the Nazis. But here's where it gets interesting. That's a fairly classic and simple maneuver to do. It's what left-wing populists try to do in the West today, you know, where they say, let's redirect the anger that Trump puts onto migrants. Let's redirect that anger onto capitalists. And that's the, the theory of, of sort of left-wing populism. But that's not the, what Delma was doing. Delma was doing something much, much more interesting. You weren't meant to follow the chef as a new leader. The chef was the name of the radio host. You weren't meant to identify with him. Yeah? It wasn't just redirecting anger so that you could follow another leader. That's not what he was doing at all. The show almost worked like a piece of cabaret. Or actually, the closest thing it worked to was Brechtian theatre. Delma's aim, and he talks about this, was to talk, use the language often of Nazi propaganda in a way where it was pushed, in his words, into the ridiculous. Now, this was not satire. This was not a satire show. People were meant to think this was the real thing. This was not exaggeration to the point of absurdity. Delma was very skeptical about satire. This was something much, much more subtle. This was ever so slightly taking the form and content of Nazi propaganda and doing two things. Ever so slightly exaggerating it so that you started to feel a sense of alienation from it. Yeah. Taking those emotions and in a sense withdrawing you from them. You want to identify yourself with these characters. You want to gain distance from them. You meant to get a relief from the need for identifying with the leader. Now, if the argument of a Putin or a Hitler or a Trump is that they are the channel through which you can find relief for all your resentment and anger, here was a character who talked about this, almost like in a good play, in a drama, played out all these feelings, gave a space for their expression, but then almost dragged themselves away from you, leaving a sort of space. Think about the leader, the difference between a cult leader and, and a therapist. Yeah? Um, the therapist is also helping you express all these feelings, but so you can be free of them. While the cult leader wants to understand all your angers and frustrations to manipulate them in order to make them the source of relief. So that was a, the first stage of what Delma was trying to do. He was working with the same underlying resentments and angers and desire for sadism that the Nazis were and that propagandists do today. And he was almost like a, a surgeon, like creating a little space where you could have a little bit of you outside of those feelings and could start to think critically of the Nazis. Just, um, and just quickly, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry yeah. to intervene shortly, Peter. Um, I'm, I'm worried about uh, time because the the scheduled time slot is over. Oh would no, it, it gets, but it's it getting hour. ever more exciting. So, oh no, would it I maybe it be hour. possible to wrap up in five minutes yeah, and then we meet for a sequel sometime? Of course, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, but we have a 90 thought, uh, minute block afterwards minutes. and have to start in time with that. That's okay. I'm so sorry. Thank I thought you. it was 3:30 to 4:30. I'm so sorry. I, I was actually just watching my clock, and I was timing things perfectly. Okay, I'm so sorry. Well then, that's fine. I can get through the other things faster. I was going slowly on purpose. Um, so, 
So that was the first thing he did. He created an emotional pause between you and the leader. And in so doing, he was always making you aware of the theatrical nature of the propaganda you were surrounded by. So still, in a sense, working very closely to the space where Surkov is. Surkov is also trying to show that everything is theater. But Surkov's aim, and the aim of the postman propaganda, is to say everything is a sham, everything is theater, therefore you can't change anything, therefore you have to have all your experiences through me. Well, Delmer is almost reversing that. He's saying, the propagandists around you are theater, but you can start thinking and feeling for yourself. Now, the shows that Delmer made afterwards, and I'll summarize them very briefly, are all ways to make the listener feel that they have agency again. He never lectures on democracy, but everything he does is about motivating you, often for the most simple things, to start thinking for yourself again and start thinking in terms of truth and lies again. Often to do with things like how to defect from the front or how to find ways to financially survive during the bombardments, uh, not financially, financially and, and just survive during the bombardments of German cities. He starts to play into people's self-interest, but in a way that frees them from the Nazis and makes them independent again. Absolutely key to this, and I'll leave it on this thought, is how you were meant to experience this media. Now, the way that Surkov or Trump creates media is whether it's on TV to make you passive and in that passivity to experience, to you know, give over your agency to Putin or to Trump, or on forms of social media where you're not act, you think you're engaging personally, but actually just getting caught up in an online mob, an online crowd. Delmo was doing something very, very clever. In his later radio shows, they pretended to be pseudo-Nazi radio shows that were quietly giving subversive information that undermined the Nazis. But here's where it gets interesting. Everybody who was listening to them knew this was the British dressed up as the Nazis. And the British knew that everybody knew that these were the British dressed up as the Nazis. But, and they wrote this in the strategy, by playing this masquerade, they gave people a psychologically and a physically safe way to listen to them. But it's very important to think about the process somebody is going through when they tune into a radio in this way. They're no longer a passive receiver of information. They're getting involved in an active game. Essentially, what Delmer is saying is that in order to be yourself again, in order to be active again, you have to put on a mask and a role. He's involving you in a theater where you take an active part in creating your own roles. Now, to do that today online is a million times easier than it was with radio. But that, I think, is the essence. When we think about how do we fight the postmodernist propagandists, it won't be with a direct return to the BBC of the 1980s with a voice from on high dictating the truth to you. It's going to be by stimulating active citizens. So the action of democracy, the behavior of democracy psychologically and physically, and which is deeply connected to a sense that you can reinvent the social roles that you play around you. And I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening to me, even over time. Nearly in time. Thank you so much, Peter, for this inspiring talk. And I really, really deeply regret that there's no time for questions. Because I would have many, and I'm so sure my, uh, my, others. My mistake, my mistake, sorry. Please. Oh, so I'm sorry, yeah. Um, yeah. But it was great you joined us, really, and uh, making us think. Um, and it's maybe nice to leave it here. There would have been so many questions about 
is it memes, uh, what media would have to be needed. Um, but thank you, thank you for not only talking about Russia today, but giving the conference this deep historical grounding. Speak soon. And we'll see each, thank you. We'll see each other in 10 minutes for the lecture of Nikita Daran on truth.
actually we can put this on the side if you <laughs> you don't need it, you have your own microphone. Okay. So oh, good. And they don't need it. Yeah. So machen wir es. Genau. Aber das war auch... Oh, ich bin schon an. Nein. Ah, ich wollte nur sagen, das war auch richtig auf Englisch. Also das war, was Sie gesagt haben. Das war haben. beides gut. Ja, ja absolut. Gut. Aber ich habe jetzt, hab jetzt realisiert, dass Sie Deutsch sprechen. Ja. <lacht> gut. Hey. I have a few minutes. Ja, yeah, but I'm now um, right. in the mood already. <lacht> Danke. Yeah, no, no, um, I, I am aware of that. Nowadays it's... Uh, uh, Some people are coming back. Yeah, yeah. But it's 11th of 11th. I know. I'm, I've lived in uh, Cologne for six years. When I saw it, I was like, okay, they... Yeah, but we, you know, it's on stream, yeah. and afterwards we have a lot of um, public to, Absolutely. to check it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Wir haben eine PowerPoint, ne? Können ja. Sie dann kurz so... Äh, die sind, glaube ich, weg. Ja, wir machen eine Pause. Okay. Äh, wir haben noch Pause im Moment. Ja, ja. Wir machen gerade eine Pause. Ne? Genau, und sobald Sie ja. anmoderiert sind, ja. kommt Ihr Screen. Ich will nur ein, ein, und Sie ein, können ja weiter ja, genau, klicken. Genau, ich will das nur einmal ja. checken, dass das alles gut funktioniert. Ähm, ja, können Sie es wegnehmen. Ja, das stimmt. Ja, das stimmt. Ich nehme einen Schluck und dann. Nee, nee, ich nehme einen Schluck und dann können Sie. Hier ist weg, du. Lass der Frau ja was. Auf jeden Fall. Du musst mir ganz viel sprechen, weißt du? Von größere Gläser. So. <lacht> ja. Dankeschön. Gibt es ein bisschen mehr Licht oder würde es so bleiben? Okay.
Nikita Davan often does what um, an expert on postcolonial studies usually does. She discovers blind spots. She has done so last year at a lecture at the Congress, The Future of Critique, exactly at that stage. And Nikita is returning after also she has uh, contributed to the catalog uh, where she sorted the um, intricate relationships between postcolonial studies, postmodern thinking, and critical theory, and kind of found a new look through. Um, for a positive um, politics. Uh, today, Nikita Davan, who is chairholder of the political science with a focus on political theory and the history of political thought at the Dresden University of ne Technology, will speak about truth. Her lecture is called Existential Hiccups, Aesthetics, Politics and Truth. It's in English and it is followed by a German panel without a break. So if you want headphones, you can get them now. Nikita, thank you so much. Thank you, dear Kolya. Thank you, dear Eva and dear Kolya, for the kind inv uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. My contribution to this conversation is to understand the significance of the post. And I'll do so by showing the affinities between the attacks on postmodernism and postcolonialism. Michel Foucault famously remarked, and I quote him, what are we calling postmodernity? I'm not up to speed, end of quote. This impulse to disassociate oneself from the label is in part due to the accusation against postmodernists that their approach is anti-enlightenment and thus consequently anti-normative. Notably, modernity and enlightenment are often used interchangeably and are credited with ushering in progressive norms that radically trans, and this is, this is the understanding of both enlightenment and modernity, that they ushered in progressive norms that radically transformed the organization of state and society. From orthodox Marxist thinkers such as Ijaz Ahmad to post adonian Frankfurt School critical theory scholars such as Jürgen Habermas to decolonial scholars such as Walter Mignolo and Ramon Grossvogel, Postmodernism stands accused of various sins, ranging from anti-universalism to Eurocentrism. Along similar lines, since its inception with Edward Said's Orientalism, a recurring and grave accusation against postcolonial studies is that it leads to normative nihilism. Thus, even as colonialism is grudgingly acknowledged as indefensible, Postcolonial perspectives are dismissed as uncritical and ultimately unemancipatory insofar as they fail to provide normative principles with universal validity. From climate change deniers to white supremacists, anti-rational, anti-liberal, and anti-science ideologies are thriving in the current political climate. In faulting universal norms of reason and progress as alibis for neoliberal and neocolonial politics, Postmodernism and postcolonialism stand accused of feeding anti-modern sentiments. Critics of uh, enlightenment, such as postmodernists, intersectional feminists, and postcolonial scholars are being held responsible for the rise of post-truth politics. Postmodernism contests postmodern, uh, sorry, postmodern contestation of norms such as liberalism, secularism, it, ha uh, it has contended negatively impacted postcolonial societies. Boko Haram is presented as a prime example of anti-modernity ideology in the global south. Loosely translated as Western education is forbidden, the Islamic State in West Africa rejects all that is associated with the West as sacrilege and sin. It is further argued that instead of emancipating us from fascism and colonialism, the contestation of modernity has ironically strengthened illiberalism and intolerance. Defenders of enlightenment and modernity lament that it is in a, uh, it's, um, in a, uh, in a um, wrong move deployed as a sh shorthand for rationalism, universalism, scientism, and other isms which postmodernism and postcolonialism seek to boycott. The fatwa against Salman Rushdie, which is considered to be one of the uh, best examples of threat to free speech, and the rise of Taliban and more recently of Hamas are proffered as examples of post-colonial cultural relativism and ethnocentric, um, ethnocentric nativism. 
at the heart of controversy around the post in postmodernism and consequently postcolonialism is the understanding of critique and what counts as critical. While detractors decode the post as anti and consequently accuse postmodernism and postcolonialism of undermining progressive modern norms, in my view, the post in postmodernism and in postcolonialism denotes a complex temporality which alludes to the socio-political, economic, and cultural consequences of modernity and colonialism that endure in our times. Inspired by first-generation Frankfurt School and postmodernism, postcolonial theorists emphasize the profound interconnection between Western reason and genocidal violence. Instead of ushering in freedom and equality, modernity opened a new chapter in the history of domination in the form of fascism and colonialism. The paradox of modernity is that liberal and enlightened values were preached to the colonized, but denied in practice. To quote Franz Fanon, leave this Europe, where they are never done talking of man, yet murder men everywhere they find them, at the corner of every one of their own streets in all the corners of the globe. For centuries, they have stifled almost the whole of humanity." End of quote. Césaire concludes, Europe is indefensible. One of the staunchest contestations of modernity's emancipatory claims came from the first generation Frankfurt School critical theory. Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer contend that modernity embodies Europe's attempt at domination through instrumental rationality. In the dialectic of enlightenment, they argue that far from ensuring equality and liberty, enlightenment reason resulted in the barbarism of fascism, their words. As an instrument of power in the service of the privileged classes, modernity succeeded in mastering nature, women, and other minorities. In 1982, Jürgen Habermas attacked the uh, dialectics of enlightenment. I, um, Click to the slide earlier so that you all have sufficient time to look at it. It's a long quote. In his condemnation of Adorno and Hockheimer, Habermas's choice of words are instructive. He laments that under the influence of dark authors, Adorno and Hockheimer destroy the foundations of reason by writing the blackest and most nihilistic book. End of quote. For Habermas, enlightenment is characterized by modern science and technology positive law, secular ethics, and autonomous art. These positive and illuminating forces of history have been misrepresented by wayward thinkers like Nietzsche, whose counter-enlightenment positions are dangerous for the future of humankind. Along similar lines in condemning both society and rationality as repressive, Adorno and Horkheimer end up pulling the rug out Beneath, uh, out from beneath their own feet, thereby depriving themselves of the intellectual and normative grounds for emancipatory thought. So they are accused of performative contradiction. If reason was so corrupted by purposiveness, then there would be no possibility of emancipatory politics, which would render the entire project of critical theory untenable. Habermas remarks, I quote, it's still difficult to understand a certain carelessness in their treatment, and by there he means Adorno and Hockheimer's treatment, of, to put it quite blatantly, the achievements of Western rationalism. End of quote. How, no, the quote goes on, sorry. The achievements of Western rationalism. How can the two advocates of the Enlightenment, which they always claim to be and still are, so underestimate the rational content of cultural modernity that they observe in its elements only the amalgamation of reason and domination of power and validity? Question mark, end of quote. Instead of an axis of reason, Habermas diagnoses uh, a deficiency of rationality as obstructing the project of modernity. To fulfill the unfinished project of modernity, the realization and institutionalization of the process of rationalization is imperative in Habermas's view. In my reading, the triumph of reason can only be celebrated by disregarding issues of race, class, gender, sexuality, religion, and of course, colonialism. In Habermas's scheme of things, differences do not make a difference. 
in his understanding of a future as the fulfillment of that which is already latent in the present, there is a substantive inevitability and in irrevocability. Defenders argue that Habermas's notion of modernity as an unfinished project can incorporate multiple modernities and diversities in form, uh, forms of life and demonstrates a willingness to be enlightened by non-European cultures. However, Habermas's silence on colonialism and its consequences for critical theory speaks for itself. For Habermas, the norms of modernity are neither historical nor contingent, but universally binding, while all that is non-universalizable and culturally specific falls outside the bounds of truth and morality. Now, when Habermas was asked if his theory was relevant for the third world, he responded, and I quote him again, I'm tempted to say no. I'm aware of the fact that this is a Eurocentrically limited view. I'd rather pass the question, end of quote. Habermas self-elevates the West as the standard for all other societies and cultures, and despite claims to universality, his insights are deeply parochial, reflecting a specifically Eurocentric history and experience. In this view, non-Europeans who are ca caught in the past are backward and underdeveloped and need to catch up with European modernity. The narrative of modernizing Eurocentric progressivism is furthermore decoupled from the history of colonialism and its entanglement with, the, with fascism as di already diagnosed by Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism. So for instance, when Habermas draws on Immanuel Kant to analyze the emergence of bourgeois public spheres as a site of deliberative democracy and gives the example of coffee houses and salons where bourgeois, of course, bourgeois men came together to deliberate about the public use, about um, urgent uh, um, uh, uh, issues and uh, in, in this manner practiced the public use of reason, I would ask of Habermas, where did the coffee come from in these coffee houses? Where did the sugar come from? Where did the tobacco these bourgeois men smoked come from? As uh, Fanar tells us, Europe is literally a product of its colonies. I mentioned uh, Arendt earlier. So in the origins of totalitarianism, she talks about um, boomerangs, uh, imperialism's boomerang effect, and uh, makes connections and shows the entanglements between um, German colonialism and fascism. So one very concrete example is the genocide of the Herero Nama and the labor and concentration camps in the German colonies, for instance, the Haifischinsel. One can deduce that Habermas's accusations against Adorno and Horkheimer would also be levied against post-colonial critique of Western reason. For ultimately, in Habermas's view, multiple rationalities must be subsumed under the universal structure of rationalization. His teleological account of history and his claim that social and political practices are framed by universal norms that are ahistorical would have no room for the singularity of colonial experiences. So like Kant, for Habermas too, reason is colorblind. And accordingly, he would reject the post-colonial queer feminist critique of Western reason for underplaying the accomplishments of modernity with the, with the primary focus on colonialism, apartheid, and slavery. In Habermas's view, books like the critique of post-colonial reason or the critique of black reason would be as dangerous a book as the dialectic of enlightenment for their shared criticism of Western reason and the enlightenment. It is instructive to recall Fanon's reflections on the impossible relation between black and reason. Fanon observes that Western ideas of reason are not only outcome of racial inequality, but are produced for the purposes of legitimizing it. Legitima legitimizing it. Reason is not merely tainted by barbarism, but is handmaiden of domination. To quote Fanon, I had rationalized the world, and the world had rejected me on the basis of color prejudice, end of quote. So uh, these were the um, controversies that happened after the murder of George Floyd. Next year is 300th uh, year birth anniversary of Kant, and there are a lot of interesting discussions happening around how, how do we kind of negotiate and deal with Kant's uh, deeply anti-Semitic, racist, sexist, and um, 
other isms um, uh, thought. And I found a little uh, disclaimer here in one of the publications. I'll leave it for you all to read. I just have 14 minutes left, so I'll continue. In the face of these coercive legacies, decolonial, so one response to this kind of you know, claim that the problem um, um, is that you know, the project of modernity is unfinished and that it's not less of modernity but more of modernity that we need for progressive emancipatory politics. One response to this has been from the decolonial scholars who propose decolonization in terms of de-Westernization, which entails delinking from Western modernity and disobedience of the European canon. So they would argue that enlightenment is simply identi identity politics of bourgeois white men who universalize their very provincial interests. And so decolonization is coded in terms of epistemic delinking and epistemic disobedience. They recommend a return to pre-colonial, and I already said in the beginning, so here I'm thinking of colleagues like Walter, Bin, uh, Walter Mignolo and Ramon Grossfugel. They recommend a return to pre-colonial and pre-modern past in order to recuperate lost and devalued indigenous archives. So for, the, for example, they would argue that we need to somehow draw on indigenous ideas of nature, of space, of time, if we want to reimagine re and re-envision post-imperialist futures. While Habermas accused Adorno and Hockheimer of quoting dangerous friends and of having affinities with, with postmodern writers, the decolonial scholars assail postmodernism and postcolonialism as Eurocentric. So here it's also interesting. Um, on the one hand, postcolonialism and postmodernism are accused of normative nihilism. On the other hand, decolonial scholars accuse postcolonialism and postmodernism of Eurocentrism. So postcolonial theory, according to Mignolo, and I quote him, was born in the trap of postmodernity, end of quote. In its excessive focus on the European critical tradition, postcolonial theory neglects indigenous cosmologies, pre-colonial and anti-modern epistemes, which are claimed to be located beyond the modernity coloniality complex. It is my firm belief that insofar as postcolonial scholars problematize any nostalgic narratives of both European modernity as well as idealized pre-modern and pre-colonial past, they offer a much more complex and nuanced understanding of decolonization, even as they challenge assumptions of current political and economic structures as inevitable outcomes of a progressive arc of history. They contest a stadial view of history and the idea of historical development with Europe as the source and parameter of critical thought. A Eurocentric bias of modernity is founded on a historical amnesia vis-a-vis -vis colonial violence and a disregard of its own provinciality. Assailing the progressivist enlightenment narrative, Deepesh Chakravarti, for instance, insightfully asks, and I quote him, can the designation of something or some group as non or pre-modern can uh, can it ever be anything but a gesture of power? So the moment you use modern as an adjective, you automatically assume that there is something which is pre-modern, that's something that is non-modern, and there lies the trouble. Notably, Habermas was not alone in diagnosing overlaps in the first generation critical theory and postmodernism. In fact, Foucault expresses his remorse over the belatedness of his encounter with the writings of Adorno. And I quote Foucault, if I had known the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School, and here, of course, he means Adorno and Hockheimer, at the right time, I would have been spared a lot of work. Some nonsense I wouldn't have expressed and taken many detours as I sought not to let myself be led astray when the Frankfurt School had already opened the ways, end of quote. First generation critical theory, postmodern and postcolonial scholars agree insofar as all of them focus on the violence of reason in the form of fascism, authoritarianism, and colonialism. All three contribute to analyzing capitalism, but, but augment Marxist class analysis with their, with their intersectional understandings of power and resistance. I would here recommend Stuart Hall's essay, Is the Post in Postcolonialism the Same as the Post in Postmodernism? There are, of course, cr uh, crucial distinctions between the Enlightenment critique propounded by the Frankfurt School, postmodernists, and postcolonial scholars. So, for instance, although both 
First generation critical theorists and postmodernists examine the violence exercised in the name of emancipatory rationality, they fail to focus on the link between modernity. They, they don't always focus on the link between modernity and colonialism. So when Adorno and Hockheimer were writing the dialectic of enlightenment, much of the world was under European colonial rule. Given their commitment to Marxism, it is truly regrettable that they did not engage with either the transnationalization of capitalism or the European colonialism or the violence of slavery and colonial genocide. Now, despite their concerns regarding the resurgence of fascism and the ills of capitalism in the West, they disregarded the deep link between colonialism, capitalism, and neocolonialism. It's interesting to note that Adorno and C.L.R. James, one of the pioneering and influential anti-colonial thinkers and author of The Masterly, The Black Jacobins, met on a number of occasions in the 1940s through their common friend, Herbert Marcuse. And if we were to do a thought experiment and think what would Adorno and, C. Uh, and James have talked about, certainly not cricket, because Adorno didn't know the rules of cricket, and I think it would have been better that they didn't talk about jazz, because what Adorno had to say about jazz, I think would have provoked James. So despite both being Marxist and being aware of each other's work, there, is no significant, there was no significant exchange between the two intellectual giants. Despite these missed encounters, postcolonial studies, and this is my claim, is closer to first generation critical theorists such as Adorno and Hockheimer than previously acknowledged. In fact, I will even make the most, I'll make a, quite an audacious claim that postcolonial studies is closer to Adorno and Hockheimer than Habermas and post Adornian critical theory is to Adorno and Hockheimer. These unfinished conversations between Jewish studies and postcolonial studies need urgent attention. Following Adorno and Hockheimer, postcolonial scholars explore the violence of Western reason and modernity without rejecting the Enlightenment, such that the effort is to resist the destructive elements while embracing the enabling ones. Finally, it is important to note that the relation of postmodernism and postcolonialism is marked by mutual and reciprocal influence. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot these two slides. So this is the decolonial critique of postcolonialism. And of course, uh, the famous uh, remark by Audre Lorde, and this is what I think in a certain way inspires decolonial scholars, that you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. That enlightenment legacies are so deeply contaminated that you cannot, I, I, I'm far, you cannot uh, suddenly I was going to speak German, mobilize it um, to, uh, uh, to realize the project of uh, decolonization. So now the uh, affinities between postcolonialism and um, postmodernism, and then I move to my conclusion. Foucault's stay in 1968 in Sidi Bou Said in, tu in Tunis during the student movement and Derrida's experience of being an Arab Jew while growing up in Algeria, deeply impacted Derrida playing cricket. I think he knew, he knew the rules. While growing up in Algeria, deeply impacted their critique of Western modernity and its coercive aspects. The erasure of these personal experiences in scholarly debates and the significant influence of postcolonialism and postmodernism is, I think, quite regrettable. It makes it imperative to trace the complex entanglements between postcolonialism and postmodernism. For instance, Spivak's groundbreaking translation of Derrida's of Grammatology in, uh, from French introduced the English-speaking world to Derrida. The post-colonial readings of Marx, Gramsci, Adorno, Hockheimer, Foucault, and Derrida globalized these thinkers and made them relevant for context they neglected in their writings. Postcolonial scholars used the categories developed by these thinkers to analyze situations they neither experienced nor foresaw. This entails being a Marxist or deconstructivist in divergent ways under conditions of geopolitical and historical difference. So differences do make a difference. The dilemma for postmodernism and postcolonial queer feminism is that our relationship to modernity is marked by the impossibility of categorically uh, locating ourselves beyond it. There is no insights. Despite accusations of anti-modernity, in my view, postmodernists, postcolonial scholars, as well as first-generation critical theorists, seek to understand the contradictory consequences of Western reason. Following Foucault's recommendation of freeing ourselves from the 
blackmail, intellectual blackmail of being for or against the Enlightenment, the challenge is to acknowledge the indispensability of the enabling legacies of Western modernity in pursuing critical projects while contesting, contesting its Euro and androcentrism. Thus, instead of renouncing modernity, as proposed by the decolonial scholars, or pursuing the Habermasian unfinished project of modernity that is plagued by colonial amnesia, the post-colonial challenge is one of charting a post-imperial future where, to quote Spivak, one undertakes an affirmative sabotage of the master's tools. So I'd like to conclude now and to shift focus to more recent events to once again illustrate the attacks against post-colonial studies. In her book, Susan Neumann praises the Germans for their Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Uh, the book is called uh, Learning from the Germans. While in other, while in more, um, um, I mean, this book was in 2019, but in more recent talks and writings, she has, uh, no, sorry, I have to restart. So, in her book, um, Learning from the Germans, Susan Neumann praises the uh, effort in Germany by the Germans um, to, of coming to terms with their past, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. At the same time, she dismisses post-colonial um, politics and theory as tribal and as identity politics. Now, I do agree with Naiman that Germany does in the, indeed deserve praise for its efforts and that certain approaches to decolonization are inclined to promote particular interests over universal ones. So I would say, as a, as a, I, would, I, I would consider myself as a nuanced thinker, that critique without self-critique is lazy politics. So insofar, one needs to reconsider our understanding of decolonization in a critical manner. And even more in agreement with Susan Neumann's more recent criticism of German politics in the New York Review of Books, and I quote her, she talks about historical reckoning gone haywire, atonement gone haywire, and philosemetic McCarthyism. I would add that we are once again confronted with the European breach and violation of Enlightenment norms. So I have a few images here on uh, 7th of October, these brutal and indefensible attacks happened uh, against Israeli civilian, uh, civilians by Hamas. Um, in 2008, Angela Merkel, in front of the Israeli parliament, talked about how the security of Israel was a German, uh, Germany's Staats raison. Five days later, on 12th of October, um, Olaf Scholz, met with the emir of Qatar. Germany has discontinued buying gas from Russia, but is buying billions and billions of dollars of cash, uh, of cash, of gas um, from Qatar. And uh, as we all know, Qatar um, is uh, materially and immaterially um, supporting the Hamas, and Qatar does not recognize uh, the what is in German called existence rest of Israel. So you cannot travel to Qatar with an Israeli passport. This was already in 2022 when uh, they went to make the initial deals with the Qatari uh, government uh, to buy gas, to shift buying gas from R Russia to uh, uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia. These are the Hamas leaders and Iranian leaders meeting in a five-star hotel in Doha, two days after the meeting with Olaf Scholz. And uh, just around the corner are um, offices of uh, German, American uh, governments. So it's not that they're not aware of it. Um, there are these absolutely, you know, harsh critique and attacks of post-colonial anti-Semitism already during the documenta Olaf Scholz uh, um, gave, uh, there was a press release saying that Olaf Scholz has never missed a single documenta in 30 years, but this year, in 2022, he will not be attending the documenta because of the controversy around anti-Semitism. This was in June 2022. In September 2022, Olaf Scholz went to Saudi Arabia. And like I pointed out earlier, Saudi Arabia does not recognize the existence rest of uh, Israel. Um, since these attacks, the news in Germany um, has been primarily almost on an everyday basis, whether it's on radio, whether it's on television, 
whether it's uh, in the press, there's a systematic ag attack against post-colonial theory, against post-colonial um, activism. Um, interestingly, so these are news in Germany. This is the news one hears in India. So these were two nurses who for 12 hours held on to a door because the door couldn't be locked and protected Israeli civilians against Hamas uh, attacks. And the Israeli um, embassy in India hailed these caregivers as Indian superwomen. So just, just to give you all a sense of what happens when you read perspective, we're going to, in a few minutes, talk about a pluri-universalist uh, ethics. When one reads news and also um, reads, reads news from other parts of the world and also in other languages. Uh, another quote I brought with me just to, just as an example, and uh, this is just one, uh, one little illustration, there are several systematic uh, analysis done in the Deutsche Welle, interestingly, of the positions taken by different leaders in the post-colonial world. So this is the El Salvadorian president who on X immediately after the attacks um, tweeted or posted, um, one no longer I think uses the verb tweet, as a Salvadorian with Palestinian and ancestry, I'm sure the best thing that could happen, in the, uh, um, happen to the Palestinian people is for Hamas to completely disappear. Those savage beasts do not represent the Palestinian people. Anyone who supports the Palestinian cause would make a great mistake siding with these criminals." End of quote. Um, the General Assembly, as many of you all are aware, adopted a resolution calling for humanitarian truce and civilian uh, protection, the resolution which was uh, called Protection of Civilians and Upholding Legal and Humanitarian Obligation. And I'm just giving this example to show how diverse and how plural the positions are when we're talking about Europe and the post-colonial world. Among the 14 countries that voted against the ceasefire were Israel and US, but also Guatemala, Marshall Islands, Fiji, Papua, uh, Papua uh, New Guinea, and uh, Tonga and Paraguay. Four EU nations voted no to the UN resolution, um, and um, many, many European countries voted for the resolution, including France, Ireland, uh, Luxembourg, New Zealand, um, um, sorry, uh, Portugal, Spain, and just, it's a very, very long list. I think it's 43 countries that abstained, 43 or 45 country, countries that abstained, including Germany, India, Tunisia, and Zambia. So just, like I said, just to once again reinforce the point um, how complicated it is when we are currently talking about, uh, when, we are, when we are taking, or when we are making these kinds of accusations against post-colonialism, um, accusations of anti-Semitism against post-colonialism. In an interview in 2012, Habermas stated that while, and I quote him, this was an uh, interview given to Haritz, the, the present situation and the policies of the Israeli government do require a political kind of evaluation. This is not the business of a private German citizen of my generation, end of quote. As the German-Israeli philosopher Umri Böhm compellingly argues, the critical engagement with the Holocaust should not contribute to global, uh, sorry, other way around, that a critical engagement with the Holocaust should contribute to global solidarity and strengthening of universal norms of human rights and international law instead of feeding ethno-nationalistic projects which exclude other forms of memorialization. Although symp sympathetic to Habermas's unwillingness to criticize Israel, Omri Boehm nevertheless warns that when the master of discourse ethics and public intellectual par excellence avoids public exercise of one's reason, he's betraying enlightenment critical tradition of having the courage to think for oneself. This has far-reaching consequences that goes beyond self-censorship as it indicates the ultimate test of enlightenment thinking itself in the face of withdrawal of critical judgment and deliberation in the public sphere. As Spivak laments, enlightenment is sick at home. Flying in the face of Kant's vision of perpetual peace, the arms industry in Europe stands to make billions from the current conflicts globally. In the face of multiple attacks, Adorno and Hockheimer planned a follow-up work. They were planning to write a book called Rescuing the Enlightenment. 
which unfortunately never materialized. Postcolonial studies in my reading might be understood as a project to realize this vision of the first generation critical theorists. We are thrown for niche als Aufklärung, Moses Mendelssohn famously remarked. This might as well be the slogan of postcolonialism and its hope for a post-imperialist world of freedom, equality, solidarity. Let us hope for the best and prevent the worst. Thank you for your attention. Ich darf nun mit mir aufs Panel bitten, aus dem Raum, Martin Saar, gewissermaßen Lehrstuhlnachfolger des eben zitierten Jürgen Habermas an der Goethe-Universität in Frankfurt, Professor für Gesellschaftsphilosophie, für Sozialphilosophie in Frankfurt. Ähm, zu seinen ähm, Veröffentlichungen gehören ähm, die Immanenz der Macht, politische Theorie nach Spinoza und Michel Foucault, Ästhetik der Existenz, ähm, ähm, Schreiben, über die Lebenskunst schreiben. Ich habe hier nur den englischen Titel gerade. Ähm, und Martin. am Bildschirm Gertrud Koch, die Sie sich ja schon vom Anfang der Konferenz ähm, erinnern. Ich werde mich zwischendurch schon mal setzen, bis Gertrud auf dem Bildschirm erscheint. Hallo Gertrud, ein Déjà-vu. Auch gestern habe ich dich bereits vorstellen dürfen. Ähm, Gertrud Koch ähm, hat einschneidende Beiträge zur Filmwissenschaft geleistet, war früher Musikkritikerin, hat die, die Zeitschrift ähm, Frauen und Film herausgegeben in den 80er Jahren, war Professorin bis vor kurzem an der Freien Universität Berlin und ähm, an der Yale University Visiting Professor. Und ich möchte zwei Bücher von Gertrud ähm, aufrufen, um dann vielleicht auch gleich eine Frage an Sie zu stellen und zu versuchen, dieses ähm, Panel anzuschließen an den eben gehörten Vortrag und ähm, gewissermaßen in, eine historische, in, die Histo in diese Einladung zur historischen äh, Tiefe zu gehen, Ursprung der kritischen Theorie, Exil in Los Angeles, wo Nikita Davan übrigens gerade an ähm, Thomas Mannhaus eine Fellowship hatte. Ähm, zu den Büchern von Gertrud Koch gehören ähm, ähm, die Rückkehr der Illusionen, das ist, glaube ich, das, das jüngste, die jüngste Monografie, 2016 bei Surkamp, und ein einschneidendes Buch, aber wirklich der ähm, Filmwissenschaft, aber auch der politischen Theorie letztlich und der, ähm, dass auch die Relevanz von ästhetischer Analyse für jede politische Theorie zeigt, ist ähm, die Einstellung ist die Einstellung über die visuelle Konstruktion des Judentums, 92 bei Surkamp ähm, erschienen. Und ähm, es ist beeindruckend, Gertrud, wie du in diesem Buch damals ähm, beschrieben hast, wie versucht wurde aus ähm, dieser ähm, extrem bedrohlichen Stimmung in den USA, wo unklar ist, ob die USA sich entscheiden, gegen den Nationalsozialismus in den Krieg einzuziehen. Ähm, Horkheimer, Adorno und andere, auch Krakauer, glaube ich, ähm, in Los Angeles, ähm, damit beschäftigt sind, wie man quasi ähm, die Maschine Hollywood auch benutzen kann, ähm, um aufzuklären über Antisemitismus. Du beschreibst auch den ersten Versuch, ähm, verschiedene Sorten von Antisemitismen zu strukturieren. Kannst du dazu ein paar Worte sagen und uns mitnehmen nach äh, Los Angeles ums Jahr 1941? Ähm, ja, ich muss vielleicht vorausschicken, ich habe äh, hier ein ziemliches Tonproblem. Äh, das heißt, wenn ich bestimmte Sachen vielleicht nicht richtig verstanden habe oder so, ähm, sollten Sie mich darauf hinweisen. Ähm, der Ton hat hier irgendwie eine klingt wie in einer Schwimmbadhalle unter Wasser. Ähm, Vielleicht lässt sich daran was ja, ändern, gut, dass du es sagst. Frage, wenn ich die richtig verstanden habe, geht es äh, darum, also was kann man eigentlich, ähm, was konnte man zu der Zeit, als die Dialektik der Aufklärung geschrieben wurde oder diktiert wurde, das war ja erstmal ein Gespräch, ähm, zum Antisemitismus sagen und was konnte man zu Auschwitz sagen, und, äh, Ganz kurz, ich möchte, ich möchte es präzisieren für den Fall, dass es am Ton lag. Also zwei, zwei Projekte interessieren mich da besonders, die du im Buch Die Einstellung ist die Einstellung äh, beschreibst. Das eine ist der Versuch einer ähm, Systematisierung von Antisemitismen ähm, und das andere ist ein Filmprojekt, in das, glaube ich, auch Krakauer involviert war, ähm, das versucht hat... Ähm, that Krakauer is involved in and where they try to make raise awareness for Krakauer in public life. Can you maybe talk about both of them? 
Yes, the problem of anti-Semitism, of the anti-Semitism project was that they wanted to prepare a group discussion as a socio, as a social experiment. And as part of that experiment, they wanted to show a movie as an incentive for a discussion, as a starting point for the discussion. And in that film, they showed a situation, a metro, fully packed metro in New York, and a woman who just bought a vacuum cleaner is pushed and she falls out of the metro, out of the underground. And what happens next is that there is a discussion amongst the people in the underground about who was the person who pushed the woman. And you have different social characters, a black person, a Jewish person, a white person, and so on. And the problem then is, when it came to realizing that film, Trans Richter was one of the writers, Krakauer was also in charge, Elia Kazan wanted to be the director. And the problem before producing the movie was the following. How do we represent, how do we show a Jewish people? And the problem was then, as Adorno said, anti-Semitism is the rumor about Jews. So the problem was that there isn't a, an actual representation of Jewish people that you could show by using color or something else. And that is why they dropped it at the end, because it was impossible to visually represent a Jewish person. Uh, for me, it was interesting from a film theoretical perspective. A visual representation simply wasn't there, or at least not one that doesn't itself represent the stereotype, this anti-Semitic uh, stereotype. So the problem was really the following. Talking about something, how can we solve and, and um, separate talking off s about something without actually knowing what we talk about. So that was a paradox that they encountered and that is why they actually refrained from producing the movie. And instead of that, instead of producing the movie, they organized survey and inter interviewed people about other questions that we know from social research, from Thank sociology. Thank you. That's very interesting and leads us to the next topic, identity politics. This is another topic that I think is very interesting, especially against the backdrop of this exhibition. One could, of course, argue about what position or what's the role of identity politics in postmodernism, because in identity politics it's about actual truths and that's not really something that takes place in postmodernism as well. So maybe we should should simply make it easier by talking about postmodernism as an era. And in this era, we focus on things that are closely linked to some theories. So a collective that invented the term in 1977 in Boston, a group of black, mainly lesbian women who said that, well, in feminism, we experienced racism. In socialism, in civil rights movements, we experienced sexism. So in our experience, so many different ways of oppression overlap. So for us, the only possible way to start is to look at our own identity. What's interesting in this exhibition to see is no matter what background people have, once we show the manifesto that Barbara Smith allowed us to reprint and give out, because all of a sudden, a sort of culture war, uh, to use a term of that uh, identity politics, is dissolved. And it is very easy to agree on the fact that that's not a disadvantage and that society and its cohesion isn't threatened if different groups manage to understand their own disadvantagements or their privileges. And that brings me to Martin. Martin um, sent us an essay that will only be published next year, and it is called I 
identity politics. And I think what you write about in that essay is very interesting because you first of all talk about the term and you also talk about the weaponization of the term. So how did the term identity politics become a token in a culture war that has become very complex? Can you maybe talk about the key ideas of that essay? I'll be happy to do that. I would like to first of all talk about one thing that you already mentioned. First of all, I have to say I went to the exhibition just before and it Mm. When I, well, when I thought about the discussion on postmodernism, I thought it was interesting to read there that the, multi the, the numerous dimensions of the postmodernism back then is something that we really underestimate. These different aspects, culture, uh, media history, architecture, all those questions that are located between general culture and design and the aesthetic revolutions Back then, they were linked to the term postmodernism, postmodernism, but also the historical and philosophical debates are in themselves already so heterogeneous, so diverse that all you can do is really open up a network and then expand that to the different directions. And this is something that I felt in the exhibition, the fact that I thought the core of postmodernism of the debate, and Nikita talked about that from a philosophical perspective of the early 80s, that that was also only one facet of many other motives. However, having said that, the Combahee River Collective is presented as a part of postmodern history, as a part of the debate, as a part of the topos. That really took me by surprise because in my head, that's a different line. That's more the theoretical, historical transformations of left theory in the broader sense between the Marxist and the rather feminist movements and the intersections, the, uh, the, the fields where they overlap. And I wouldn't have actually brought that together with that first definition or formulation of the, identity, identi the, the paradigm of identity politics. But you're absolutely right. Today, against the backdrop of the adversaries, we put all of that into one thing. Susan Nyman also uh, talked about that, about the fact that for some people, the alleged postmodern realism and that fixation on particular uh, identities are actually the same thing. The Kombahi River Collective is therefore now entering the story of postmodernism because it is th they're subsumized in a polemical way in that movement. And that is why I think it is good, it's right to say we'll do it ourselves and make it a contribution, a part of a certain, of thinking in a specific way a post, in, in po, about postmodernism. And you said it right, that was the issue of decentralizing political arguments. It is not enough to think emancipation along the question of how do the workers do and how are they oppressed by uh, the capitalists, for example, but the, the fact that the oppression lines that refer to race, gender, and other dimensions, that they belong to the way of thinking about liberation and emancipation, that is one of the biggest achievements um, of groups like the Combahi River Collective. And they did that in a stronger way, in a more convincing way than some other representatives of left theory of the time. But as you said, the topos identity politics itself or thinking about progressive politics with the topos or by the topic of being affected oneself has then shifted. The 90s sort of culturalized it, if you want to put it in a descriptive way. So the types of, the, 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 the kinds of differences, and Nikita talked about the fact that in some eras they didn't actually play a big role. They were perceived as more and more relevant, but for a while, not by everybody, but by some, they were linked to the differences between different cultures. And in the next period, and that's probably more related to the uh, interventions coming from the right, from the new right, already in the 90s, 
And, but also, if we look at the American, the, the British debates in the early 2000s, that was weaponized. So the claim that those who speak on behalf of those affected or speak on behalf of the identity that is affected by discrimination, that they only speak for them and are therefore only particularly and undermine the common good. And through that, the toppers got numerous meanings because the reference to it, on the one hand, was a, a good movement, a good development that enabled us to think dominance in a diverse way, but it could only be used in order to tighten the, the relationship between discrimination and identity. And that was something that people were accused of. And that, and that brings me back to another aspect, that's also something postmodern uh, regarding this problem, this topos, that in itself it has a type of um, dialectics, and that is why the relationship between identity and politics in those years that separate us from the first podernism, that that wasn't dissolved, but it was actually intensified, and that is how I understood Nikita, because it leads us through all these paradoxes that also on a, on a federal level in politics that tries to also refer to traditions, and it expresses itself in that way. And by that, I want to underline that in this spirit, postmodernism isn't over. But this sort of unclarity and ambivalence determines our debates. And if I understand the exhibition correctly, and also some of the first texts in the catalog, you would probably say more than ever. In hindsight, this postmodernism between, what did you say, 67 and 92, is, was actually quite clear compared to the global constellation we have today that is actually even more fractured into uh, blocks of power, but also coalitions, al um, alliances that now have even taken on new sympathies and contact points. But that doesn't sound like good news. Ja, danke, dass du so zusammengefasst hast. Also auch den Einsatz um, des Redens über die Postmoderne. Thank you for the summary. Also, the summary of postmodernism, the defense of postmodernism, was based on different conditions. It was conducted in different battlefields than today. And you describe this quite clearly in terms with all the contradictions. Notions with all the contradictions should be enclosed, so they should become black boxes, which could, would then be used in culture wars. I think Gertrud would like to take the floor. Perhaps I could add to this. What we are ignoring in the discussion is the historical dimension in these definitions of terms. In the early feminist movement, also in the US, I'm quite familiar with this because I was even involved in those. So initially, we met under the slogan race, class, and gender. So to speak, it was, there was a sort of intersectionality. But against the Frankfurt background, we have to realize that there is this strong identity philosophy-related refusal of a clear notion of identity. So identity is seen as something negative, which is imposed from the outside world and which you must break through. So everything is punished with similarity, with equality, and against this background, if you like, there was this approximation to concentration because that was about difference, not identity. And what's interesting, and I think Martin is right, what would happen if this tension between identity and difference, if that were not be an integral part of discussion and everything 
disintegrates into weak groups, that is, the I problem would then be translated into a we problem, and then you are a member of that group or not. And this is an exclusion problem. And um, there are theoretical and philosophical problems here, whether you can argue in this fashion, whether, so to speak, this we is actually an addressing we, which also addresses the others, coming back to this um, example in isolation of a film which wasn't made. It was exactly this problem. So how can you represent a negative identity in such a way in pictures? Because pictures, per se, create something positive. A picture is always a picture of something, an image of something. And it failed because of this issue. But I think that the issue is more far-reaching. Exactly where and how identities are defined and those who demonstrated at that time against the image of women, of workers, or of people of color. Um, they started from the some assumption that these images themselves had an objectifying function, and in every subject or whatever, um, persons are restricted to a certain socially determined role, which they actually want to shed. And I think this movement that is this liberation movement was actually was meant to shed this uh, imposed identity. It cannot be dissolved because you enter a new closed identity. So for me, so to speak, the grain of salt would be what what is also what was contributed by postmodern philosophy. So not, not really the, the difference, because I see this as the dominating structure in the critical theory, but when Rozzi um, defined in this um, triad of terms, of notions, with the solidarity and irony. And this moment, moment of irony, which in a way um, can be quite Playful, and this was also um, described in Wine's presentation that this was an important moment, which, in the Marxian sense, uh, you make conditions dance, and da in dance, every these um, rigid, fixed dramas of architecture become fluid. Um, so you have designed it in such a way that it's being remodeled time and again by the users. And what actually is the role of this moment of irony? That is, if you take it seriously and if you do not dismiss it as a sort of playfulness. And I think in there, there is this moment of insight, of understanding that with this strict identity notion, we cannot really make politics that is not with an, a liberating function. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a very important moment, how, so to speak, in this political debate itself, such a aesthetic moment can be uh, contributed on the basis of irony, which means that we create a certain diff distance. And you could see this in Wine's lecture. It's different from the irony of cold, which presupposes that you are not involved. And there is a more playful character where you can also decentralize yourself where you shed your own identity, that is the socially determined identity, where you can represent this as a role. And um, the queer theories are also coming into play here. This is how I, I understand this. And that is how this developed up to the current discussion, which is about a completely different expansion to a global situation. And of course, we would have to conduct a different discussion about this. You would like to respond to this? Well, please, if you 
If you will, this is a question for the two of you, whether everybody can use the tool of irony as a political tool. And another is a quote by Hannah Arendt, if you used quite often. If I'm defended, then I must respond as a Jew. And that is also what Gertrude raised. How does identity come about? So that is, is it played by those who ascribe it to themselves? Or often do, do you not have a choice, like the 10-year-old future British journalist um, Peter Pomeranz talked about, who was in Berlin when the war broke out, and he was used as a scarecrow, so to speak. Oh, I would like to add to what both of you said, to some extent, or I will use this one example that is the disenchantment, Weber's disenchantment this of the river collective, that is this promise that a person will be able to participate, but this promise failed, it didn't work, it was a modern idea. And we are also um, seeing this in Foucault, help me Martin, it's this, this, this drawn on the sand and with the next ocean. Yeah, it will disappear like a face in the sand. And this is also this post-humanism. They didn't talk about it a lot. And there we see that Fanon and Taid still believed in a secular humanism. That is, despite everything, they thought of this. But with Gohemi and River um, Collective, there is a sort of disillusionment of the promise of the global involvement that all we women, because we all suffer from a universal patriarchy, and this is a link between us, but this failed. This um, didn't succeed. And in this term, I also have a seminar about equality and intersexuality. And yesterday, we read Renaud Brood, Entire Woman. And this is a very disillusioning feminism where this accusation is raised against white feminists that that they were complicit in slavery, in racism. And by the way, irony, it's not direct irony, but it's a very good example of this very ambiguous relation to identity, your own identity, but also the identity of others. I've often quoted this, this poem by Pat Parker. The title of the poem is to white people who want to be my friend. And I can't quote it in German, I'm afraid. Rule number one is forget that I'm black. Yeah? So it doesn't matter whether you're black or white, forget that I'm black. Rule number two, never forget that I'm black. And this is a double bind. I believe that, now I'm saying this in English, it's a disservice to reduce it to identity politics the way it's understood today. You're clinging on and reducing it to particular interests. So I believe that this ambivalence, this ambiguity, this double bind, and there, I think that Hannah Arendt's quote is so helpful. If you're attacked as a Jew, you defend yourself as a Jew. You cannot escape into the universal category of humanity and coming from Arendt. She was a universalist, and it means something. It also means, uh, to me, this is also a disenchantment with the promise of, well, we are all humans, and that we are equal. This brings me back to Martin. You already referred to this struggle between the alleged universalism on the one hand and particularism on the other hand. Could you dissolve this? That is, would 
what we could also read about in the um, in the culture sections of newspapers. That is, what ideas of particularism and universalism came about, and what is so deceiving about them. Well, referring to this idea that some of these basic attitudes um, shifted, were shifted in the past 40 or 50 years. And I believe we should also say the same with respect to universalism, and I did so in the exhibition. When you read some of the text which we are exhibiting here, um, it looks quite simple. Um, Postmodernism rebelled against the re against the retreat um, universalism of modernism, and they try to demonstrate that this universal character or the general or this word that applies to everybody, this type of humanity doesn't exist. It's a sort of ideology that because you celebrate pluralism or decentralism. At that time, interestingly enough, in the reasonable text of the debate, nobody hardly ever said this, but it was a sort of reduced modernism, uh, but it was propagated, and these were the two fronts, even Lyotard was more complex. He said the unity, promises of unity and universalism of modernism have come to the end even within modern societies. And this is related to technology and scientific progress and the division between different fields of knowledge and expertise. And he said for this, for this type of complexity, simple notions, simple concepts of of generality as propagated by some of the modern ideologies of the 20th century are no longer true. And for this reason, there is now a sort of reflection on these societies, which is also expressed in the fact that it no longer tries to handle everything with simple a criteria of unification, of harmonization, generalization. And this was a complex um, argument for taking universalism seriously, but not because anything goes, but because the promise of a true, strong universalism by the social entities, for the social entities to which it should apply, cannot be honored. So even in Lyotard, which uh, had always been deemed to be be a, a revisionist, or a, a, and now we are coming to a different question of the panel, so a different ethics, um, which does not, which doesn't fall apart into the standpoints of the individual decentralized groups, but which have a different relationship to their own internal heterogeneity, and for him, the notion of pluriversalism, I did, it doesn't matter in his term. There are other terms, heterogeneity, parallelology, or certain notions of dissensus or internal difference. But by this, he meant to say that these societies must also relate to the internal differentiatedness or heterogeneity. That is, they do not um, drop any type of orientation in the form of rules. That is the accusation of normalism, which Nikita referred to. So this accusa accusation doesn't apply to the main authors, but it was the proposal that come complex societies need different types of self-understanding than those which can be covered with typical terms of unity, such as fairness, justice, and progress, and identity is probably another member of this series for him. So postmodernism replaced universalism with, with something completely different, or particularism, or anti-universalism, and this, as such, had always has been a very interested and pejorative characterization of the debate. The debate was more complex. Um, that is whether there was a certain type of universalism which is aware of its own internal tension or its own tonal fracturedness. And unlike Nikita, I feel that Habermas himself um, pursued this project. So he is someone for me who 
in terms of pluralism, he is not very consistent, but um, he himself um, took up this type of late postmodernism, but that would be a completely different debate. But again, the point, it's not that we have simple fronts here, consensus here and dissensus there, or universalism against party, particularism, but the debate was about whether there was a certain behavior vis-a-vis -vis heterogeneity, which does not equate everything, that is, the equality of differences, but which can tolerate this, which can persist in this high-tension relationship and in this very paradox form. Um, if you permit, wouldn't you say that, for instance, Nancy Faser was accused of pseudonormal Lism. And there was this complaint, this accusation that Wolf Hochhaum provided a blueprint for in emancipatory politics, which nevertheless is pseudonormative. And then this famous discussion between Foucault and Noam Chomsky, I believe one of the most frequently seen videos, and there is also discussion about these. So the accusation is raised at time and again that this is missing. Foucault actually you know, distance himself from this label postmodernism, but Chomsky criticized um, Foucault that normativism is missing there. So he doesn't say that he's a normative nihilist, but nevertheless there was this claim or this criticism that an emancipatory uh, project was missing. Well, the accusations were there, and yes, they were highly ideologized. I wasn't there, and I think you weren't there. No, I was too young. But Habermas apparently actually shouted at Foucault in Frankfurt. That's what I heard. So he actually, yeah, they, he got really loud. What I wanted to say, I think Gertrude wanted to say something, but yeah. So early 80s, I would say, though, what then happened uh, at the height of the debate, that that's an argument that goes beyond these simple confrontations, these fronts. I would have thought, though, between 1983 and 1990, that became more obvious, more visible. And by using a, a phrase that somebody that affects Albrecht Wehmer, I think back then that was understood more as a dialectics between modernism and postmodernism. However, yes, the, the polemics was there. Well, it wasn't a deliberative model, the talk between Habermas and Foucault. That's what I wanted to say. It was a, an actual conflict. Gertrud? I think we might have to say, though, that that was the, the typical style in Frankfurt. So to actually be very vocal about dissents, about disagreeing, and in Frankfurt, that was normal. You, as a former Frankfurter person, say that. Yeah, but Max called the next day, and he apologized. And however, this really shows that it wasn't a culture based on consents, and that wasn't the intention. Habermas invited people to who he knew he would argue with. However, I wanted to emphasize that what Nikita uh, presented as a critique on Habermas without actually dwelling on that critique too much, but I think Habermas meant it differently. What he wanted to say was, I stay within my framework. I don't want to tell others what to say, how to talk. So my theory isn't a prescriptive theory, and in that way it's not a dogmatic theory. It doesn't actually have that metaphysical claim for the truth, but it has to be actually carried out as a dissens. And I think that's what he meant by it. So it's uh, more of an ethical, yes, to say Israel ha how to how to deal. Well, okay, I would say, for example, that he'd think, or he wanted to say, I can articulate my feelings, my ideas, and others can articulate 
their position, and then we can discuss the whole thing. That was his approach. What quote do you mean by Habermas? Because I found numerous quotes. So what, what quote of Habermas do you refer to? The third world? Sorry, I didn't understand you there. The relevancy of his theory for the third world? Yes, the Eurocentric. So not Israel, actually. The other quote, the universalism, so not not regarding Israel. But I thought maybe we can read both things together in um, a program um, of ethical holding one back, you know, so you don't actually have to oppress your opinion on anything, on everything. However, I think there is a another argument, and it is related to his work as a, as a linguist. So on the one side, the acceptance of the fact that we can't leave our language and its limitations, but on the other hand, we don't have another medium to communicate. And in that way, our dissense is always in a certain framework. I think this is something that we should keep in mind, that language, of course, plays a huge role. And if one can say that there's a non-post-human assumption, then that's an anthropology of language as a shared foundation. So that then, of course, leads to the question of whether things can be translated, whether all, tra all positions can be translated into each other, or whether these remains of non-translatable uniqueness come into play, some things that you might not even want to be translated. I think these are issues that were way more relevant back then and that might also have to do with the confrontation with Derrida's position that in its core also was a linguistic, a, a philosophical position, whether there are boundaries for Derrida, yes, there is the assumption that at some point there was already a text that served as a starting point, but we don't actually have access to that text anymore. So a cutting off the past, sort of. With Habermas, of course, we have a, an opening towards the future, so you can't actually stop it. We will never be able to find final truths. But we have to again and again found, find a, a, a common foundation that we can then act on. That would be the momentum of performance that comes through language. I think that is something that we have to agree on and that we have to understand before we see it as a naive political position. Well, we only have 10 minutes left. And yes, I mean, let's just agree that it is difficult to communicate that. However, that is also where one could accuse Habermas of cultural relativism because a certain intertextuality in a dialogue has to be possible between the languages. And I don't just mean in the spirit of language, but also in terms of languages, German, English, Swahili, Mandarin, how do we understand each other in terms of uh, geopolitics? At the UN, for example, how do we talk about humanitarian international law? We can't say, okay, there's a limit. We simply don't have that term in Hindi, so we cannot talk about it anymore. I can't ratify the humanitarian international law now because we don't have the word in Swahili. I'm really excited to see how we manage to move from identity politics to our actual topic, the topic that we wanted to address here at this panel. So language, what language do we need in order to understand each other, to communicate? What can actually be translated? And I'd like to quote François Lyotard, and that is the following, in his critique on Habermas, the end of postmodern knowledge, he writes, the consens is an outdated, suspected value. It has become that kind of value, but justice hasn't. So consens simply isn't possible because of the different systems and languages and sciences and description systems. He says, however, justice is. You therefore have to get to an idea, a practice of justice that isn't 
wasn't linked and bound to consent. This quote actually really struck me during the preparation because I thought, okay, that's where the key, that's where we can find the key that we have been looking for in order to move away from these very uh, conflictive positions. Everything that we talk about ends up in these in these trenches, one could say. In spring of the year, a minister in North Rhine-Westphalia, after a lot of criticism, had to declare that she does actually also eat meat and isn't a vegetarian. Just to give you an example for that, there is a certain climate where the right way of living, of talking, is sort of forced upon everybody. And how do we get to a, a practice of justice that isn't bound to a practice of consent? What, how can we reconquer our ways of being able to talk freely? Just one sentence regarding the question of whether that's a critique on Habermas that makes sense. I think this is a text that was published between 78 and 1980. So what Lyotard knew of Habermas back then has very little to do with what we think of when we think of Habermas and his consent theory, because that was in his later texts. That's not important, though. The idea is stronger. It's systematic up to this day. The quote is 40 years old. The idea is, though, how we want to live together can't be reduced to the idea of a shared, of, of something we have in common, of, or the or of the idea of what we think of together, what we have in common. But the idea of having to live together in some way refers to something that isn't given. And if I understand the quote correctly, and if I, I think I remember the context, I think that's what Leo Tsar meant. Con it can't be consensus because consensus is something that is hard to capture and it's an objective thing, a way of what we share. Even worse, he prescribes a meta language and therefore excludes all other language and, and also the, the legal expectations that might only be part of one language. Yes, and that leads us to a language of uh, multilinguality, the reality of that multilinguality of the registers in which everybody can formulate their interests, their expectations, and that's the postmodern message for me. This is something that will always be without heter heterogeneities. To individualize that into something like a factual consent is madness or pure violence. I think that's a position that doesn't really refer to Habermas that much as a counterposition, but it had a different context back then. So, in itself, I think the idea is correct. The fact that all of us want to live together in a society, maybe even at a global level, is very complicated and it's highly improbable that this will work. However, it is never going to be based on the fact that all of us want to be the same. It will be a dynamic and a highly conflictive process in itself, whether you know, in Germany we say we have to pull ourselves together and I don't know whether that's useful. However, I think democracy isn't easy. Democracy doesn't solve anything. Democracy is only the claim, the expectations that subjects that are very different from each other share a space without killing each other. And I think uh, this focus on justice in, in this sense has a certain a French connotation um, uh, and, so and I think that is something that we would have to look at in more detail from a philosophical perspective. But just by saying, okay, we have a certain identity and that way we can live together, that's not going to work. No, we have to actually look at the conflicts, the differences, and deal with them. I think this applies even more now than 45 years ago. Thank you, Gertrud. Yes, I think we might now also want to refer to the violence problem. Adorno, interestingly, in the negative dialectic, found this very interesting way of putting it. So negative dialectic means 
that you have to negate the existing conditions because they are bad in the way they are, that's the negative aspect of this dialectic. So why can we even think about it? And he does that himself with a historical uh, Caesar by saying after the horrific massacre in the Second World War and the NS regime, we now have something like a, a, a break to breathe through, a bit, to take a deep breath during history. And I think that's an interesting idea in order to understand that the violent conditions in the world, at least as a thought experiment, can be dissolved. I think this is all thanks to a, a sort of breathing space in history. And that's sort of the absence of crass violence. And in that way, I think these pragmatic approaches in terms of language have to be discussed. What would be the alternative if one would say, for example, yes, we don't actually want to be able to communicate. We're not interested in communicating with each other, in translating our messages. Everybody wants to stay where they are. What would the alternative be? Because, in fact, everything starts moving because people are violently displaced. Everybody is suffering from violence. So the political question is still how we can not maybe make those, vio how, how can we minimize those violent conditions? And I think especially right now, and Nikita actually focused very much on the present, this problem is something we're confronted with. The return of fascist act, um, effect politics that on all sides, all of a sudden, is linked to the possibility of doing something different. That's also very strange. So that, yes, we have the feeling that breathing space is over and the result isn't particularly positive. Can you maybe just talk about what you mean with fascist effect politics on all sides? Yes, the rise of post-fascist movements, neo-fascist movements, new fascist uh, movements like Hamas and others, they are, I mean, I think we have to really mm -hmm. uh, understand that and read that as social chiffre. So where does that readiness come from to actually either vote for these groups or support those groups or actually think they are an option? in order to improve the situation. I think that's interesting. Well, the Hamas was elected in 2006, so. Well, I think we just have to address that topic and ask ourselves, where does that come from? Is it the paradox uh, turning around of post a postmodern world into a <laughs> post-fascist <laughs> world. Yes, just like uh, Henrike Naumann said yesterday, after postmodernism, <laughs> next is uh, death, <laughs> is war, <laughs> is fascism. <laughs> and I yeah. would love to hand that question over to Nikita. I'd like to add another question, and that will be the last round, the last no question pressure. and answer session of this Congress. <laughs> no pressure. You ended your speech with Moses Mendelssohn. And do I understand your efforts correctly that differently from what we just talked about, that you actually try to achieve a sort of a, a type of reconciliation project, uh, Kant decolonial thinking, critical theory, but more than ever, anything, Jewish liberation projects. It comes across as if I didn't have any sympathy for post-colonial thinkers, but this is not true. I just want to define the fronts because often they speak of identities, and that is what uh, post-colonial theoreticians are often accused of, because these positions are usually claimed by uh, colonialists, that is, this refusal of and 
enlightenment is a method of colonial lists, and we must be aware of the difference. The post-colonial theoreticians, for instance, such as Harid Baba, or Ebert Said um, have a much more ambiguous relationship to norms such as secularism or human rights or such ideas as justice and so on and so forth. Yeah, so the attempt as such is the unfinished conversations between Jewish and post-colonial studies. That is, we want to expand this. As Biva, for instance, without, who couldn't be understood without Bibi Nas Baba, um, cannot be understood without Mona, and there are some overlapping areas. Zed Zaire um, has also said provocatively, I'm the last, I'm saying it in English, I'm the last Jewish intellectual, and by this he means that he is in the tradition of the exile literature. And in the introduction to Orientalism, he wrote that this book was not just documenting the history of Islamophobia, but also the history of anti-Semitism, because there are secret treasures. There is so what Said tries to do is the intersectionality of hate. It's a sort of genealogical tracing of the genealogy of hate, the coming together of anti-black racism, anti-Muslim racism. And somehow, unfortunately, I was just a few days ago at the Bundes Zentrale for Political Bildung and I put forward similar arguments. And somebody audited and said, oh, the pro problem is the, not the post-colonial society, but post-colonial theory. Anti-Semitism. Uh, that the problem is with post-colonial theory. And there I uh, read out uh, Fanon's quote where he says, you know, my philosophy professor, I have the quote on the last uh, uh, slide, but I, I think we are, we've run out of time, where Fanon says that, you know, my philosophy professor taught me that whenever you hear anti-Semitism, be very vigilant, because the person who is anti-Semitic is also uh, anti-black. And that when they are talking about, um, when, when they are spewing hate against the Jews, they are also, uh, there is an inelectable link, entanglement between anti-Semitism and um, anti-black racism. So yes, uh, I, I do uh, make a plaidoyer mm -hmm. for pursuing um, and for correcting these missed encounters between Jewish studies uh, and here I'm particularly thinking about the first generation. I'm sorry I switched into English, but um, we're running out of time. Um, the question is whether you want to reconcile, whether you reconcile things. It's an attempt. I don't know whether I will succeed in this or not, but no, I'm not the first one to try. This is why I presented these examples. I don't know whether reconciliation is the right term. I wanted to show that there are such historical examples, and there have already been such attempts. And I think that we should take these attempts seriously. It would be too arrogant to think that I can do it or I should do it. I think that we should take this genealogy um, seriously, these overlapping areas. So if you allow what we've been talking about is not making the minorities objects and calling them and rather placing the focus on the majorities and also the links between racism and anti-Semitism. Perhaps a last comment about the prior subject, that is, how can we handle pluralism and difference and heterogeneity? It's almost cliched for an Indian to talk about non-violence, so please forgive me and please indulge me. Um, and I'd like to draw, I, ended my last talk here at the Bundeskunsthalle, and I'm repeating myself. Um, so there was a thought experiment done within uh, heterodox Indian philosophy. Uh, it's the uh, Anekantavada theory. And um, 
the effort in that theory, the, the point of departure is to address the question, is nonviolence possible? Is Gewaltfreiheit überhaupt möglich? And uh, they take this very, you know, cliched metaphor of the seven blind men and the elephant. And a passing metaphor to that would be the Tower of Babel. Yeah, that we are all in a certain way um, damned to speak different languages and we cannot understand each other because we, we don't have the, the privilege of intertextuality and plu, uh, um, um, plurimon uh, not monolinguality, but um, what's the opposite of monolinguality? Polylinguinism, uh, uh, that we are not capable of uh, translating our positions into other people's language. And what, and I'll uh, very quickly wrap, uh, summarize it in a couple of lines. What they try to do is to show that nonviolence is only possible if there is intellectual humility that my perspective is extremely limited through history, through geography, through time, through space. And this kind of intellectual modesty, this kind of intellectual humility, this kind of awareness and mindfulness that I am, to a certain extent, ignorant of other people's motivations, of other people's experiences, of other people's um, uh, life, you know, the context in which is perhaps the promise of nonviolence. Vielen Dank. Vielen, vielen Dank euch drei. Thank you very much indeed to the three of you, Nagita Martin, and please clap your hands. And herewith also on behalf of our artistic director and co-organizer Eva Kraus, I would like to thank all the participants of these two days for this perhaps a bit blurred and sometimes vague, uh, but very interesting map for the present. Thank you very much for joining us also remotely, and I'm saying goodbye as the host of Studio Bonn. And on the 17th of January, I will hand over to my colleagues for a new series about anti-Semitism and, anti and racism in Germany. Thank you very much indeed to all the people who work behind the scenes, more than 20 people people made this Congress possible, the studio that is the sound technician. So please clap your hands for everybody who worked behind the scenes. And all the talks of Studio Bonn IO of the, pa of the past 30 months all these discussions and podcasts and so on is available on our website. Enjoy the evening.